Murder of the Month, written by Tegan Marr, narrated by Merritt North. Chapter 1 My leg hung over the hammock, and I gave a little push against the cool, packed earth with my bare foot, then locked my fingers behind my head and settled in to enjoy the peace and quiet. I sighed, content to lie in the shade and just exist for a while. The rhythmic creaking of the rope, the gentle swaying of the hammock, and the sound of the water lapping onto the lake shore put me in a state of zen. A voice cracked through the silence. No it! I jerked awake, disoriented, and almost fell out of the hammock when I opened my eyes to find my Aunt Addie floating in front of my face, glowering. What? I snapped, struggling to regain my balance and untangle myself from the haven turned death trap. I wasn't the most graceful person at the best of times, so with one leg shoved through a hole in the webbed rope and the other asleep from dangling, it was a wonder I didn't kill myself. Stop doing that, I said, irritated. You're lucky I don't have a heart condition. Waving me off, she said, You live. You're supposed to be at the farm. We have a new boater showing up in 15 minutes, and Gabby had to leave for work early. Scowling, I blinked a couple times to push the last of the fuzziness from my brain. We ran a horse farm and occasionally took on new boarders to help pay the bills. Though I was making plenty of money from my upcycling store, reimagined to do that, still, Shelby, my little sister, would be heading off to college soon, and the extra cash would help with tuition. I ran a hand over my face. I'm aware. I'm also aware that Shelby's there, and so is Matt, and both of them are more than capable of saying hello and walking with her and her horse to a stall. I've met with the woman four times. I'm pretty sure we covered all the bases, and I already put fresh shavings in the stall and filled the water bucket. She's just dropping him off and leaving. Addie drew her brows together, and I knew from experience I was about to get an earful. I held up my hand and tilted my head, studying her semi-translucent face. What's wrong with you? You know as well as I do, they don't need me up there. She huffed, but wouldn't meet my eyes. Nothing. Forget I said anything. Get back to loafing, but don't forget Camille's coming over in an hour or so to see how much y'all have progressed. With a final downcast look, she popped out as unexpectedly as she'd popped in. I furrowed my brow wondering what was up with her odd behavior. In truth, I had forgotten Camille was coming. She'd started out as Shelby's magical social worker before my little sister had gained control of her powers and had since become a friend. Her daughter Emma was Shelby's bestie. I heaved a sigh and glanced around at the little oasis Hunter and Matt had made. They had transformed what had once been an overgrown, run-down fishing cabin on the lake into a cute cottage, clearing the quarter acre or so around it to make room for a barbecue pit, the hammocks, and a nice little beach, complete with a dock. It was about half a mile from the main house. That put it within walking distance, but I usually preferred to ride either my dirt bike or one of the horses. Though, if I didn't lay off the fried foods, I was going to have to start walking everywhere just to fit into my jeans. Being in a relationship was great for the soul, but hanging out with somebody who ate like a lumberjack was even putting my higher-than-average metabolism through the ringer. I climbed back into the hammock and tried to reclaim the peace I'd had before Addie had popped in, but gave up after a few minutes because I couldn't stop worrying about her. She hadn't been acting like herself for a few days. At first, I figured it was because one of her friends had recently passed and crossed over, but that didn't seem to be it. She'd been mother hinning us even more than usual and was obsessed with our magical lessons in particular. 
Over the last several months, Shelby and I had both developed some new powers. We could understand Shelby. She'd been blocked by a curse until a few months ago. But nobody could figure out why my magic was changing, too. Camille had been helping us master them. I slipped on my sneakers and helmet and hopped on my dirt bike, deciding the afternoon was a wash. I'd go greet Kristen, the new boarder, then make something to eat before Camille came over. Just for kicks, I twisted the throttle a little and put the bike through its paces. I cut off the path into the woods, sliding around the trees and brush, and hopped a little hill that led to the back pasture. Once I was through the gate and had a straight shot to the barn, I opened her up and leaned forward, grinning as the wind rushed past me and the tall grass whipped at my legs. I let off the throttle as I approached the front gate, and Matt, who must have heard me coming, swung it open for me. I'd first met Matt at the cabin when it was just a dilapidated shack. He'd been squatting there, trying to get a handle on his PTSD so he could rejoin society. As an army vet who'd seen a lot of combat, he had a lot to process, and it had taken him a few years of drifting to even start to heal. To make a long story short, he now lived in the apartment above our barn, worked as a foreman at a local construction company, and was part of our family. He smiled and shook his head as I eased through the opening. You have just as much fun on that thing as you do on your street bike, I think. I thought you were going to be gone for the afternoon. After a few months of riding with Hunter, my own personal slice of tall, dark, and handsome, I decided I wanted my own motorcycle. He'd bought the dirt bike for me to learn on. Then I'd gotten the CBR, a sport bike, once he was comfortable turning me loose on the streets. I'd indulged him because I knew he was being cautious and bossy because he cared. Plus, I figured the pasture was softer than asphalt if worse came to worse. My bikes and the horses were my therapy. Yeah, I said pulling the bike into the barn we used as a garage. So did I, but Addie popped in right when I drifted off in the hammock, and the idea of spending the afternoon alone sorta lost its shine. She guilted me for not being here when Kristen brought Cowboy. He furrowed his brow. There was no reason for her to come bother you. Shelby and I are here. I know, I said, climbing off the bike. Addie's been acting weird for a few days, but won't tell me what's got her tail all twisted. I've noticed that too, he said. She's cranky. I cocked a brow at him as I pushed the bike back into a corner out of the way. Crankier than usual, he amended. Addie wasn't so much cranky as she was cantankerous and ornery. She had a dry sense of humor and was easygoing, at least, as long as things were going her way. One thing I had learned since she'd come back without a corporeal body was that she used all her extra time to find chores for us to do. To be fair, she'd run a tight ship when she was alive. If something broke, we fixed it right away. The only difference now was that we no longer included her and she had more time to look for things that needed fixing. My phone rang, and I dug it out of my pocket. It was Rayanne, my best friend and cousin. I held up my finger to Matt and answered it. Hey, I said. I thought you were working late trying to get inventory done. I was, she said, her voice wobbly and a bit freaked out. What's wrong, I demanded, and Matt looked askance at me. Are you okay? I'm fine, she said, pulling in a couple deep breaths. Or at least I think I am. But I watered that half-dead vine in my office and gave it a little zap of magic to give it a boost while I was doing my paperwork. Next thing I knew, it was growing off my desk. I could see it growing. I panicked and hit it with a shrink spell. Did it work? I asked, grabbing my keys and heading toward my truck. Well, sort of, but now it and my desk, which had my purse and keys on it, are small enough to fit in a dollhouse. 
her voice started to tremble again, which worried me, because Ray wasn't a crier. I'm afraid to do anything else. Okay, sweetie, I said, trying not to freak out. Ray never lost control of her magic, and for her to do so on such a grand scale was bad. Just hang on, I'll be right there. We disconnected, and I explained the situation to Matt. I'll stay here and get the new girl settled, he said. Thanks, I called over my shoulder, then called for Addie. Whatever was going on was way beyond my pay grade, and it was time to bring in the big guns. Chapter 2 By the time I got to brew for you, Addie was already there, and so was my Aunt Beth, Rayanne's mama. Ray was sitting on a stool at the far end of the gleaming black bar, looking miserable, and the two elder witches were in the doorway to her office, one floating and one standing, rubbing their chins and studying the situation. Concentration and worry were etched on their brows, and in that moment, there was no doubt they were sisters, regardless of the fact that one of them was translucent. So, what's the diagnosis? I asked. Ray heaved a sigh. They don't know what happened any more than I do. Mama's going to try to fix it. I slid onto the stool beside her and nudged her with my shoulder. Look at the upside. She raised a brow and huffed a short breath out of her nose. There's an upside? Sure, I said, smiling. At least you had a vine and not a Venus flytrap. She rolled her eyes and lifted the corner of her mouth in a half smile. I was relieved to see her sense of humor cracking through. Humor and sarcasm were her go-to defense mechanisms, and I was glad she wasn't crying or hysterical. We were raised tough, and histrionics were scoffed at. Addie always said you couldn't hoe a row by leaning on the handle and whining about it, and she was right. Instead, we Flynn's dug in and solved our problems, and that's what we do this time, too. The sisters came toward us, one floating and the other strolling, wearing identical bum-fuzzled expressions. A glance passed between them, and I tried to figure out what it meant. They masked it too fast for me to decipher it, though. Did you fix it? Ray asked, Hope lacing her voice. Addie gave a nod. Beth did, sort of, but we have no idea what went wrong. She tilted her head toward me. Noel and Shelby are practicing at the farm this evening, and I think you should join them. See if it was a weird fluke or if something is genuinely wrong. Aunt Beth turned toward Ray. Were you upset or focusing particularly on the plant when you gave it a boost? Ray shook her head. No. If anything, it was the opposite. I was looking at a mug catalog and gave it a trickle of magic as an afterthought when I noticed it was wilting a little. I was looking at the details of two different mugs, trying to decide between them. The plant was just kind of an afterthought. Okay, I said, slipping off the stool and stepping toward her office. I have to see this mutant plant. When I reached the doorway, I sucked in a surprised breath and raised my brows, amazed by what I was seeing. She hadn't been exaggerating. If anything, she downplayed it a little. The desk and plant were back to scale, but it was the vine sitting on the front center edge of the desk that caught my attention. At least a dozen lush, glossy tendrils had grown across the front of her desk and wound all the way down to the floor, wrapping around the legs and trailing a little onto the carpet. You said the thing was almost dead? I called in disbelief. It was nowhere near gasping its last breath now. Yep. 
Bobby Sue was going to throw it away, so I rescued it a couple days ago. Bobby Sue was a good friend and a whiz with barbecue, but giving her a house plant was sentencing it to death. If it had come from her, chances were good it had been little more than a couple sticks. That was quite a difference from the lush plant now taking over the desk. How long did it take to grow that much? She came over to take a peek and ran a hand over her face. Wow, I didn't realize it had grown like that. I only saw it from this angle after I'd already shrunk it. I noticed it within just a couple minutes, I guess. I was looking at the cups on my laptop and a vine poked around the edge of the screen. You're saying it grew that much in two or three minutes? It's not like she couldn't grow something like that when she was focusing on it. But if it was unintentional and caused by a simple little push of magic... That's exactly what I'm saying, she said miserably. And I had no idea it was even happening. No draw on my energy or anything. And something like that would have been a serious power suck. Addie and Beth were standing behind us, and Beth put her hands on our shoulders. We're not going to learn anything here, I don't think. Grab your purse, Ran, and let's get to the farm. My aunt stepped into the office at the last minute and grabbed the plant. Just in case, we should probably do some poking at it to make sure it was Rayanne rather than a booby trap or practical joke of some sort. Shelby flitted through my brain. I could see her playing a trick, like a rapid grow plant, uh, but that didn't explain why the desk and everything on it shrank to dollhouse size when Ray tried to fix it. That wasn't something Shell would be able to pull off. For that matter, I'm not sure how anybody would be able to pull it off without being right there to cast the spell. I glanced at Addie out of the corner of my eye, and she was a million miles away. Her form more transparent than translucent, and she looked more worried than I think I'd ever seen her. Don't worry, Addie, I told her. Camille will sort this out in no time. I'm sure it was just a fluke. Her eyes refocused, and she returned my gaze. You know as well as I do, there ain't no such thing as coincidence in this family. I don't know what's going on, but I can guarantee you it wasn't any fluke. She was right, and in my heart, I knew it. The problem wasn't whether or not something was up with her, because there was. There was something up with all of us. The question was... What? Chapter 3 We had to stop at the grocery store on the way home to pick up something for supper, and Piggly Wiggly was closer than Walmart. One of the town's two ambulances was parked outside, doing free blood pressure and diabetes checks, a service they offered every few months. They had a tent set up outside the ambulance and were giving balloons and stickers away to kids. Adults weren't so lucky. They got pamphlets about everything from stroke symptoms to STD avoidance. And there was, of course, a donation jar. Frankie Lipscomb, a guy who'd been a little ahead of me in school, was unwrapping a blood pressure cuff from a little old blue-haired lady. Hey, no, Ray, Miss Beth. He called. How y'all doing today? Doing well, Frankie, Aunt Beth said as we waved back. How's your mama? Fine as frog's hair, he replied, grinning. She just left, had to go down to the ladies' auxiliary for a quilting session. They're starting to make plans for some charity event or another. Well, tell her I said hi, Beth called over her shoulder. Will do, and you take care. We'd reached the doors, so with a final wave, we pushed into the blessed air conditioning. I didn't know how he was standing it out there in full uniform. 
I shook a buggy loose from the row and angled it toward the meat section. A rack holding bunches of those baby bananas caught my eye, and I gave Ray a shove on the shoulder. Try not to shrink anything while we're here. With the price of food, I can't afford to feed us all if you shrink the $15 pack of burger down to nothing. Ha, ha, she replied, scrunching her nose at me. Watch it, or I'll shrink your head for being a smartass. I'd rather you shrunk my butt, I said, which reminded me that we were out of Fruit Loops. I was doing my best to pretend my favorite chips weren't BOGO on a shelf to my immediate right. I hated going to the grocery store on an empty stomach. Oh, crap, Addie said, saving me from myself. Don't look now, but it's Lila Thomas. If she catches us, we won't get out of here until she's shown you all 83 pictures of her cats and grandkids. She wasn't wrong. Mrs. Thomas was nice enough, but she tended to be a little tone deaf when it came to folks who were in a hurry. She'd been a stay-at-home mom, and now that her son and daughter were grown, it just skimmed right over her head that some people didn't have all day to stand around and shoot the breeze. It was too late, though. She'd already caught sight of us. I pasted a smile onto my face, took a deep breath, and prepared myself to look at snapshots and class pictures ad nauseum. Instead, Beth stepped forward stuffing a hand into her oversized purse. Lila, it's been forever. How have you been? Mrs. Thomas beamed at her, already reaching into her purse, too. Oh, why, just fine, Beth, just fine. As a matter of fact, I just had some great news. Bill, her son, is down for a visit, and Vicky called to say she and the kids are coming down next week. She sent me the kids' school pictures. Beth held up a hand. I have some good news, too. I've been having some heartburn. So the doc did an endoscopy on my throat, down into my stomach almost. I'm fine, but I can't believe what they can do with such a tiny little camera nowadays. You have to see these. She whipped a manila folder out of her bag and started to pull some pictures out. Mrs. Thomas turned a little green around the gills and took her hand out of her purse. I'm sure they're fascinating, Beth, uh, but I need to get back and uh, get supper on. Bill will be coming home from fishing in an hour. It was good to see you, and I hope everything works out well. She took a hard right with her buggy, and in her haste to escape Beth and the pictures of her innards, crashed right into Ida Crenshaw. Ms. Crenshaw had divorced her third husband several years earlier and managed to hold on to his house and property in the process. It wasn't that surprising, considering she could afford to pay a top-notch lawyer from all the money she'd gotten from divorce number two via assets and outrageous alimony. The property was just up the road from us, so I'd grown up with her daughter, Rose, who was my age. Unlike her mother, Rose was a wonderful soul. She used to tell Ida she was taking her required piano lessons, then sneak up to the farm to ride horses. As soon as Miss Crenshaw looked up to see who'd crashed into her, her nose went in the air and her lip curled like she smelled something rotten. Watch where you're going, Lila, for the love of God, if you paid more attention to your surroundings and less attention to trapping people into looking at pictures of your horrid cats and grandkids, you'd have seen me. I took a deep breath. Even though Mrs. Thomas was a talker and did tend to take the picture thing too far, it was because she was lonely, and that's how she passed time when her kids weren't visiting. Her husband had passed away a couple years ago, and they'd been married for more than 40 years. So that was understandable. She was a good egg, and the way Ida Crenshaw had just talked to her stuck in my craw. Clearing my throat and pasting on my best fake smile, I stepped forward. 
And I am sure if you hadn't had your nose so high in the air that you'd have drowned if it rained, you would have seen us standing here too. So how about we just call it even and you head on in search of your next ex-husband? Ida gasped and her hand fluttered to her pearls in righteous outrage. Her mouth opened and closed several times before she settled on a single high-pitched huff and tottered away from us as fast as her high heels would allow. Mrs. Thomas smiled, looking a little sad. Thank you, Noel. Your Aunt Addie would be proud of you. Of course, she couldn't see Addie hovering just to my right, or else she'd have noticed how my auntie's chest puffed up a little. I'll let you ladies be on your way then, she continued. And, Beth, it was good to see you. Stop by the house sometime so we can catch up. We said our goodbyes and turned once again in the direction of the meat department. After grabbing a big pack of hamburger and a couple packs of hot dogs, we made our way to the condiments aisle for some pickles. Beth stopped me as we passed the end of the aisle that held the personal hygiene products. Miss Crenshaw had an extra-large box of hemorrhoid cream in one hand and was clutching her buggy with the other. Her face was flushed and sweaty, and she was swaying a dazed expression on her face. Ray and I rushed forward and just managed to catch her before she crashed to the floor. She was blinking and twitching, but thankfully she was conscious. Annie Sotheby, one of the girls who worked there, came rushing up the aisle just as Miss Crenshaw tossed her lunch right in front of the diaper rash medicine. What's going on? Annie asked, making a wide swath to avoid the mess while trying hard to repress her gag reflex. I lifted a shoulder, unsure of what to say since I had no idea. She was all red in the face and then fell over, we caught her. Annie sprung to her feet. I'll go get Frankie. The stars had aligned, putting him right where he was needed. He came rushing in with a gurney, followed by a guy I didn't recognize. Ray and I stepped back so they could do their thing, and within just a few minutes, they had her on the stretcher and out of the store. Well, said Beth, picking up the abandoned tube of hemorrhoid cream and putting it back on the shelf. That was a little more action than I expected to see today. I wonder what happened, I said. Do you think it was some sort of stroke? Addie shrugged. Looked more like a seizure to me. Or maybe all of that meanness finally caught up with her and popped like a cork. We bandied about the possibilities as we gathered the rest of our groceries and then gave it up as we stepped back out into the heat. The table and balloons were still sitting right where Frankie and crew had left them, but the ambulance was gone. I stopped to collect the loose items into a pile and set a rock on them so they wouldn't fly away. I didn't give it any thought when a row of Mr. Yuck stickers gave me the icky face, from the top of the pile of alcoholism pamphlets, but I should have. I'd have appreciated the irony later. Chapter 4 Matt and Shelby had gotten Kristen all settled in by the time we got back, and we waved to our newest boarder when we passed her as she was leaving. Who was that? Beth asked. I explained, and she nodded. I think it's good you're taking on another horse. That gives you three paying boarders now. I know your store's doing well, but it's never good to put all your eggs in one basket if you don't have to. We shared that sentiment. We'd spent most of my life just getting by, and in the months after Addie had passed the year before, it had taken everything I had just to put food on the table. Things had changed so much in just a handful of months that my head was still spinning a little. Though we weren't rich by any stretch, we were doing okay. Part of that had to do with the fact that Hank 
The man who'd been sheriff of Keyhole Lake for almost two decades had been murdered. He'd been milking us dry with double and even triple property and business taxes for years. When he died, Keyhole's new sheriff, who just happened to be Hunter, put the town finances and legal system on the straight and narrow, and people who'd been struggling to make it suddenly found themselves with extra cash on their hands. And that wasn't the only way his death benefited us either. In a roundabout way, I'd helped solve the crime, and Hank's mama had paid me the 50 grand reward she'd offered to whomever found his killer. When you're poor, 50,000 bucks is life-changing. I'd been able to quit my waitressing job, except for picking up an occasional shift here and there whenever Bobby Sue needed me. That meant I could spend more time straightening Shelby out and figuring out what I wanted to be when I grew up. I had a degree in criminal justice from UGA, but law enforcement wasn't an option as I'd originally planned. I'd planned to stay in Atlanta and become a CSI investigator, but barely made it through college because I was so homesick. Since Hank was running things here, joining the Keyhole Force was out of the question. I'd have been the one on trial for his murder if I'd have had to deal with him on a daily basis. Jobs in a small town weren't easy to come by. I hadn't wanted to leave Keyhole, so I'd gone to work at Bobby Sue's Barbecue as a waitress. Ray, who'd graduated at the same time I did, but was smart enough to get a business degree, had opened Brew For You, a cute little coffee shop. She'd needed baked goods to offer along with the coffee, and it just so happened I was one heck of a kitchen witch. So I made pastries and helped her out a few days a week before she could afford to hire help. She'd never taken any money for the goodies that sold like hotcakes because she knew I was struggling to keep my head above water. Between waitressing and helping Ray, I'd done well before Addie passed, since the only debt I had was student loans. I'd also insisted on contributing a couple hundred bucks a month toward the bills. When she died, though, things got tight, and I was worried all the time I was going to lose the farm. As a matter of fact, I was worried about a lot. Hank had threatened to take Shelby's guardianship away from me, and he'd wanted the farm something fierce. Shelby was running hog wild, and I was working my fingers to the bone just to keep the lights on. I didn't have time to babysit an out-of-control 16-year-old, too. Then Hank died, and suddenly everything was okay again. After one ugly minute of watching him gasp his last few miserable breaths, my life, along with just about everybody else's in Keyhole, got considerably better. Long story short, when somebody had helped him kick the bucket, they'd done the town a huge favor. Since I'd been a suspect for a minute, before they decided his wife was guilty, I'd had a vested interest in finding out who had done it, which had led to my reward. I'd started Reimagined, a little upcycle shop, with the money, and it was doing better than I could have hoped. Still, the fear of being broke like that again was real and I figured a few more bucks coming in from a different source was a good hedge, just in case. I like having more than just one income, I told Beth, as we drove up the winding, mile-long driveway to the house. But I don't want just anybody here. I'd rather have empty stalls than somebody who doesn't fit in. Unlike Shelby and Gabby, my friend who lived with us, I wasn't a people person and neither was Matt. When we pulled up to the front of the house, Max, our talking donkey, was sleeping on the porch. He lifted his head, blinking his eyes and yawning, his big front teeth shining. He looked so cute. It's about time you got home, he groused. That woman brought a kid with her who had the nerve to climb on me like I was a common pack animal. Uh, let me amend my statement. He looked cute until he opened his mouth. He had been a 16th century noble, but had been turned to a 
form more suiting his personality by a witch when she'd caught him stepping out on her. We'd met under strange circumstances, but he was part of the family. Bad attitude and all. Not to point out the obvious, Beth said, but... Max lowered his fuzzy eyebrows and glowered at her. Don't you dare say it. There's nothing common about me. That was true enough. A common donkey was, with some exceptions, cantankerous. Max was cantankerous, mouthy, snarky, and entitled. He was also loyal to a fault and part of our family, which is why we put up with the other, less admirable traits. Ray rolled her eyes. You know, kids think you're adorable. If you don't feel like dealing with them, why don't you just make yourself scarce when they show up? He gave me the hairy eyeball. Why can't we just not have them here to begin with? This is my home. I shouldn't have to make myself scarce to avoid harassment, he shuddered. They're such foul little beasts. So are you, Addie said. Arching a translucent brow. And yet, we let you stay. He cut his eyes at her, huffed, and ambled down toward the barn, no doubt in search of food. I swear, Ray said, shaking her head, he gets crankier every day. Nah, I grinned as I pulled open the door. He just doesn't want to admit he likes the attention kids give him. Ray and Beth took a seat at our long farm table, and I smiled when Aunt Beth straightened the rubber, horse-themed placemat in front of her to line up with the crack in the table. She didn't even think about it, and my smile faded when I realized it was a quirk that showed up when she was worried. Shelby thumped down the stairs and pulled open the fridge, then handed me the tea jug as she reached back in for some leftover chicken I'd grabbed on the way home the day before. Hey, Aunt Beth, Ray, she said, a drumstick in her hand. What are y'all doing here? Ray, uh, I thought you were working late. Yeah, me too, Ray replied, until I made a vine grow fast enough to consume my desk, then shrank it and my desk, along with everything on it, to the size of a teacup. While I poured us all a glass of tea, Ray brought Shelby up to speed on the mysterious supercharge she'd given the plant and the resulting Honey, I Shrunk My Desk story. Camille will be here in just a few minutes. She'll know what to do, Shelby reassured her. My phone began playing Hunter's ringtone, and I picked it up from the table and answered it. He heaved a big sigh that I recognized as his, I want to, but can't sigh, and my stomach sank. I don't know, honey, he said. Ida Crenshaw had an incident in the Piggly Wiggly today. I know, I said, cutting in. I was there. You were there? he asked, then instantly sounded more tired. Please tell me you didn't interact with her while she was there. Why? I asked, suspicious. Just... Did you? I relayed what had happened. Okay, then, he said. Good. You didn't give her anything to eat or drink or touch her in any way. Um, no. Pretty sure I didn't insult her, then give her a cookie, and I wouldn't touch her with a ten-foot pole. Then I realized I had touched her. I amended my denial and explained what had gone down. Oh, he said relieved. I'm not worried about that. It was after. The others were listening closely, wearing the same puzzled expression I probably was. After what? I asked, then went for the important question. And what does Miss Crenshaw's stroke or whatever have to do with our pizza? He pulled in a tired breath and released it. She didn't have a stroke. She was poisoned, and now she's dead, dead, I parroted, my voice flat. As a hammer, he confirmed. 
as far as dead went, it didn't get much more permanent than that. Chapter 5 The girls heard everything Hunter had said, and I'd barely ended the call when everybody started talking at once. Shelby had heard my explanation, so she was all caught up. If you'd ask me, Addie said, it was probably one of her ex-husbands. She's right, Beth said, nodding her head. That woman took more men to the cleaners than most people around here do suits. I couldn't disagree. I mean, she'd gotten a car and a boat out of the first one, a boatload of cash, including half the guy's retirement from the second one, and a big house on acreage from the third. I'd lay money on the second or third X, Rayan said. I can't imagine anybody killing for a boat or a car, and that was over 30 years ago. Money in a homestead, though? You bet your booties. Addie chimed in. That house wasn't just a house, either. The land belonged to his parents. Beth gasped, her eyes wide. What? Shelby and I asked. Beth shook her finger and nodded her head, her tone emphatic. And it reverts to him if she dies first. The little gossip devil on my shoulder sat up straighter. Now, that was a motive for murder. I texted the info to Hunter, but all I got in reply was an okay. I figured he was knee-deep in red tape. I wished I'd thought to ask what kind of poison, but I didn't want to bother him. I wasn't even sure how long it took to get information like that back from the lab, or if he'd be willing to share it. Since pizza was no longer on the table, I reheated the chicken and pulled out some potato salad I'd made the day before to go with it. We'd just finished eating when Camille pulled up out front. She gave a quick knock on the door, then let herself in, calling hello as she did. Hey, I said, come on in. Shelby grabbed a Coke, Camille's preferred drink since she cut loose and started living a little, out of the fridge and handed it to her. As always, she looked classy and elegant as she took a seat at the table beside Beth. Boy, do we have news for you, Shelby said, sliding onto a chair beside her. Hit me, she said. I've been at the council office all day, and they're trying to reorganize some divisions to streamline the system. We've also got some trouble brewing up in Atlanta, though we don't know exactly what's going on yet. I'm ready for something good. Well, Beth drawled, I don't know that you'd call any of it good, but we'll start with the more gossipy news. The second affects us directly. She told her about Mrs. Crenshaw, then paused. Y'all had a busy afternoon then, Camille said, after Beth finished the story, then took a swig of her Coke and towed off her high heels. That's just idle gossip compared to our other story, I said, glancing at Ray. This one's important. It applies to us, and we need your help to fix it, or to at least figure out what's up. Her brow furrowed. Is everything okay? Ray bobbed her head from side to side. Sorta. I guess it depends on your definition of okay. As she related the story, Camille's forehead creased in concentration. I could tell she was trying to look at it from all angles and figure out why something like that would happen. One of her jobs at the council was as head of the Oversight Committee, a division that monitored and assisted witches who were having problems with their magic. If anybody had an explanation for what was going on, it was Camille. She shook her head and whistled when Rayanne finished. There are a few different possibilities, so let's go outside and try to narrow the list down a bit. We made our way out back to the area behind the house that we used to practice magic. We had a collection of items there that, to anybody else, would just look like decorations. A fire pit, a cornhole game, 
decorative stones in different sizes, all used to practice our emerging powers. I had two that we couldn't practice, though, but we weren't sure what to do about it. After all, it would be rude to practice mind control on family, and stopping time had consequences. That one, we decided, should be left alone. Let's start with Rayanne, Camille said. When Ray stepped forward, we all took a couple healthy steps back. Ray smirked at us. Very funny. What a supportive family. We support you, I said. We're just doing it from afar, just in case. First things first, Camille said, ignoring the banter and drawing our attention back to the task at hand. Give the half-dead petunias in the biggest pot over there little juice. Just a tiny push to get rid of the wilt, and just the flowers in that pot. There was a smaller basket of healthy larkspur sitting right next to it that I'd been meaning to transplant, and it was close enough that it could easily get caught in the magical overspray. Rayanne pulled in a deep breath and blew it out through puckered lips, then wiped her palms on her jean shorts and wiggled her fingers like a pianist getting ready to play. When she glanced back at us, we gave her smiles and nods of encouragement. Shelby and I, in particular, understood exactly what she was feeling, since we were dealing with the same problem. Taking care of plants was so ingrained in Rayanne that she didn't need to speak any words. Instead, she just pointed at the flower and gave a little poke with her index finger. As soon as she did, the sad, wilted little flowers jumped up, grew to almost double in size, then began to climb over the sides, new vines sprouting from the existing ones. Panicked, Ray jumped back and swiveled her head to Camille, who was standing a fair distance back with an arm across her body, her elbow resting on it, and her chin in hand. She held up a finger. Give it a minute. I want to see what happens. As we watched, the new vines on the petunias sprouted flowers that opened, presenting a brilliant array of purples, pinks, and blues that tumbled over the sides of the pot. After a few moments, they slowed down, and after a full minute or so, they stopped growing and just lay there in all their velvety glory. We waited another couple minutes to see if anything else was going to happen, but they looked just like any other super healthy pot of petunias in full bloom. Huh, said Camille, her brow furrowed. Do it again with whatever that is in the little pot next to it, the one that's almost dead. Try to tone it down even more. Ray huffed. I barely gave the petunias anything, and look what they did. Normally, that would have barely been enough to get rid of a little bit of wilting, like you told me to do. Camille just lifted a shoulder. Just do it. Focus on what you want just like you did when you were a kid learning to use your gift. The plant she was talking about was a basil plant that I'd neglected. About all that was left was a stalk and a couple sad-looking brown leaves. Rather than try from afar as she usually would, Rand stepped close to it, then closed her eyes and reached out to touch the plant. She pulled her hand back after barely brushing the leaves with her fingers. The stalk turned green and leaves began to grow. Within a minute or so, it was just a healthy, regular basil plant. Not any bigger than normal and not even particularly thick. She smiled when it stopped growing. Is that what you meant to do? Camille asked. Ray lifted a shoulder. It's a little healthier than I was shooting for, but not by much. And how much magic did you give it compared to the other one? Maybe half, not even. I see, Camille said, in a tone that reminded me of a teacher when you tried to explain that the dog ate your homework. 
After studying the plants as if they were alien creatures, she pointed to a grouping of different sized rocks that we used to practice precision levitation. Now, make that big rock over there half its size and focus. I have been focusing, Ray grumbled, but turned toward the rocks and squinted. This was something she could have normally done while talking on the phone or mowing the grass, but so were the plants. Again, she went back to the way Addie and Aunt Beth had taught us when we learned to resize objects as kids. She took a couple of deep breaths, shut one eye, and framed the rock between her thumb and forefinger. After another pause, she closed the distance between her thumb and finger by half. It worked. At least, sort of. It was more like a quarter of the original size, but at least it was visible. She held up a finger toward us when we started to cheer her. Give me another minute. Determined, she turned back toward the rock and barely moved her fingers apart when she framed it, and it grew just enough to make it about half the size it had started at. We Flynn girls were nothing if not stubborn. Poor Ray looked like she just finished a marathon, but Camille said, Again, put it back to its original size. It took Rayanne three tries to set it back to rights, but she did it. Still, she had to use the finger framing technique each time. We hadn't done that since we were eleven. Resizing was one of the first things we'd learned. That was because I'd accidentally shrunk my arch enemy, Olivia Anderson's shoes, when she'd made fun of Kenny Keller's brand new but off-brand sneakers in the fifth grade. His old ones had been so worn out that his toes had poked through the tops. He was proud as punch of the new ones, not caring that they weren't Nikes or Reeboks, just glad to have something nice that didn't cramp his toes. Olivia tried to take that happiness from him, and I wasn't having any of it. I hadn't meant to do it, but I just thought about how I wished she could know what it felt like to have to wear shoes that pinched her feet, and it happened. Thankfully, I hadn't done any damage other than giving her a couple blisters, but I had no idea how to fix it. Changing sizes was bumped to the top of the list on that afternoon's lesson. To be fair, I probably would have done it on purpose had I known the spell, because, well, she deserved it. At any rate, it killed me to see Rayanne revert to beginner crutches just to resize a rock. And Camille wasn't done yet. She made her work a little more with the flowers, going back to actually touching the ones she wanted to grow, just like she had when she'd been young. Ray was discouraged because she had to use such techniques, but at least she was getting in the right frame of mind, so to speak. Chapter 6 While Camille worked with Ray, Shelby and I started our own practice sessions, taking on tasks we were trying to master. I'd been working hard on moving things around with my mind, because I'd learned a couple months earlier that I could actually crawl inside somebody's head and take over. I'd always been able to communicate telepathically, but that had been the extent of it. Nothing too freaky. Now, we didn't know what to call it other than a weird cross between telepathy and telekinesis, and that was only one of the bizarre skills we'd developed. Shelby could apparently control air, though she was still working on that. She'd figured it out when she'd blown the doors off a barn where I was being held captive. At first, she'd thought it was just a matter of her anger boiling over. That much was true, but she'd done a lot more than just slam the doors open with the force of her mind. She'd blown them open. The wind had been incredible. It was a slippery skill that took a lot of focus. Lucky for all of us, it wasn't something that manifested randomly like her other powers had before she'd been unblocked, or at least, it hadn't yet. So, 
while she practiced moving pieces of fabric, wood, rocks, and horseshoes that we had hanging around, I practiced straight telekinesis. Finally, Shelby and I played a kind of mental soccer with the beanbags from the cornhole game. I'd toss them toward her using my mind. Then she'd try to catch them midair and toss them back using her air magic. We were getting good at it, but not perfect. Of course, it didn't help that it always turned into a game of magical dodgeball after a few minutes, either. After another hour or so, Camille called us all in, a frown marring her brow. We settled in the kitchen around the table with glasses of cold tea or ice water and waited for Camille's diagnosis. She shook her head. I don't know what to say other than that your gifts seem magnified. Have you been feeling okay? Have you hit your head? Beth narrowed her eyes. You didn't eat any of Coralie's special brownies, did you? Maybe even accidentally? Ran, who had a mouthful of tea, about choked. When she was done, spluttering, she scowled at her mama. No, I didn't eat any of Coralie's special brownies. And trust me, it's not something you can do accidentally. I heard that since Roberta ate a couple of them by mistake, then ate an entire pie at the church social a couple months ago, she keeps them locked in her private fridge in the back. Coralie's regular brownies were amazing. They were the one baked good she had perfected. Rich and gooey on the inside and crusty on the outside, with something extra that lent them an exotic flavor. I tried to duplicate them. But even with my kitchen magic, I couldn't manage it. Those she made regularly and sat out for everybody. The special brownies were actually just a rumor, at least until the Roberta incident, and she'd not even fessed up to it then, though she hadn't denied it either. Rayanne turned back to Camille. And no, I haven't hit my head or been sick. Everything's been fine. Better than fine, actually. Brew just did its best month ever, and Dave and I are getting along great. I narrowed my eyes when she said that, because she'd paused just a tad. Dave was a doctor she'd been dating, and if that man was causing her heartache, I'd have to have a talk with him. Camille sighed. I hate to ask, but may I take a peek inside your melon? Rayanne's shoulders stiffened. Camille had the ability to enter a person's mind and poke around. It's how we found out about Shelby's block and that it was gone. The council had used probers, as they called them, since the beginning of time for a variety of reasons. Verifying honesty, stealing information, determining if a person's mind or magic had been compromised by injury or another witch. They had a stigma that, until we'd met Camille, had been justified because of their reputations for being so brutal. They went in, got what they wanted, and got out, sparing no consideration for the witch at hand. It's no light thing to let somebody climb around in your gourd, especially when they could monkey around and make changes while they were in there, like Camille could. That was another of many Prober's skills. In the space of just a few minutes, you could lose years of memories, or even have them replaced with fake ones if the Prober was good enough. Camille definitely was, but she also wasn't one who would do such a thing, at least to an innocent person. Camille waited while Ray considered it. Rayanne paused for a few seconds, then scooted her chair closer to her, and sighed. Go ahead. We need to know. She closed her eyes, and Camille touched her temples and closed her eyes, too. Ray cringed a little, but then relaxed. Camille's eyes moved back and forth under her lids, like she was actually looking around, and her forehead crinkled. In less than a minute, she opened her eyes and took her hands off Rayanne's head. I didn't see anything out of the ordinary, exactly. What do you mean, exactly? 
Ray asked, her eyes narrowed. I mean, you have a lot of current running through the areas most associated with magic. Nothing bad, and it may be normal for you because I've never examined you before. But it's like a disco ball in there. What did it look like compared to Shelby's? Addie asked. Camille considered the question for a minute. Now that you mention it, there are similarities. Activity is in mostly the same places, and Shelby's is on overdrive, compared to most witches, too. But I sort of wrote that off to her circumstances. On top of Shelby's wonky, magical block, she'd been touched by an angel at Christmas. She had a brown mark in the shape of a tiny pair of angel wings on her shoulder to prove it, but we had no idea what, if anything, that meant. We didn't know anybody else who'd touched an angel. Camille shrugged. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's a Flynn thing. All eyes turned toward me, and when I realized what they were thinking, I shook my head and pushed my chair back. Uh, nah, 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 no way. Nobody's poking around inside my noggin just to see if I have the same voltage as everybody else. When everybody just kept staring at me, I scowled. <laughs> what would it prove anyway? We've all had weird things happening to us. Ray's just joining the crazy now. Don't be a baby, Addie said, arms crossed as she floated at the head of the table. I gaped at her. I'm being a baby, but it was over your dead body that you were going to let Camille test Shelby way back when. She nodded. It's Camille. It's different now. Her face softened. And there's something going on with you girls. So far, we ain't been able to find anything that remotely resembles an explanation. If you're lighting up like a Christmas tree, then we found something you all have in common. Searching all the faces around me, I sighed when even Ray and Shelby looked at me expectantly. I slammed my brows down in a glower. Fine. Just do it and get it over with. If you go into it with that attitude, it'll hurt, Camille said. Relax. Ray stood up and traded chairs with me, and as I faced the woman who'd become one of my best friends, I did my best to relax. Still, I was a little nervous. There were thoughts and feelings that, though they weren't bad, were private. She smiled reassuringly at me as if she knew what I was thinking. I'm just checking your voltage, as you put it. Nothing else. A heartbeat after she put her hands on my head. It was like I had a brain freeze. But then it faded, and it just felt a little strange. Sort of like somebody was pulling a string through there. It was over before I could even find a good comparison, and I was surprised when Camille took her hands away. All eyes turned to her. Yep, she said. Just like Shelby and Ray. I didn't think I'd ever say this, but from a magical perspective, the Flynn witches, or at least these three, are some of the brightest bulbs. Hey, Shelby said, that was me. You never thought you'd say it. Camille smiled. Kidding. I just couldn't let that one go. Well, said Beth, at least we know they're normal for them. I reckon that's a good thing, but it doesn't put us any closer to finding out why everybody's gifts seem to be on steroids lately, and it doesn't tell us if they've always been like that or if their hard wiring has changed. No, it doesn't, Addie said, but there doesn't appear to be a way around it, so the only way to fix it is to move through it. I reckon it could be worse. Really? Ray asked, stuffing her hands in her pockets. I suppose making miniatures and extreme gardening are fads right now, but I'm not looking for a new hobby. How could it be worse? 
Beth shook her head and gave her the infamous think-before-you-speak look both sisters were known for. You could be losing gifts rather than gaining them. I hadn't considered that, but once she pointed it out, suddenly an occasional broken lamp or shrunken desk didn't seem so bad. I mean, look how nice the petunias were. Chapter 7 I stayed up late making pastries for brew, and I groaned and hit the snooze when the alarm went off at seven the next morning. I shoved my head under the pillow, just wanting to escape reality for a few more minutes. I did my best to gather my wits and shake the sleep from my brain, but I'd had weird dreams all night that made no sense. For the first time in years, I dreamed of my dad. That left me a bit out of sorts, but when the alarm went off the second time, I shoved the covers off and swung my legs over the edge. I had to get the pastries to Ray. Then I had a hair appointment. Bill was a stickler for being on time, and I didn't want to suffer through the lecture about respecting the value of other people's time for the first half of my haircut. I dressed and went through my morning routine in ten minutes flat. Since Coralie was going to be washing my hair anyway, I just did my best to stuff the wild red ringlets under a ball cap and figured it was good enough. Snatching my phone off the nightstand, I was happy to see I was a little early. If I hurried, I'd have time to take Hunter a cup of caffeine before I went to face the mavens of meddling. I slid the boxes of pastries onto the seat, then fastened a special harness around them that Matt had designed for me. I was expecting a check from a boarder and grabbed the mail on my way out, then pushed toward the shop. My bleary brain was looking forward to our date with a latte. Hunter had called late the night before to let me know he wouldn't be coming over at all. Since Ida Crenshaw lived by herself, they decided to take a look at her place before anybody else had a chance to go in. Unfortunately, she was a stickler for tidiness, and all they'd found was a pie plate, a water glass, and a wine glass that she'd already washed before putting them in the dishwasher. They were kind of flying blind since they weren't even sure what the poison was yet. My mind drifted back to Hank's murder, death by pie, and I wondered if we had a copycat on our hands. That would suck. Ida was unpleasant, but Hank had been downright mean, so Ida didn't have nearly the number of enemies. She was a self-righteous old biddy, but she wasn't bad to the core like Hank was, and she sure hadn't deserved to die. Rayanne and Lavanna, a witch who had moved to Keyhole last Christmas under the oddest of circumstances, were busting their humps when I cruised through the back door. Brew for you was packed, and there was a line that looked more like a mosh pit than folks waiting for coffee. I jumped in beside Lavanna, who was making the coffees, and listened as Ray called back the next order. Lavanna was adding the milk to a latte, so I slid in and made the double-shot mint macchino. She looked up at me, smiled, and made room for me in front of the machine. It was nice being back behind the counter. The three of us had worked together so often that we were a well-oiled, caffeine-producing machine, and the line was down to nothing in ten minutes. I wiped down the counter in front of the machine, then tossed the rag into the sanitizer bucket. Well, ladies, it's been real, but I have to get this coffee to Hunter before my hair appointment, and the last thing I want is to listen to Belle's tardy tangent. Slipping the lids onto my own triple-shot caramel latte and the mocha latte I'd made for Hunter, I stuffed a couple bear claws into one bag, some random pastries into another, and scooted out from behind the counter. Thanks, girl, Ray said, and Lavanna nodded. Where'd everybody come from, anyway? I asked. It's the middle of the week. I cocked a brow at Ray and bit the inside of my cheek to keep from smiling. Did you accidentally grow the crowd? Ha ha, she said, putting her hands on her hips. It's been like that all week. It's just the fall push. 
lots of tourists enjoying the tail end of summer, and locals hoping for news about... She stopped abruptly when the bell above the front door jangled. I turned to see what zipped her lip, and Rose Crenshaw, Ida's daughter, shuffled toward the counter, her hazel eyes red and watery, and her face puffy. Rose, I said, setting down the pastries and putting my hand on her arm. I'm so sorry about your mama. I truly hoped she hadn't heard about our exchange at the Piggly Wiggly, but even if she had, nobody knew how high-hatted her mother could be better than she did. I couldn't even count the times I'd seen Ida embarrass her daughter in front of other people, berating her appearance or actions, or worse yet, the lineage of the people she was with, so I doubted she'd hold a grudge if she had heard. She gave me a watery smile. Thanks, no. I appreciate that. Glancing at Ray, who gave her that smile reserved for people you know are grieving, she ordered a coffee and a blackberry danish. As Lavana served it up, Rose turned to me, chewing on her lip and shifting her weight from foot to foot as if she wanted to say something. We'd been friends in high school, but had drifted apart like people do. She'd gone her way and married her high school sweetheart, and I'd gone to UGA. We still chatted when we saw each other, but that was about it. She'd divorced several months ago, from what I'd heard, and moved back to Keyhole. Glancing at my watch again, I realized I was going to be late for my hair appointment if I didn't get a move on. But Rose obviously had something on her mind. Since I was going to surprise Hunter, it wasn't like he was waiting for me. So I did the only thing I could. Come on, I said to her. You look like you could use some company. Her chin trembled a little, but she gave me a tremulous smile and nodded. I really could. She seemed to notice the second cup in my hand for the first time, and her cheeks flushed. But I don't want to put you out. I waved her off and led her to a small booth in the corner. He didn't even know I was coming, and I can stop to say hi after my haircut. What had been more of a dull roar of voices before Rose entered had turned to a low buzz of chatter as everybody tried way too hard to pretend they weren't looking at her or at least most of them did. Some outright stared. I wanted to smack them, but settled for skewering a few of the worst offenders with death glares as I passed them. To be fair, they had the decency to blush and look away, but weren't so ashamed of themselves that they resumed a volume of speech that would cause them to not miss our conversation. Just to be spiteful, I muttered a spell that would make our voices sound like whispered gibberish. Let them do with that what they would. The poor girl probably felt like a bug under a microscope already. I knew I did when Addie passed. Everybody was kind. Well, except for Hank and his crew. But after I came out of the haze, all I wanted was for people to stop walking on eggshells and hovering. Thank goodness for Cora Lee and Bobby Sue. They'd mourned, too, but knew I'd needed normalcy and had done their best to provide that without crowding me. And I'd had Rayanne and Shelby, too. As far as I knew, Rose had nobody. She was divorced and had no kids. She had a much older half-brother who was living in China or somewhere and had been estranged from the family for years. Her daddy was around, but it wasn't like he was mourning the loss of the woman who'd stolen his house. So, long story short, the girl needed somebody who just wanted to have coffee with her, with no judgment or expectations. And because I knew how she felt, I was more than willing to be that somebody. Chapter 8 I slid into the side of the booth that allowed me to see the other patrons while Rose got the street view. That was probably a good thing, because a few folks were still casting what they thought were covert glances in our direction. Rose fiddled with her cup for a couple seconds, not quite sure what to say. I wasn't either, 
So I pulled a bear claw out of the bag and took a bite of it. I knew which questions not to ask and which profound philosophical statements to avoid. No, she wasn't okay. Yes, she realized her mama wouldn't want her to be sad, though in her case, I wasn't so sure. Yes, she realized her mama had gone on to a better place. Again, not so sure on that one, but I wasn't going to be the one to cast the shadow of doubt. She knew her mama, and I was sure the thought had already occurred to her, regardless of what she believed. There was one standard condolence I should offer, though, seeing as how she obviously had something on her mind. Rose, is there anything at all I can do for you? And it's an honest-to-goodness question, not just a platitude. Actually, she said, looking up from picking at her Danish, there is. I glanced around to make sure the whisper spell was still holding. It must have been, because people seemed to have mostly given up on eavesdropping and resumed the business of drinking coffee and talking about whatever it was they were discussing before the gossip du jour had entered the building. Whatever you need. I was happy she'd always been like us, tough and independent, rather than mousy and spineless. It made relating to her much easier, and I knew she wasn't going to ask me to do anything cheesy, like watch old family movies. We just didn't express things that way. She took a deep breath. I have to go to her house to get her an outfit. We had a fallen out a couple months ago, and I haven't talked to her since then. She died with that between us, and I just don't think I can go in there by myself without losing it. Would you mind going with me? I hate to ask, but bless her heart. I couldn't even imagine having to do such a thing alone. Of course I will, Rose. Just say when. Tomorrow morning, if you don't mind. Her chin trembled again when I nodded. Me and Mama had our differences, but she was still my mother, and I loved her. I hate that the last thing I said to her was that she was a miserable old bat. This is where most people would say her mom knew she didn't mean it. Since she was like me, though, that would have made her feel worse, because she probably had meant it, at least a little. Instead, I went with the truth. She knew you loved her. I know, but it still sucks. She swiped at an errant tear that had escaped the corner of her eye, then sniffed and tried to smile. I'm sorry I'm such a mess. I furrowed my brow at her and made sure I had her gaze. You have every right to be a mess, so don't feel a bit bad about it. Grieve in your own way and in your own time. I motioned to her plate. But don't waste that Danish. You need something besides regret in your belly, and those berries are fresh picked out of Addie's patch. Another good thing about having Ray and Beth in the family, year-round fresh berries. This time, she did smile and took a big bite out of the pastry. Wow, she said, around a mouthful, rolling her eyes. Every time I eat one of these... I'm amazed again by how good they are. Magical. Thanks, I said, tipping one corner of my mouth up at the unintended pun. Baked with love to cure what ails you, or at least give you the energy to deal with it. She took a drink of coffee, then set down her cup and reached across to lay her hand on mine. Thank you, Noel, for going with me and for giving me a few minutes to breathe. Any time. Have you talked to your dad? I asked. She shook her head, her lip curling a little bit in disgust. Not really, other than to give him the news. I hadn't even talked to him since I've been back. When I called, he was up in Atlanta, though I have no reason why. He's not exactly torn up about Mama. Her relationship with her father was complicated. They'd been close when she was small, but after the divorce, he'd pulled away. 
it was probably because Ida had been brutal to him, but the side effect was that he'd essentially abandoned Rose. She'd gone from being a daddy's girl to being not. I didn't have anything to say that would make that better because I knew how it felt to have a crappy dad, so I just sat with her and gave her some room to breathe and get some calories in her belly. We finished our coffee, then agreed to meet at my shop the next morning. As I watched her go, I felt bad that she was going to have such a bumpy road ahead of her. Chapter 9 I slipped in the front door of the clip and curl, just under the clock. Another minute, and I'd have been <gasps> late. As it was, Belle glanced at the clock and gave me the stink eye as the bells over the door jingled as it closed. Her translucent, painted-on brows lowered into a glower that had probably killed women more faint of heart than me. Hey, sweetie, Corley said, sweeping up the last of the hair from her last client. How you doing? Just give me a couple minutes. Sue Ann Jennings just left, and it took me longer than expected. That girl's so cheap, she tries to cut and color her hair herself. Then I have to fix it. It never fails. This time, she highlighted it, too, fried it to a frizzy crisp, and left big blobs of white at the roots. She shook her head. You'd think she'd learn. Belle humphed. She keeps that up. She'll be bald, and you won't have to worry about it for a while. True enough, Corley replied, leaning the broom in the corner, the dustpan locked to the handle. She brushed off her hands and gave me a brilliant smile, then motioned to her chair. I set a bag of goodies I'd brought from Brew on top of the mini-fridge in the corner. Coralie loved my apple fritters. Where's Elise? I asked, wondering if I was going to be able to get a pedicure while I was there. Took off right in the middle of her shift to go piddle-shitting around town, Belle groused. Coralie slammed her hands on her hips and scowled at her mentor. For the love of little green apples, what in the world is wrong with you today? You've had a mood on since I got here. She turned to me. Pay her no mind. Elise took her mama some soup and cold medicine because she's under the weather. She'll be back in 20 minutes or so. Belle started to say something, but snapped her mouth shut, a rare occurrence for her. Well, now I was curious, too. As former owner of the salon, she was overbearing and bossy, but like Addie, it was rare for her to truly get her bloomers in a wad, and wadded they were. She was pacing midair and grumbling. I am so glad to be getting my hair trimmed this morning, I said, trying to regain a little of the levity that usually resided in the shop's atmosphere. You know, you should consider cutting it short, Belle said to me. You've got the face for it, and all you do is complain about what a mess it is. I turned to her, unable to believe what I was hearing. The one time I thought about cutting it, you threatened to sing 99 bottles of beer every time I came in until it grew out again. Ignore her, sugar, Coralie said, waving a hand in Belle's direction. She doesn't mean it and I wouldn't cut it off in any case. Shooting Belle the side eye, I slid into the barber chair, and Coralie wrapped the cape around my neck, then tucked cotton in around the band. For the next ten minutes, I just enjoyed the feel of the warm water and Coralie's nails massaging my scalp. That alone made it worth the twenty-five bucks she charged for a cut. Unlike those prissy shops in Atlanta, she thought everyone should be able to afford to look nice and thought it was ludicrous that a wash, blow-dry, and style cost extra. She could have charged more, and most people would have gladly paid it, but she refused. 
and I knew for a fact she cut some folks' breaks, too. When I was poor, she'd never take more than $10, even with the tip included. If it weren't for my pride, she would have done it for free. Disappointment washed over me when she finished rinsing and wrapped the towel around my head. Once she leaned me up, she wasted no time in toweling my hair dry, then spritzing in conditioner and combing it out. Then the questions started flowing. So, dish, she said, spritzing in more leave-in conditioner when she hit a particularly large snag. I know you've talked to Hunter about it, so set the record straight. Was she really poisoned? There was no need to deny it, because she already knew the answer anyway. It was just a warm-up question. Yeah, she was, I said, wincing as she hit another tangle with the comb. It wasn't her fault. I had so much hair, and as curly as it was, it was impossible for me to ever get a comb through it. At times like these... I was tempted to follow Belle's advice. What kind? she asked, pulling that section of my hair into a bunch and working patiently at the rat's nest. No clue, I replied. They went to her house last night, and all they found was a dessert plate, a cup, and a wine glass, all three of which were in the dishwasher, mostly washed already. That don't surprise me, Coralie said releasing the section of untangled hair and moving on. She was a stickler for tidiness. Her car was always spotless, and so was her house, the few times I was ever there, anyway. I nodded, then regretted it because she poked me with the comb. She was brutal with Rose, too, I said. Any time I went to her house, her room was like a model room, a place for everything, and everything in its place. Made me feel like a pig when she'd come to my house, but at least I didn't feel I had to smooth the quilt if I sat on my bed. Her mom was a tyrant. Belle scowled. Maybe she just didn't want her things all messy. Maybe she wanted a clean house, so if anybody came over, she wouldn't be embarrassed. Did you ever think of that? Studying the grouchy, living-impaired matron, I said, Coralie's right. You're all in a snit about something. What's going on? She heaved an unnecessary sigh. Fine. I used to babysit Ida Crenshaw. She grew up to be a money-grubbing bitch. But she wasn't always that way, and a lot of it was her mother's fault. How so? I asked. Was her mama as horrible and entitled as she was? Belle shook her head. No, it wasn't like that. Just the opposite, really. They were dirt poor, and Ida's daddy was meaner than a snake, at least before he ran off. Glenna, that was Ida's mama, was always drilling it into Ida's head to marry money. She said if you had to be shackled to a man and miserable, you might as well do it in a mansion as a shack. I'd heard that said, but was too idealistic to believe it. Of course, I guess it was true, if you didn't have anything to fall back on and got stuck with a horrible spouse. When you were poor, It was easy for other people to tell you to pack up and leave when things got bad, but not nearly as simple to do. It was hard to go out on your own when you didn't have a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of, especially if you had kids. Not saying it couldn't or shouldn't be done, but it would be a lot easier to do if you had money to get a place and didn't have to worry about your kids going hungry. In fairness, Belle continued, I don't think she meant for Ida to do it three times and rob the poor men blind, but I know where it came from. Now she's dead, and I can't help but remember what a sweet child she was. Just out of curiosity, where does being a clean freak 
Come in, Coralie asked as she pulled my hair from the comb, then plopped the tool into the sanitizer jar. Belle huffed. I don't think Lena ever washed a dish or touched a vacuum. Their house was disgusting, and Ida never asked friends over because she was so embarrassed. I reckon she went too far the other way on that one, too. She was so eager to slam the door on that life, she didn't realize she was making her own daughter just as miserable, except in a different way. That explains Belle's surliness, then. She was gruff and prickly, but she had a good heart, and these types of situations were never easy. I'm sorry, I said. I didn't realize you knew her. Thanks, she answered, averting her eyes and running filmy fingers across the edge of the table in thought. I'm not just mourning her death. I guess I'm mourning her life a little, too. I'd always hoped she'd find happiness, and now she won't. Well, Coralie said, somebody will, though. I suppose now that she's gone, Felix gets the house back. Oh, yeah, Belle said, pressing her lips together. I'd forgotten about that. Coralie snorted. I don't know how. It was the dirtiest divorce of the decade. The screaming match outside the courthouse when it was over was epic. Even worse than the great Hank debacle. Now my curiosity was piqued. When Hank died, Anna May and Sherry Lynn had a knockdown drag out on the courthouse lawn. And if something was bigger than that, then I wanted to hear about it. Do tell, I said, all ears. I justified my nosiness by filing it under investigating. After all, gathering dirt was included in the price of the haircut. Right after the divorce was over, Coralie said in the tone she used for the juiciest stuff, they had a screaming match right there on the courthouse steps. I don't remember the whole fight, but the last thing Ida said was, I told you you'd get that house over my dead body. Then she shook the hot off the press divorce papers at him, and she was literally right. She didn't get the house outright. She only got lifetime rights, which is all she cared about anyway. So who gets it now that she's dead? I asked as Coralie squirted a baseball-sized glob of mousse into her palm, then worked it through my hair. Belle stroked her chin, a speculative gleam in her eye. I reckon Felix does. I mean, I have no doubt if Rose needed a place, he'd let her have it. But she has a house of her own. From what I hear, she's got it mortgaged to her eyeballs. But at least she's keeping a roof over her own head. And Felix just retired, regardless of what Ida thought when she married him. He was land rich, but money poor. Not paying rent will make his life a whole lot easier. I chewed on that as Coralie scrunched and dried my hair. As I paid, I remembered my visit from Rose and related it. Hearing she had a huge mortgage made me feel bad for her, though. Before I got the money from Hank, it about gave me ulcers just seeing the light bill in the mailbox. If I'd had a mortgage, we'd have been living at Aunt Beth's. So the stress of that had to be incredible. Poor lamb, Coralie said drawing my attention back to her as she handed me my change. This can't be easy for her. I'm glad you're going with her. Me too, I said, and was surprised to realize I meant it. As I pushed out into the sunshine, I thought about what I'd learned and decided it was time to meet up with Hunter. Something told me I'd made at least as much progress in the investigation this morning as he had. Chapter 10 Since I'd stayed to talk to Rose and missed the chance to take him a coffee, I swung back by Brew to get a couple iced coffees and two chicken salad sandwiches. 
Rayanne made it from scratch, just like she did all her food, and used grapes and pecans as well as the traditional ingredients. It was hellfire hot outside, and I was tempted to drive, even though it was only a couple of blocks. In the end, I resisted the temptation and decided I needed to walk off the bear claw from that morning. While I was walking, Angus Small and his girlfriend, Trouble, popped in and floated beside me. Angus was Keyhole's former town sobriety-impaired citizen, who had died a couple winters before. That hadn't let him give up living, though. Hey, no, he said. What's doing? We popped by your shop, but Errol said you hadn't been in yet. Yeah, Trouble added. And he didn't say it in the most charitable of tones, either. I pulled in a deep breath and released it. Errol was the ghost of the man who owned my building before I did, and he had a much different view of professional behavior than I did. I can't imagine he did, I said. It's a good thing he's not able to have a stroke, because if he were, I have no doubt I'd have given him one by now. Yeah, but don't worry about him, Angus said, stuffing his hands in his pockets. He's grown to love you in his own way and just fusses over you because it gives him something to do. I wish he'd get out more with us. I know, I said, wishing the same thing. I worried about him keeping himself closed off as much as he did. I've tried to get him to go do more things, too. He likes the movie nights, but that's about it. He does like to watch TV in any form, Trouble said. We had one when I was a kid, but it didn't get very many channels. We were always outside playing or doing something anyway, so it didn't much matter. Since I've been back, I just haven't gotten in the habit of watching. Too many other things to do, she said, reaching out and taking Angus's hand and smiling. I'm the same way, I said. Don't get me wrong. I love me some Netflix, but in moderation. By that time, I'd reached the courthouse and glanced up the wide staircase that circled around the front of the building. Normally, I found the building graceful and dignified. Today, the wraparound staircase in the front made me tired just looking at it. It seemed like there were about 300 steps to the front doors. I trudged up them, the humidity and my lack of restful sleep making my feet feel like sledgehammers by the time I made it to the top. When I crossed between the massive Greek columns and stepped into the shade of the wide veranda, it felt like the temperature dropped 10 degrees. Angus and Trouble had floated along beside me, chatting about the upcoming Halloween festivities. I was looking forward to them myself. Halloween tied with Christmas as my favorite holiday— and not just because I was a witch. We're heading to the lake, he said, when I reached for the handle to one of the double doors. But we wanted to check in, make sure you're doing okay. We hadn't seen you in a couple days. If we hadn't run into you here, we were going to pop out to the farm tonight. Thanks, guys, I said, warmed by their concern. I'm good, just been busy. And things have been a little choppy for us lately, what with the murder and all. Have fun. They waved as they faded out, and I was grateful once again that they had reunited. It surprised me that they liked to spend so much time at the lake, considering trouble had drowned in it, but they said that didn't matter. Some of their best memories from when they were living had been made there, and they still spend quite a bit of time in a little cove only the locals knew about. I made my way to the back of the building where the sheriff's office was and smiled at Peggy Sue, the receptionist and all-around keeper of the town's records. If anybody bought or sold property, got married or divorced, died or had a baby, she knew about it. Hey, Noel, How are you today, sweetie? She looked up from the paperwork she was filing and smiled at me over the readers perched on the end of her nose. Good, Peggy Sue. How about you? 
I'm doing great. Just getting this year's property taxes ready to send out. And for the first time ever, I don't feel slimy about doing it. For years, Peggy Sue had lived under Hank's thumb, and it had been her job to send out the grossly inflated property tax bills. Her cornflower blue eyes glittered in her round face, and her voice dropped to a conspiratorial whisper. Not only are many folks getting a pass because they were overcharged for years, but Hank's old cronies aren't doing so good. As you well know, Butch Davies and Ronnie Dean... Hank's two main henchmen, are in prison, and if there's any kind of karma, they're going to lose their places for taxes. She gave me a wink and a smile to rival the cat that ate the cream. It's a shame they both owe eight years' worth of back taxes, because Hank never made them pay. Same with Jim Simpson, Judge Calloway, Dan Green, and a whole list of other upstanding citizens Hank was in cahoots with. With any luck, We'll be having quite the sale on the courthouse steps come the first of the year. That is, if the bank don't take them first. That made me happy as a pig in mud, which was an apt phrase considering we were discussing swine. Not only were the good folks getting what was due them, the bad guys were too. Jim Simpson was a sleazeball who owned the local gentleman's club where Sherry Lynn had worked, along with a bunch of other shady businesses. Judge, excuse me, former Judge Calloway had swept things under the rug when Hank needed him to and slapped outrageous fines on regular citizens to line his own and Hank's pockets. One good example he fined Hazel Heater, who was 83 years old, $200 for jaywalking from Coralie's to Dr. Helmick's office right across the street because her son had refused to pay his extra business tax that month. I smirked at the thought of the good judge losing his property. Bless his shriveled little black heart. It was about time karma got around to dealing with him. But I cut her some slack because, to be fair, she had a lot to do around our town. Dan Green had been cut from the same cloth. He was a local real estate attorney who'd advised innocent folks to sell their properties at below fair market value for a number of reasons that all had one thing in common. Dan and Hank made a boatload of money off the deals. So you're saying they're paying for their deeds— with their deeds. I couldn't help it. I gave an evil giggle. She rolled her eyes but smiled. I couldn't have said it better myself. Eyeballing the bags in my hand, she pointed toward them with her chin. There's not, by chance, something in one of those for me, is there? I grinned. Of course. I wouldn't dare come without bearing gifts. I'd grabbed a couple of blueberry danishes for her, along with the sandwiches and bear claws I'd gotten for Hunter and me. She had a sweet tooth, and after all she'd done for me, a couple pastries two or three times a week were nothing at all. Setting one of the bags on her desk, I pointed toward Hunter's office with my chin. Is he in? I didn't think to text before I came. She nodded as she pulled a danish out of the bag. He just got back. Go on. He's not with anybody. I circled around her desk, then pecked on the door frame of his office. The door was open, and he was studying the top sheet of a stack of papers. Lunch delivery, I said. Caffeine blast. No extra charge. He smiled and motioned me in, then leaned back and stretched in his chair. Any progress? I asked, pulling the chair in front of his desk closer so I could open the bags. Not that you'd notice, he replied. I've talked to the ladies in Ida's reading group, but none of them seem to know much about her, other than superficial stuff. He took a long pull of his iced coffee. One of them did tell me she wasn't speaking to her daughter, and another said she'd gotten into it with a woman who'd recently moved back to town. Apparently, 
The woman had old films of when they were kids, and when she suggested they get together and watch them, Ida had a fit. Knowing what I now did about her childhood, I could understand why. But it seemed to me she could have found a better way to decline than blowing her cork. He squeezed the bridge of his nose as if warding off an impending headache. I pulled the sandwiches out of the bag and handed him one, figuring at least part of his problem was that he probably hadn't had anything to eat. If it weren't for the heat, we would have gone to the little park in the town square in front of the courthouse. As it was, I was content to eat in the A.C. Late August in southern Georgia was brutal. Summer always went down fighting. So, I got my hair cut a little bit ago. I said. Raising a brow, he grinned. He knew by now that more often than not, that was code for, guess what I heard. So, what did you learn? He asked. Please, tell me it was something good that will give me an edge to pick at. It just may, I answered, taking a bite of my sandwich. I explained the situation with the house to him. Interesting he said when I was finished. The ex had drifted to the bottom of the list since they'd been divorced for so long, and he appears to have moved on. What do you mean, moved on? I asked. Since I'd lost track of Rose for the most part, I had no idea what her dad had been up to. Felix just got remarried. He took a bite of his chicken sandwich and chewed. Some woman from Atlanta he met while he was at the fishing tournament. She was here to cheer a friend on, or so she said. Odd that Cora Lee hadn't mentioned that. Was it possible something was going on in Keyhole that she didn't know about? It must be new enough to have not made the circuits yet, but I was going to make it a point to text her because it was a rare thing indeed to get the gossip drop on her. Hmm, I said, crinkling my forehead. Wonder what the new wife thinks about wife number one living in that big fancy farmhouse. Does she have her own place? He ran his tongue over his teeth to clear away the bread, then took a drink of coffee. I'm not sure yet. All I've heard about either of them, I heard from Peggy Sue. I was on my way to talk to him myself, but it was just to cover the bases. Now I think it might be a good idea to talk to them both. Sure would, I said, around a mouthful of sandwich. But I'm not sure if he's in town. I had coffee with Rose, and she said he was in Atlanta when she called to tell him about her mom. I have plenty to do between now and then, anyway he replied. I have to go talk to the ladies at the auxiliary because she'd been at a meeting the evening before. Jim's taking a look at the samples on his own time tonight so we can figure out what type of poison was used. Jim Sanders was a Keyhole native and a forensic scientist who worked for the state of Georgia, but still lived in Keyhole when he wasn't on a case somewhere. His folks were getting up there in age and he didn't want to lose time with them or not be there if they needed him. He had access to all the fancy equipment in the Atlanta crime lab and did what he could when something came up here. Something like speeding up tests when somebody gets poisoned. That's good of him, I said. Plus, I'm sure the ladies at the auxiliary will know more about this mystery woman. Maybe Ida knew about her and said something. You've got a few different motives all wrapped up in one place right there. Right, he said, snorting, because it's always that easy around here. That was a valid point. Chapter 11 When I left, I figured it was time for me to go to work before Errol had a meltdown. He didn't understand why I didn't keep regular hours. Since the place had been a sandwich shop when he'd owned it, I'd just gotten rid of the faint pickle smell. It didn't make sense to him why I didn't have set nine-to-five hours. 
With the way I ran my business, I didn't really have to. For one, I sold most of my pieces by word of mouth or via my website. That meant I had the luxury of setting my own hours and working at will. And despite what he seemed to think, I put in plenty of hours. I'd taken two of my favorite shows, American Pickers and Flea Market Flip, and combined them. I went to estate sales, yard sales, flea markets, anywhere I thought I may find something good for a decent price, then brought it back and either refurbished it or combined it with other pieces I picked up to make entirely new items. I also worked on projects in the back of our second barn turned garage at the farm. So just because he didn't see me working didn't mean I wasn't. Telling him that was like talking to a wall, though. Currently, I was working on a set of freestanding lamps that I was making out of old metal buckets. Rather than clean them back up to new, I decided to leave most of the patina on them because it gave them a great rustic feel. A few days back, I'd started cutting star patterns out of the buckets and figured I'd use old wrought iron bed posts that I'd salvaged for the posts. I hadn't decided yet what to use for the bases. I was satisfied so far, but needed to finish cutting the patterns out of the buckets, then line them with thin pieces of colored plexiglass. When I'd first started the business, it was hard not to keep every piece I made because I ended up falling in love with them. When I realized what people were willing to pay, it didn't take me long to decide I could always make another for myself. Before I'd even unlocked the door to the place, Errol floated through and gave me the look. It's noon, he stated flatly. I'm aware, I said, keeping my voice neutral. By now, his censure was water off a duck's back. He humphed and grumbled a little as I let myself in and slid my purse behind the counter. Is there anything in particular you want to watch on TV, or are you good? I asked in an attempt to bring him back around. Once we'd figured out he'd been murdered rather than just run out of town, we'd managed to get most of his personal belongings back, That's another story that's intense on a few different levels, and his 55-inch smart TV was among them. Since I'd gotten his shop for practically nothing, the one thing he'd asked for was the right to stay there, and for me to mount his TV and keep it on channels he wanted to watch. I figured that was fair, and I'd have done it for him regardless of how much I'd paid for the place. Yeah, he said, relenting on the whole time thing. Master Schiff is coming on. Can you flip it for me? I picked up the remote and changed the channel, then gave Norman, our black and white pet rat, a handful of crackers. He gave me a toothy grin and nodded his thanks. His girlfriend, whom we'd named Sammy, with her approval, stayed back a little. She was still getting used to the whole being friends with people thing, but she was coming around. I just laid her crackers on the counter and gave her some space. I'd turned the space Errol had used for storage into a workshop and transformed the seating space into a display area. As always, when I walked into the working half, I pulled in a deep breath and smiled. It may sound strange, but the faint smells of paint, varnish, and old wood were soothing and put me in my zen state, sort of like my baking did. Once I got into the rhythm of sanding or cutting or painting, my mind was free to wander. I did my best thinking when I was in that state, and often came up with some great ideas for projects, or solutions to problems when I was in the zone. It also infused a little of my magic into each piece, adding just a little extra something to them. Today, I needed to clean the yellow paint off the wrought iron posts, so I pulled on my gloves, kicked on the exhaust fan Hunter and Matt had installed for me, and got to work. Sometimes, I was content to leave some of the paint on the pieces because it lent them an old look, but with these, 
I wanted them clean and black, and I wasn't one to cheat by painting over the old stuff. As I rubbed and rinsed and rubbed some more, I thought about the problems Ray was having. Her issue was different from ours. Rather than developing new gifts, the ones she had were growing stronger. Of course, that's how my changes had started, too, so maybe that wasn't a good assumption to make. The way I saw it, the problem wasn't how to deal with the changes. We could figure that part out because we'd already learned to master the ones we had. In her case, she just have to adjust the wattage. No, the problem, as I saw it, was why they were changing. When we figured that out, we'd have our answers. I finished both posts and glanced at my phone. I'd only been at it for two hours, so I still had plenty of time to add the light bulb fixtures to the posts. That was going to be a little tricky, but I'd figure something out. I was wrong, though. The more I tried to make it work, the more I disliked the idea. There was no way for me to hide the cord, and even if I hot glued it to the post, it was still going to look like crap. I huffed out a breath and looked around, thinking. Nothing came to mind. So, I moved on to the lampshades, hoping inspiration would strike while I was working on them. It didn't take me long to figure out that in order for the plexiglass to adhere to the metal, I was going to have to remove the patina and oxidation from the inside. It would have been easier done before I cut out the designs, but that was spilt milk. Instead, I worked with what I had. Though it took me twice as long as it would have, had I cleaned them first, I still had the colored film in place in less than an hour. I stuck it over my shop light just to get a general feel for what it would look like, and I was happy with the results. The bell above my front door jangled, and a familiar yoo-hoo echoed back to me. I smiled as Anna Mae pushed her way through the swinging door and stopped, admiring the lamp. Hey, sugar! How are you? It feels like I haven't seen you in a coon's age, so I figured I'd pop in. Hey yourself, I said, putting the light back in the soon-to-be lampshade. What do you think? She puckered her lips to the side and furrowed her brow. I like them. What are you using for stands, or are you making them table lamps and using clay jugs or something? I'd planned on using those. I motioned to the bedposts. But they look like crap with the cords. I can't think of anything else to use, though. The idea of using stoneware jugs appealed to me, though it wouldn't work with the buckets. I made a mental note to stay on the lookout for some that would work. She looked around the shop, her gaze evaluating every item for potential. She finally stopped looking and smiled. There, she said, pointing toward the back of the room. The only things there were the broom, the mop, and the break table where I worked sometimes. Where? If she had a brilliant idea, I was missing it. Not that I doubted her. She was every bit as creative as I was, if not more. Her shop, Things Remembered, carried items similar to mine, but she focused more on small items, clothes, jewelry, and rehoming antiques after she'd cleaned them up a little. The wine bottle, silly! There were two wine bottles I'd forgotten about sitting on my back table. I picked one up and held it up to the light to see how opaque it was, then stuck the light shade over it to see how it looked. I liked it. The buckets were just the right size, and the burgundy glass of the bottle went well with the colored plexiglass film I'd used. Perfect, I said. Now just to decide whether or not to leave the labels. Some people liked stuff like that, and some didn't. I tilted my head to the side, trying to figure which would be best. Take them off, she said without hesitation. You sure? They add flavor. She laughed. If they were antiques, maybe, but Bluegrass Winery is still alive and well, and it ain't exactly a pinky-out type of wine. Trust me, there's nothing that could add enough flavor to that wine to get me to drink it. I'd clean the bottle off and let that pretty burgundy glass shine if I were you. 
She made a face and gave me a look of mock disappointment. I gotta admit, you let me down a little buying a three-dollar bottle of wine. Not that I'm against a bargain, but some things are just worth the extra few bucks. Trust Anime to know her wines. Lord knows she'd probably drunk enough of it over the years she was married to Hank. If not, she should have. Oh, no, I said, wagging my finger, unwilling to let her think I'd sink that low. I did have my standards. Trust me, I didn't buy that. Somebody brought it to the summer cookout we hosted at the farm last month as a thank you gift. The cheese in the basket was good, so I forgave them for bringing crappy wine. I cringed. At least until Ray and I had to suffer through the wicked headaches we had the next morning after we drank it. She nodded. That's what you get for drinking the cheap stuff. Reaching out to peel the label off one of the bottles, she turned the conversation to the talk of the town. So, ain't it just awful about Ida Crenshaw? Lordy, I don't know what this town's coming to. Seems like folks have lost their minds sometimes. Yeah, I said, fiddling with the wine bottles. I'm going to her house with Rose in the morning to pick out an outfit for her. Oh, that's so sweet of you. I don't really know her, but from the few times I ran into her when she was a kid, she seemed reserved. Anna May was several years older than we were, so it made sense that she didn't know her. Yeah, that's mostly because Ida wasn't one to spare the rod, metaphorically speaking. Not that she beat her, but she kept her on a pretty tight leash and could be downright hurtful if poor Rose even put her toe near the line. I picked up a couple of old pine banister caps and decided they'd be perfect for the base. I knew Ida from some work I did with the auxiliary, Anna May continued, handing me the hole saw so I could cut a hole in the wooden end cap for the cord. She wasn't pleasant, that's for sure. Her ex-husband, though, he was nice. After I cut the first hole and turned off the saw, I agreed. He was always nice to me, too, at least what I can remember of him. He and Ida had divorced when Rose was a teenager, and I'd only met him in passing, though I couldn't help be a little disgusted over how he disappointed Rose. He's got a new wife, according to Hunter. Oh, believe me, I know, or at least I knew he was seeing somebody, she said, wrinkling her nose. I saw them yesterday. That couldn't be right. Rose had said he was in Atlanta, I put the saw down. Yesterday, you say? And you're sure? She nodded. Yeah, yesterday morning. I haven't seen him in forever, but it was definitely his truck, and she was in the passenger seat. I saw him on the outskirts of town. And there's no way you're wrong. He told Rose he was in Atlanta. If he said he was out of town, but wasn't, there had to be a reason for it, and I couldn't think of a good one. No, she said, popping her pee. I'm absolutely a hundred percent positive. It was at the tracks, and we had to wait because there was a train. They were right behind me. She was almost sitting in his lap. She wrinkled her nose and gave a little shudder. I mulled that over for a few seconds. Curious, I said and decided to think on it later when I had time to sort it out. I had lamps to finish. I took a couple seconds to zing the hole in the second banister end, then glanced up at her. I take it you know her? Oh, do I ever, she said, flapping her hand. Millie Lance. She used to babysit me when I was little. The woman's a troll. Honestly, I don't know what Felix sees in her. That was odd. I didn't know she was from around here. Anna May nodded. Yep, but she lit out a keyhole lake like her hair was on fire as soon as she turned legal. I'm surprised she's willing to move back. I set down the drill and thought for a minute as I made scores around the bottoms of the wine bottles. I'd run boiling water over the score marks, then use cold water to make a clean break so I could attach them to the banister caps and run the cords up through them. Is her family still here? 
She paused for a minute, thinking. You know, I don't know. I was so little I don't remember much about her, except how hateful she was, and I haven't given her much thought since. We had one of those little furry mutts, and she used to think it was funny to tease him with food, then eat it herself. What a peach. If the woman had relatives around, I'm sure Hunter would have known, or would find out. If they were anything like her, he may do well to start looking in the prison system. At any rate, I said, making the score around the bottom of the second bottle. I reckon a big old farmhouse sitting on a nice piece of land would be incentive enough for most folks to move back, regardless. Anna May narrowed her eyes, her gaze speculative, and her mind obviously taking the same track as mine. If she's as nasty as I remember, I could see her killing Ida to get it. If she thought she wouldn't get caught, she was a real piece of work. I glanced up to see if she was being sarcastic, but she was serious as a heart attack. Looked like maybe it was time to find out more about Millie Lance. Chapter 12 Hunter was already at the farm when I got home. Since he was in street clothes, Rather than his uniform, I assumed that meant he was already done for the day. He and Matt were in the garage fiddling with the bikes, and Gabby and Shelby were in the barn taking care of the horses. I pulled into my regular spot in front of the house, then trotted over to say hi. Hey, you. I rose on my tiptoes for a quick kiss. I figured you'd be later since you had to talk to the ladies from the auxiliary. Wiping the grease off his hands with a rag, he pulled me in for a hug and an Eskimo kiss. I got lucky, sort of. They had a meeting this afternoon, so I caught them all in one spot. I raised a brow as I pulled back to see him. You got sort of lucky? Well, yeah. For one thing, they did their best to rope me into building the framework of their Christmas float. Second, Ida didn't mention anything to anybody about Felix getting remarried, though they did say she'd made a few vague comments about growing old alone lately, which makes me wonder if she knew after all. I puckered my lips and pushed them to the side. If she knew he got married, I can see how she'd feel that way. So maybe she did know. If she did, I don't think she said anything to Rose about it, I talked to her this morning. She didn't mention it, and I'd think she would have. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Gabby leading her horse, Mayhem, into the barn, and felt guilty for letting her and Shelby do all the work. I stepped back and turned toward her. Let me go help them, and then we can relax. Finally, Matt said, teasing. We were kind of in the middle of a two-man job here, and I'm squatting here holding a fuel line while you two make googly eyes and maul each other. Scrunching my nose at him, I left the garage and joined the girls. It didn't take us long to get the chores knocked out. While they finished up with the horses, I fed the chickens and gathered the eggs, pleasantly surprised by how many there were. We'd gotten a couple good laying hens from Harry and Stella Stewart, an older couple who lived down the road from me. He'd been a horse trainer in his youth, and I'd had a rescue who needed more attention than I could give him. In an odd twist of events, the horse had ended up adopting them, and we'd become good friends as well as neighbors since then. Thinking of the couple, Stella, round and merry, and Harry, wiry and gruff, made me smile and I reminded myself to let them know about the cookout we were having the following weekend. When I took the eggs into the house, I grabbed a six-pack of beer out of the fridge, along with a Coke for Shelby, and carried them to the porch where everyone had gathered. Didn't you say TJ and Moira were coming over this evening? Gabby asked, popping the top off her bottle. I gave myself a mental forehead slap as I sat down in the swing next to Hunter. In all the hubbub, I had completely forgotten. 
TJ and Moira were two women I'd met on my very first pick in Eagle Gap, and we'd since become friends. TJ was a witch whose primary gift was, in layman's terms, talking to spirits. It had taken her a while to accept the whole magic-is-real thing, though. She'd been adopted as a baby and hadn't even known she had any biological family or that she was a witch until her aunt Nora, a medium and master herbalist, passed and left TJ her house. TJ's original plan had been to sell it and go back to Virginia where she lived, but Nora had a different plan. When one woman who was looking at the house suggested she'd tear out Nora's prize rose bushes, things got real. Nora, who'd finally gotten her post-life sea legs, let it be known loud and clear that would never happen. When it got out that the house was haunted, any hope of a sale flew out the window, and TJ and her friend Mora left Virginia in the rearview mirror. In addition to being a medium, TJ also had the power of persuasion. Since she'd gotten a late start at being a witch, she'd jump into our lessons sometimes to learn how to control it, Having our own ghosts around was one thing, but it seemed strangers who hadn't crossed over were also attracted to her, and some of them were none too happy about being departed. Some had unfinished business, some just wanted somebody to talk to, and some made no sense at all. She wanted to learn how to shut them out, but so far, we hadn't found the valve to her paranormal spigot. Yeah, I did, I replied to Gabby. I'd forgotten about it, though. I took a pull off my beer, then checked the time on my phone. As a matter of fact, they should be here any minute. As I said it, a car came around the bend in the drive, but it was Ray. I hoped her day had gone better because she was late getting there. Normally, she would have been closed up more than an hour ago. After she pulled up and got out, she took the porch steps two at a time and joined us, grabbing the last beer out of the six-pack and plopping down in a rocking chair. Holy cow, what a beast of a day, she said as she popped the top and took a long swig. I raised a brow. How so? And why are you so late? Yeah, Shelby said, smirking. Is everything okay? You didn't shrink your shop, did you? Ray scowled at her. No, I didn't shrink my shop, brat, though I'm considering shrinking your vocal cords. I'll have you know, I didn't do any magic at all today. That's why I'm so late. I was afraid I'd set the mop and broom into an uncontrollable frenzy if I took a shortcut, and that would be bad for business if anybody saw. What about Lavana? Matt asked from where he was sitting on the steps. Couldn't she do some bibbity-boppity-boo to help? He wiggled his fingers. Lavana was a witch who'd arrived in Keyhole right as everything started to go crazy last Christmas. In fact, she'd been all wrapped up in the crazy, but that's another story, too, though it's short. Ray shook her head. I wish... She was off today, so it was just Angel and me. That means we did it the old-fashioned way, and man, is my back killing me. Shelby laughed. Maybe you should do it that way more often, then. Ray shoved her with her toe. Or maybe I should talk to Addie and tell her I need your help, then you can come and do it the old-fashioned way. No way, Shelby answered. I like working with Doc, and I start school in a few days anyway. She had been working with Will, the local veterinarian, for several months alongside her boyfriend, Will's nephew, Cody. She'd become quite the hand at pulling calves, doctoring horses, and taking care of sick animals in general, and was planning to go to college to follow in his footsteps. Another car approached, cutting off Rayanne's response. Two cars, actually. Camille's was first, followed by TJ's truck a short distance behind. 
Luckily, they were both close enough friends that I didn't feel the need to get off the swing to greet them. Hunter was rubbing the knots out of the back of my neck, and I wasn't in any hurry for him to stop. I loved my job, but bending over to make sure I got the details right killed my back and neck. Hey, Camille, Shelby called as her mentor climbed out of her car. I was surprised to see she was dressed casually in jeans and a t-shirt rather than her usual business suit she wore to her job with the Council of Witches. Were you off today? I asked. Yeah, she replied as she stepped up onto the porch and took a seat in the other rocker. Sort of, anyway. We're having some problems up toward Atlanta. Several herbalists have had some of their rare herbs and other potions, ingredients, stolen, and I thought I was going to have to go up there. Turns out, they'd already done all the spells I would have tried, and they're all more than competent, so the council decided it wasn't worth the expense of sending me. What all was stolen? I asked. I'm not allowed to say, she answered, but I'm getting worried about it. The combination of missing items is only found in a handful of spells, and none of them are good. That didn't sound good, but she was good at her job. I had no doubt she'd figure it out. By that point, TJ and Mora had made their way to the porch. Hey, everyone, TJ said. What's up? Moira asked, then glanced at the beers. Got any more of those? Of course. I said, starting to get up. Shelby waved me off and ran into the house, the screen door slapping shut behind her. In just a couple seconds, she emerged with another six-pack and passed it around. Moira smiled at her and nodded her thanks, and I couldn't help but notice the shadows under her eyes. She had her own set of gifts, but the coolest one was that she could, in essence, make herself invisible by manipulating the light in her own space so that it refracted and reflected off the space around her. She faded right into the background, becoming pretty much invisible as long as she stood still. I was a little jealous. Hey, ladies, I answered. How was the drive? They lived in Eagle Gap, which was almost an hour away. Not bad, except I'm exhausted, TJ said, slumping onto a step. There's this spirit who just won't leave me alone. She talks all night about finding her croc. I have no idea what she's talking about, but it's driving me nuts. Sometimes it's like she can't even hear me. She just mutters to herself about how important it is. And that was why she needed Camille's help to tune them out. Nutty little old dead ladies wandering around in your bedroom just wasn't okay, no matter how important her croc was to her. Chapter 13 The next morning dawned gray and dreary, perfect weather to go pilfering through a dead woman's house. I'd slept like crap the night before, my dreams a mix of weird and sad. I dreamed of my dad again, which bugged me. I hadn't even thought of him except in passing in years, but I wrote it off to making the mental comparison between him and Felix the day before. Of course, that only explained one of the nights I dreamed of him. Things had been crazy, though, with lots of other people's family skeletons rattling around, so that may be it. Or maybe all my long buried daddy issues were bubbling to the top. Lordy, would that be a mess. I made it to the shop early, stopping just long enough at Brew For You to drop off the pastries I'd baked and grab a coffee. Usually, I enjoyed coffee time at the shop, but for once, I wasn't in the mood for company. Ray had noticed something wasn't right, but I'd passed it off as a headache and added an extra shot of espresso to my coffee. By the time Rose arrived out front, I was feeling normal, more or less. I set the TV to lifetime for Errol and set out a few crackers for Norm and Sammy just as Rose pulled up. 
When I ran out to the car, the smell of sulfur was in the air, and I knew it wouldn't be long before the skies opened up. I climbed in and pulled the door shut behind me. Morning, I said, as I fastened my seatbelt. Yeah, it is, she said, her voice heavy. That's about all I can say about it, though. She looked like a woman heading to the gallows. Sorry, she sighed, a ghost of a self-deprecating smile curving her lips and profile. It's been a rough couple days, and I didn't sleep that well last night. Daddy and his new wife came over to check on me, and it ended up feeling more like she was checking on the status of the house. Hunter told me he'd gotten remarried, I said. When did that happen? She heaved a sigh. In the last few weeks, apparently. I can't believe he didn't even tell me he was going to do it. I shook my head, deciding not to tell her Coralie had seen them in town the morning her mom was killed, despite what he'd told her. I figured there was no reason to add any more stress if it turned out to be nothing. Some people. What do you think of her? Personally, she said, brows raised, I think she's looking for a man to take care of her, and she saw Daddy's boat at the tournament and made a serious miscalculation. Her dad had managed to come away from the divorce with his boat, something he'd saved long and hard for, and it was a nice one. I can see how somebody who didn't know him would think he had money. I glanced at her profile as she pulled off down the driveway. You really think that? She pulled in a breath. I don't know, to be honest. Maybe I'm not willing to give her the benefit of the doubt because nobody will ever be good enough for Daddy, as far as I'm concerned. She smiled a little again. Hell, Mama wasn't good enough for Daddy. It struck her a second later that she was talking bad about her dead mom, and guilt flushed her cheeks. Hey, I said, none of that. One of the things I learned is that you can't canonize somebody after they die. It's not healthy, and it's not honest. Cherish the good memories, but don't forget about the warts, too. They were just as much a part of her as the good stuff. Maybe more in her case, I thought, but kept the opinion to myself. I did, however, figure she should know what Anna May had told me. You know Millie's from here, right? She turned toward me, surprised. No, she said she met Dad when she was down from Atlanta for the tournament. I relayed what Anna May had told me, but skipped the speculation about the house being a motive for murder. The last thing I wanted to do was rock her boat some more, especially since she seemed about to tip over already. It was only a ten-minute ride to her mom's place, but when she pulled up in front of the house, she stared out the windshield at her childhood home, and her eyes got glassy. She pulled in a deep breath, then blew it slowly out. Now or never, I guess, right? She said, glancing at me. Dread laced her gaze, but she squared her shoulders as she reached for the door handle. Let's do this. I gave a sharp nod. For some reason, I wasn't too anxious to go in there myself, but if she could do it, I sure could. All righty then, let's do it. The house had an abandoned feel to it, like a place does when somebody's moved out. That was in direct opposition to the way it looked, though. The tea kettle was on the stove, and a dish towel was draped over the oven handle, just slightly askew. A shiver ran through me when I realized Ida had left her house, thinking she'd be back shortly after a quick trip to the grocery store. Only, she hadn't, and she never would. Rose must have had that same thought, or one similar to it, because she sagged a little. I could tell it was taking everything she had to maintain control, and I patted her on the back. Let's get the paperwork first, I said thinking it would be much less personal than going through her mama's closet. I remembered well how agonizing that had been for me when Addie had passed. Everything in her bedroom had still smelled like her. 
Her hairbrush had been on her dresser, strands of hair clinging to it, and the towel she'd showered with that morning was slung over the shower curtain. It had been a punch in the gut, and I figured that was a chore best saved for last. So, what exactly are we looking for? I asked, as we entered a room her mom had obviously used as an office. Her will and the deed to the house, to be sure, and anything else that looks important. She didn't believe in lawyers or safe deposit boxes, so everything should be right here. I'm hoping she left an insurance policy, because if she didn't, I don't know how I'm going to afford to bury her. I know she wasn't hurting, but I don't even know how much money she really had. I'm not sure how that works. Can I just call the bank? I thought for a minute, but didn't want to give her supposition. To be honest, I'm not sure. Addie had my name added to all the accounts when Uncle Calvin died, just in case anything happened to her. Not that there was much in there when she passed, but at least I had direct access. I don't think Mama did that, because I never signed anything. But I guess we'll find out. She pulled two huge file boxes off the top shelf of the closet. Unless I miss my guess, everything will be in here somewhere. She saved the desk drawers for the day-to-day stuff like bills. I took one of the boxes and sat cross-legged on the floor, and she plopped down beside me. The top was covered with dust, and I sneezed. Rose grinned. If Mama saw that, she'd die all over again of embarrassment. She was a stickler for cleanliness, that's for sure. This place makes the farm look like an absolute pigsty. Yeah, my place too, she said, as she blew the dust off the top of hers. She was always on me about it, but the first thing I did when I moved into my own place was leave a dirty glass in the sink overnight, just because I could. She laughed and shot me a sideways look. Then I got up and had to wash it because it was haunting me, or more accurately, Mama's voice in my head was. It took me a while to get over that. I always loved coming to the farm. It was clean, but it was lived in. It was okay to sit on the furniture and pull your feet up or have clothes hanging out of the hamper a little. I snorted. You mean overflowing till Addie forced us to do laundry because we were out of underwear? Yeah, that's exactly what I mean, she said, grinning. I couldn't even imagine being that comfortable in my own house. She looked down as her fingers walked through the first few files in the box. It's a shame to think that, but it's the truth. After Daddy left, I never did feel like this was my home. It was just the place where I lived. Your place was more home to me than here. Not sure what to say to that, I just let it float there while I flipped through the files in my box. After a few minutes of comfortable silence, I found a file labeled American Life and pulled it out. I think I found something, I said, handing her the file, because I was loath to go through it myself. It felt too much like looking in her purse or somebody's medicine cabinet. Though I had been guilty of the latter on a couple occasions, I'm ashamed, sort of, to admit. She took it and flipped it open. When she did, her eyes grew round. Holy shit, Noelle! She flipped through to the end where checks were stapled. She had a life insurance policy for half a mil, with me as the beneficiary, and right here's this month's premium payment. Thinking about all the rules and riders that went hand in hand with insurance, I asked her how old it was. She flipped back to the end of the contract. She took it out almost eight years ago. Well, that was well past the time limits most riders imposed for certain causes of death. Sweetie, I said, grinning, lunch is on you. She smiled. I think I can handle that. Rose was a graphic designer who owned her own business and worked from home. She was better than good and made decent money, but not so much that half a mil wasn't big bucks to her, especially if her mortgage was as big as Bell and Corley said it was. 
She stuffed the policy back in the file, set it to the side, and kept digging. So, what's up with you lately? She asked. I never get out of the house and have zero friends that aren't just screen names. I mean, I know who they are, but I'm not close to any of them and I've never met them. She huffed out a disgusted breath and curled her lip. Kevin got all our friends in the divorce since he knew them first, and when I moved back, I'd lost track of everybody I'd been close to. I tried to put myself in her place and realized we were two sides of the same coin. I'd lost many friends because they'd moved away, and she'd been one of them. That must have sucked. Did you like them? The friends in Atlanta, I mean? She drew her brows together and thought about that for a minute. You know, now that you mention it, I didn't. They were all a bunch of shallow, entitled snobs, just like he was. I mean, we had lunch and cookouts, excuse me, dinner parties, at each other's houses, but I wasn't actual friends with the single one of them. If you told one of them something, you may as well tell them all. I had nobody to talk to during the divorce, because I didn't want my dirty laundry to be public fodder. I grinned at her as I stuffed a file back in the box. Then you didn't lose much after all, did you? And now? You're home. Smiling, she leaned over and nudged me with her shoulder. Thanks, no. I needed that. You're right. When I put it in that perspective, I didn't lose nearly as much as I thought. Happy to be of service, I said, glad we'd reconnected. She'd been fun to hang out with in school, when she was allowed, anyway, and it made me sad that she felt so isolated in her own hometown. You know, I only live like 15 minutes from you, I said. Now, mind you, we're heathens. We have cookouts where we run barefoot, drink cheap wine, and eat hot dogs that aren't all beef. We've even been known to call on the three-second rule, but you're always welcome to come slumming if you want. She grinned, her eyes sparkling. Now that's my kind of dinner party. I found a folder with an investment portfolio in it, and since neither of us could make heads or tails of it, she set it aside to take with her to her attorney. From what we could decipher, though, Ida had been wise with her money, and had a nice nest egg that, combined with the life insurance, assured that Rose would have a comfortable retirement. A few minutes later, she found the will. Since it was dated the previous spring and notarized by Peggy Sue, we figured it was the most recent one. Not surprisingly, she left almost everything to Rose, with the exception of ten grand, which she left to the library. That's weird. Rose said as she flipped through the pages, then laughed when she saw the stipulation, to be spent specifically and wholly on proper cleaning and upkeep. Not so weird, then, I said, puffing out a laugh but shaking my head. Still, the library could always find a way around such a vague rule. Upkeep could be anything from a new porch to a weekly maid, or even replenishing a section of the library with books, and they were in need. I was almost to the end of my box when I came across a file labeled simply House Stuff. The deed was there, along with annual tax receipts, so I handed it to Rose. Rather than read it page by page, she gave it a cursory glance, then stuffed all of it back in the file, put it with the other three on the floor beside her, and shut the lid on her file box. Okay, now to pick out the clothes, she said, as she stuffed the boxes back in the closet. The way she said it sounded more like, Okay, let's go rip my heart out and set my hair on fire. And my heart bled for her, because I knew how she felt. With a deep sigh, she squared her shoulders and headed for the stairs. Chapter 14 Picking an outfit didn't take as long and didn't appear to be nearly as painful for her as I was afraid it would be. On the way out, she paused and went back to the kitchen, straightening the dish towel on her way past. 
I followed her and was amazed when she opened the pantry. It had the standard supply of dry and canned goods, but bottles of wine took up half of one of the shelves. There had to be at least a dozen bottles of wine from several different makers. I looked at Rose, brows raised. Mama was a member of a monthly wine club. Every month, they'd send her like eight bottles of wine. Oh, did she just become a member? I asked, thinking she probably drank a bottle or two a month. Then it got ahead of her, and she just forgot to cancel her order for that month. Meh, she said, lifting a shoulder. Seven or eight years, probably. Suddenly, that didn't look like such a large amount of wine after all. She stepped forward and started pulling them out, and I glanced at her, head tilted in question. Putting the bottles on the kitchen table, she said, That tart my dad's married to may be moving into this house, but damned if I'm leaving it stocked with wine for her. I smiled and grabbed an empty cardboard box from the floor. It had Wembley's Wine of the Month Club scrawled in flowery script across the side, and there were dividers inside to separate the bottles. Apparently, she just got a shipment, I said, as I started putting the bottles in the box. I stuffed as many bottles as I could into it, laying two of them across the top. I noticed one of them was from the Bluegrass Winery and hoped the other brands were of higher quality. Must have, Rose agreed, picking up the last three bottles. Good. I'd hate for a shipment to come the day after that gold-digging tramp moves in. It was nice to see city life hadn't taken out that tad bit of hillbilly all of us country girls carried inside, just in case we ever needed it. So, let me ask you something, I said. There's no good way to put this, but you're going to have to answer it soon anyway. You may as well take the time to roll it around in your head a while and think it through. She blew out a breath and gave me a sorrowful look. You're going to ask if I think Daddy did it, or what's-her-face. Feeling a little guilty, but not enough to deny it, I replied, Well, yeah. She sighed as she folded the flaps of the box closed. I've asked myself the same thing. It was one of the first thoughts that flitted through my head when I heard she was poisoned. Meeting my eyes, she continued, The honest answer is that I don't think so. Do I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, he wouldn't? I'd like to be that sure, but I'm not. And especially not with the new wife. And I don't know anything at all about her, so who knows? I mean, somebody did it, right? Indeed, they did. I hoped for her sake it wasn't her dad, but the odds weren't in her favor. After we loaded everything into the car... Rose decided to go back in for the jewelry and a few things that she held close to her heart. After all, with Ida dead and her lifetime rights to the house relinquished, Rose's daddy and his new gal pal could technically move in whenever they wanted. Rose hadn't had a chance to talk much with him, so she figured she'd better get the valuables, both monetary and sentimental, while the getting was good. When she dropped me back off at the house, I was surprised to see it was almost noon. At some point, I had to pick up Justin, Bobby Sue and Earl's boy, to bring him to the farm for the night. His was another long story that I won't get into here, but suffice it to say, he'd lived with me for a bit before Bobby Sue and Earl adopted him, and we sort of shared him. Gabby was home when we got to the farm, but Shelby was gone. I invited Rose to come inside, where we spent an hour reminiscing. Gabby was another high school friend who had drifted away until a few months before, and it was nice to drift back to more carefree days. An hour later, I glanced at my phone. As bad as I hate to, I gotta scoot, I said. I want to grab something to eat while I'm here, then I have to go to Walmart. I'm out of sugar, and Ray's gonna need more pastries tomorrow. Rose went to stand, but Gabby shook her head. Oh, no you don't. You don't get to leave yet unless you have to. I'd love to catch up some more, and you're more than welcome to stay. Rose sat back down, and I was glad she had somebody to keep her occupied. I hated to think of her going through this alone. Thanks again, Noelle, she said, 
standing to give me a hug. You have no idea how much help you've been. I smiled after giving her a quick squeeze. No problem. You need anything else? Just let me know. So, can you stick around? Gabby asked. Absolutely, Rose said, her tone wry. In the state I'm in, the last thing I need is to be left alone with more than a case of wine. Gabby raised a brow and Rose gave a quick explanation. Yeah, I'm sure we can help you dispose of that safely, Gabby said, smiling. I snorted and turned to leave. Noel, uh, don't forget, Rose called after me. If I don't see you before the funeral, uh, catch up with me because I owe you a lunch. I scrunched my nose at her as I headed out the door. The blue label on the bluegrass winery bottle caught my eye as I passed her car on the way to my truck, and I shuddered. Rotgut was usually reserved for booze, but that bottle of grape grossness met all the criteria. Chapter 15 Five minutes later, I was bouncing down the driveway in my truck, the A.C. blasting cold in my face. I needed to get somebody out to fill the holes, but it was one of those things I just kept forgetting about until my teeth were rattling together over the bumps. The mail slid into the floor along with my open water bottle, and I scowled and stepped on the brakes. The last thing I needed when it was five degrees hotter than whatever melted asphalt was a wet floorboard. My truck would stink like mildew for a week. The truck lurched to a stop, and I managed to grab the water before much leaked out. What little did, though, landed on the mail. I grabbed a couple fast food napkins out of the glove box and sopped it up. When I did, a familiar letterhead caught my eye. I'd seen something like it in the pile of mail Shelby had brought up a couple weeks ago. To be honest, I'd written it off at the time as junk mail and didn't open it. Forgetting about the water... I picked up the envelope. The letter was from some company named Georgia Investment Corp. According to the return address, from my dirt poor days, I was intimately familiar with collection agencies, and that sure sounded like the name of one to me. I ripped it open to find a letter addressed to me, but it was more of a form letter with no actual signature. They were interested in buying the farm. The offer was actually generous, but the fact there was no signature didn't sit right with me. I chewed my lip and tapped on the steering wheel, naturally suspicious because the last time somebody had wanted my farm, they'd almost killed me to get it. Since I liked breathing and casting a shadow, I preferred to avoid people who wanted to prevent those things, but the offer pissed me off. First, the tone was a little insulting, even though the offer wasn't. And second, I was getting sick and tired of people trying to buy my damned farm. If I wanted to sell it, I'd list it. Rude is what it was. Scanning the letter again, I looked to see if they'd put a contact number on there. And they had. I'd be giving them a call, but I didn't want to be in a bad mood when I picked up Justin, so I tossed it back to the floor screwed the lid on my water bottle, and started moving again. When I was almost to the end of the drive, Kristen, the new boarder, pulled in. Waving at her as she passed, I was a little sorry to be leaving. I would have liked to spend some time getting to know her better. It seemed that lately I had no time to do what I wanted, though if you asked Errol, that's all I ever did. The interior of the truck cooled a little, and Sherry Lynn materialized over the course of several seconds beside me in the passenger seat, saying hello as she did. She had mastered the art of not scaring the bejesus out of me when she popped in, unlike other rude ghosts who shall remain nameless. Cough. Addie. Cough. Hey, Noelle. How you doing, sugar? She had her dark hair down and was dressed for a day at the lake, Sherry Lynn style. That meant a crop top, daisy dukes, cork sandals, and a big floppy hat. 
I'd asked her once how she changed her outfits, and she'd said she just thought about what she wanted to wear, and what she had on shifted into what she'd imagined. That would be damn handy. Hey yourself, I said, smiling. She raised her sunglasses and took a closer look at me. No offense, but you look like you've been put through the ringer. I pulled in a deep breath and let it out, yawning. I haven't been sleeping well the last couple nights. She gave me a naughty grin. Do I need to pop in and tell Hunter you need your beauty sleep? Absolutely not. I said, rolling my eyes, though I wish he was the reason I hadn't gotten any rest. A frown creased her smooth forehead. So if it's not him, I shook my head. Just weird, disjointed dreams is all. I paused. I've dreamed of my dad two nights in a row, and I never do that. Aw, oh, sweetie, I'm sorry. Compassion filled her eyes. She knew what I'd gone through, and she'd had the same thing happen to her. Her daddy had walked out when she was little, too. Shrugging it off, I said, Thanks. Nothing to be done for it, I guess. It's probably just all the junk that's been going on. You're probably right, but still, it sucks you haven't been sleeping well, she said. So, what are you doing today? I asked. We're having a beach party on the French Riviera with some of the folks Rupert met while he was on the cruise ship, she answered. But I wanted to stop in and say hi. I hadn't talked to you in a couple days. I'm glad you did, I said. Since she died, we'd become good friends, and I missed her when she didn't pop in every day. Isn't Rupert going to notice you're gone? Rupert was a nice, gentlemanly ghost she'd met when all of us girls had gone on a cruise right after Hank died. It was Anna Mae's final screw you to him because we went on his dime and had a blast. I was glad she'd found somebody post-life because she sure had been dealt one crappy hand after another while she'd been living. Oh, you know it. It's around water, and that's one of his favorite places to be. Plus, he's got friends. I told him I was going to pop back in just to check on things. Where are you going? Just down to Bobby Sue's to pick up Justin. With school about ready to start, he wants to spend a day at the farm. She smiled. He's really coming along, isn't he? He sure is, and I'm glad to see it. Not that I had any doubt, but I was worried about him because he was worried during the adoption process. Justin's mom had died of cancer, and his father had been killed in an equipment accident a little over a year ago, leaving him an orphan at the mercy of the foster care system. Unfortunately, there hadn't been any mercy involved. His was a case of all's well that ends well. I remembered what Peggy had told me about Jim Simpson at the courthouse and knew it would send Sherry Lynn over the moon because she'd been the victim of his emotional abuse and oppression for most of her adult life. By the way, I said, casting her a sideways glance, I thought you might like to know Jim Simpson's about to lose all he holds near and dear to taxes, house, businesses, the whole nine yards. Her face lit up. No shit. It's nice to see karma in action. She furrowed her brow. I wonder what'll happen to the girls at Tassels, though. Tassels was the gentleman's club she used to work at. Most of them won't have anywhere else to go. I'm sure they'll come through, I told her, hoping to take the troubled expression from her face. Things always work out the way they're supposed to. I know, she sighed but it took me dying for things to come around for me. I'd rather they get their happy endings before that happens to them. Sherry had the heart of an angel, regardless of how tough she tried to come off, and I had mixed emotions for even mentioning it. The cat was already out of the bag, and if I knew her, she'd work to make sure something good came of it, or at least warn the girls so they could start making plans. By the time I pulled into Bobby Sue's barbecue, I was starving. 
The smell of smoked meat made my stomach growl, and I could practically taste the seasoned fries from the parking lot. Justin was already there and had me a pulled pork sandwich, slaw, and fries ready. I ruffled his hair, and he ducked away from me, scrunching his nose. I make you your favorite lunch, and you mess my hair up, he said. In great. I grinned and pulled him into a side hug, then slid into the booth where my food was waiting. I swear he'd grown three inches over the summer. Bobby Sue came from the kitchen, carrying a slice of pecan pie right as I popped the first fry into my mouth. She plunked it down beside my plate, then squished Justin over so she could sit down. She dropped her chin in her hand and worry lines creased her forehead. You okay? I asked around a mouthful of sandwich. I reckon, she said, though she didn't sound like she meant it. Justin rolled his eyes. Aunt Sandra's coming for a visit, and Bobby Sue's all worried the house isn't good enough or that Sandra will be upset if she can't take off the whole time. Me and Earl have both told her she's being nuttier than squirrel poop. The words sounded harsh, but he leaned over and bumped shoulders with her, taking the sting out. Well, she said, twisting my straw paper, then rolling it into a ball. What if things ain't up to snuff? I mean, I work a lot. The house is a wreck, and I have no idea what to do to keep her entertained. Until just a few months ago, Bobby Sue hadn't even known she had a sister. When her dad died, he put them in contact with each other via his will, though it was a bit of a cluster in the beginning because of a paperwork snafu. Anyway, they were identical twins, but about as different as day and night in the way they carried themselves. Sandra seemed smooth and sophisticated, and Bobby Sue wasn't. She was a country girl. She got the work done and loved to fish and ride her quads and mess around in the dirt. In truth, I think she felt a little awkward because Sandra was so put together. The ironic part was that from what I could tell, Sandra had sort of the same insecurities in reverse. Bobby Sue lived. To her, Every day was a blessing, and whatever was going to happen tomorrow would be dealt with then. Sandra, on the other hand, was a planner. Everything had a time and place, and I think she envied Bobby's organized chaos. To be fair, Bobby Sue wasn't irresponsible. She had a retirement plan and goals, but she set it all into a loose framework. And Sandra wasn't all work and no play. She appreciated each day, but chose to live it with much more structure. It was just a matter of extremes that I had no doubt was due to the different ways they were raised. Regardless of how they got there, both of them were survivors, and I knew they'd end up with a great relationship once they were finished being awkward around each other. That would come with time. I dragged a fry through my ketchup and pointed it at her. Knock it off. I've been to your house a thousand times and have never seen it dirty. I've actually used your toaster to check to see if I had food in my teeth. I'm pretty sure your idea of a wreck is vastly different than most people's. And even if it weren't, she's coming to see you, not your house. And she knows you work. Yeah, you're probably right. She pulled in a breath and let out a huge sigh. It's just... All Earl's family lives here, so I ain't never had company like that before, and I want her to have a good time. And she will. When's she coming? This weekend, Justin said. I tried to convince her to bring one of my cousins with her, but she said next time, since school's just starting up there. Bobby looked a little less anxious. You really think the house will suit her? I scoffed. I know it will. Earl had built her a beautiful ranch-style log cabin that was every inch of 2,000 square feet, and they'd gussied it up outside, too. It was a great place, but rustic rather than fancy, which I'm sure was what was bugging her. Now quit worrying and start looking forward to spending time with your sister. After mulling it over for a minute, she grinned, and the confident, vibrant woman I knew 
was back. You're a good girl, she said, winking at me. I don't care what anybody else says about you. Thanks, I said. Back at you. We talked for a few minutes about the murder. Justin was starting to get antsy, so I stuffed that last bite of pie in my mouth and stood up. You ready to blow this popsicle stand, brat? Am I ever? Let's go ride. He was out the door and to the truck before I could even clean up my mess and get a to-go tea. As I snapped the lid onto my cup, Bobby came out carrying a pie box and bottle of Glenlivet. Here, she said, handing them to me. I know you're like me. Sometimes it's nice to eat something you didn't have to make. And Earl bet Max a bottle of scotch on chess, then went and lost. That donkey of yours has expensive taste in booze. She wasn't telling me anything I didn't already know. I'd never bought myself a bottle of liquor that expensive. But even when I was dirt poor, I'd factored it in as a household expense when I could. Fortunately, on the many, many months when there were more expenses than money, Earl would always come through for him. Yeah, I said, and it looks like somebody's already had too much pie. She grinned. I didn't see any harm in letting him have a second slice with his lunch. I just bet you didn't, I said, giving her the stink eye. Seeing as how his sugar rush is going to be my problem for the afternoon. Lifting a shoulder and pasting on an innocent expression, she said, A boy's got to eat. I snorted. You're lucky I love your pecan pie, else I'd feed him half of this one right before I brought him home. But you won't, she replied, swatting me. Get your honey on out before he explodes. Y'all have fun, and I'll see you later. As I pushed through the doors and back into the heat, I smiled. My family was a mixed-up mess, but I wouldn't trade them for the world. Chapter 16 The plan for the day, before somebody up and killed Ida, was that we were going to go for a group ride down to the cabin, then swim and picnic for lunch. That was still the plan, but I didn't know if Hunter was going to be able to make it. Justin and I made a quick stop at Walmart, then headed back to the farm. I was surprised that Rose's car was still in the yard when I got there, and I hoped Gabby had invited her to ride with us. Unlike when I'd come home alone, Max trotted over to the truck to greet Justin, his long ears bouncing, and his fuzzy lips pulled back in a donkey grin. I shook my head. For someone who claimed to dislike kids, he sure did get excited when they were around. Of course, Justin always fed him junk the entire time he was here, so that may have had something to do with it. Come on inside and meet a friend of mine, kiddo, I told Justin after he'd greeted Max. He wrinkled his nose but complied. Is it somebody cool like Matt or Hunter or just another girl? Hey, I protested grabbing the mail and the pie Bobby Sue had boxed up for me. Grab that sugar from the back. I was plenty cool when you first started hanging out with me. What's changed? Oh, I didn't mean you, he said. Or Shelby. I meant more like Camille or New Borders and stuff, where I have to be all mannerly. You should be mannerly all the time. He rolled his eyes. You know what I mean. I did, but I enjoyed giving him a hard time. It happens to be a girl I went to high school with, so she's not ancient. I ignored his eye roll, trying to keep in mind that to a 10-year-old, anybody over 20 was old as dirt. And be nice, because her mama just died. The bratty look left his face, and compassion filled his eyes. That was a feeling he knew all too well. We'll invite her to ride with us then, he said. That'll help cheer her up. He paused and glanced at me sideways as we climbed the porch steps. She does ride, right? She does, I confirmed. Or, at least, she used to. We can ask her, though. She's had a rough couple days. Max bumped Justin with his nose. 
after you're done with the requisite introductions, come back outside and we'll play a quick game of chess. I'd had a special extra-large chess set made for Max. The huge board was sprawled on the porch, and the pieces were lightweight, waist-high to me, and had large bases, so he could move them by himself by nudging them. Justin gave him his best evil grin. We're going to the lake, remember? And don't you mean I'll beat you at a game of chess? I elbowed Justin as Max glared at him from beneath his furry brows. You've only beat him once, and I'm pretty sure that was because he'd had half a bottle of scotch. If you remember, he fell off the porch right after you declared checkmate. I wouldn't go getting too big for your britches just yet. He's had centuries to master his strategy, so there's a good chance your win was a fluke. Maybe so, he said, grinning as he opened the screen door for me. But it still happened. It did, I agreed. Then figured some advice was in order. But don't go getting cocky and don't get upset if it doesn't happen again for a while. Max was one of the best chess players I'd ever gone up against. I could give him a run for his money, but I had to keep my head in the game. Uncle Calvin had been a huge fan, and he taught me how to play when I was young. By the time I was grown, I considered myself passable, and then some, at the game. Still, I only won maybe one in four games with Max. Luckily, that was enough to keep him interested in playing with me. Justin touched my arm as soon as we stepped in the foyer. I looked at him as I towed off my shoes. Does she know about magic? He asked as he took his sneakers off. I was glad he had the foresight to ask. I hadn't even been sure of the answer until that afternoon when she'd reminded me of an incident in grade school. I had turned Olivia's teeth green because she was being mean, as usual, and had called a girl a toothless hillbilly because she just lost her front tooth. She does, I said, but good job asking. I'd expected to find Gabby and Rose in the kitchen, but it was empty. I tossed the mail onto the table, slid the pie into the fridge, and poured myself a glass of tea. Voices drifted in from the back patio that overlooked the new pool. They must have taken the conversation outside. When I shoved the door open, they were sitting around the shaded table, the umbrella adjusted so the sun wasn't beating down on them. Gabby looked up at me, smiling. Welcome back. That was quick. Yeah, I barely had a chance to scarf down a sandwich, but I managed, and Walmart wasn't busy for once. I glanced at Rose, who looked much less miserable than she had earlier, almost happy, even. I introduced her to Justin, then let him go, worried the ants in his pants were going to eat him alive. We're going for a ride to the lake, if you're interested, I said. Do a little swimming and picnicking. Wow, Rose said, pulling in a breath. It's been years since I've been on a horse, and I don't have a suit either. Gabby and I had bottoms that would fit her, but we were both a bit too abundant on top to do her any good. It's like riding a bike, and we have a nice, gentle gelding that'll take good care of you, Gabby said, flapping a hand. And as far as the suit, I'm sure Shelby won't mind lending you one. Rose lifted a shoulder. Then why not? It's not like I have anything else to do. I don't have to take Mama's outfit to the funeral parlor till tomorrow, and all I was going to do tonight was binge Netflix. I called Daddy, but he's a tad too happy about the situation to suit me, and I don't feel like dealing with my new stepmommy. She huffed a disgusted breath and pinched her lips together. It's settled, then, I said. I texted Hunter, hoping he was going to be able to make it, but of course, he wasn't. Justin wasn't clear out of luck, though. Cody, Shelby's boyfriend, roared up the drive on his motorcycle. Shelby thundered down the stairs from her room, and the screen door slapped shut before Cody even had his helmet off. To be fair, his bike was loud enough that we could hear him before we could see him, so she had an extra few seconds to fluff her hair before he made it to the house. I considered that a good thing when my little sister's safety was at stake. 
Looks like the crew's all here, I said when they made it up to the porch. Y'all go help Justin saddle up, and we'll pack the drinks and food real quick, then meet you at the barn. Oh, and Rose needs a suit if you don't mind loaning her one. Sure thing, Shelby said, her ponytail bobbing as she nodded. I've got mine on already, so I'll go help the guys. Grab her one out of my drawer. Uh, Isn't a ran coming? Rose asked on the way upstairs. I shook my head. She has a date with her boyfriend tonight. I think they're going to dinner, then the movies. The three of us went upstairs to change real quick, then reconvened in the kitchen. I piled some drinks into one backpack and some chips and grocery store subs into another. Gabby already had one slung over her shoulders with extra towels in it. I turned to leave, but Rose was staring down at my mail. When did you get this? she asked. Her brow creased as she looked at the letter from the company that wanted to buy the farm. I lifted a shoulder. I don't know for sure. Sometime in the last week, we're bad about getting the mail. I think I got another one from them a couple of weeks ago, too, but I forgot about it. Why? Because Mama had four of them stuffed in a file folder, she said. Each of them went up in price, but the last one wasn't nearly as friendly as the first. A bad feeling settled in the pit of my stomach. Her property was right up the road from mine. My gut reaction had been right after all. Something was up and it may have turned deadly again. Chapter 17 Hunter was interviewing people all afternoon, Rose's daddy and new wifey included, so I decided to wait until I saw him that evening to tell him about the letter rather than doing it over the phone. It's not like it hadn't already sat in the mailbox for a week anyway at least according to the date on it. We had a blast at the lake, and it made my heart smile when Justin went out of his way to include Rose in our activities. How, after all he'd been through, he'd managed to keep that kind heart was beyond me, but I was grateful he had. It made me wish I could have met his parents because they must have been something. By the time we made it back to the farm and took care of the horses, including bringing all the others in and feeding them, we were all ready for some relaxation. Ray had shown up right before we got there and had wine and a little appetizer plate all made up. Even though we'd eaten the subs, all the swimming and fun burned it up, so I was glad she had. I thought you had a date, I said to her. We did, but Dave got called into work because one of the other doctors was rock climbing and broke his ankle, she said, then smiled. It's all good, though. It was his turn to pick the movie, and he leans toward dramas rather than action or comedies. I probably dodged a bullet. They had been together long enough that they were settled into the relationship. The shine was still there, but it was more a pleasant comfortable glow rather than the introductory explosions and starbursts. The four of us took our wine and snacks to the back patio, enjoying the view of the pool and the pasture beyond, while Justin played porch chess with Max. From the growling coming from that side of the veranda, it was going to be Kid One, Donkey, 342. It was probably good for Justin to come down a notch or two, Chess took strategy, not chest thumping. Well, at least while the game was going. Cody and Shelby were playing cornhole, and for that little sliver of time, all was well. Hunter finally made it right before dark. He kept a change of clothes, or two, at the farm, so after slipping into shorts and a t-shirt, he joined us on the porch, cold beer in hand. And boy, did he look like he needed it. Rough day? I asked. He shook his head. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Glancing at Rose, he said, No offense, but that woman your dad married is a piece of work. The first question she asked was when she could move into the house. She actually said she, not we. Rose shook her head and sighed. I'd like to say it surprises me, but it doesn't. 
I don't know Millie that well, but from what I've seen, she's a real peach. Sarcasm dripped from her words like used motor oil. Please tell me Daddy wasn't bad. Nah, Hunter replied, but then again, after her, the bar was pretty low. He answered what questions I had, and they alibied each other, said they were in Atlanta shopping with cash, then came home and watched TV at home, which means they don't have alibis at all, as far as I'm concerned. And just for the record, she put TV in air quotes. Rose shuddered. That's so gross on so many levels. I was curious then. All I knew about the woman was that she married Felix, and she was an ogre when she was a teenager. I also knew they were lying about being out of town, but that was something I didn't figure Hunter would want me to spill in front of everybody. Instead, I asked the question at the top of my nosy list. So, what does she look like? She's tacky, Rose replied. She's average looking, other than the dyed black mile high hair and three pounds of makeup she always wears, and the neon leggings. Yeah, Hunter said, grimacing. And the Walmart perfume. Oh, yeah, Rose nodded, curling her nose. That stuff's horrible. Either it has a faint smell of dirty armpit, or she uses it to cover up her own nasty self. Wow. I was almost sorry I asked, but also had some sick urge to actually see that kind of mess for myself. I shook it off and took another drink of wine, realizing my glass was almost empty, and so was the bottle. I summoned another from the kitchen with a few words because I was too relaxed to walk in and get it. Rose gave me a half smile as the bottle floated to us. No matter how many times I see you do stuff like that, I'll never get used to it. Hey, I said, kicking my feet up on the chair next to me. Did you feel like getting up? Nope, she replied, reaching for the bottle. I wasn't complaining. As a matter of fact, I'm a little jealous. Ray had been unusually quiet and looked like she had something on her mind. Given recent events, there was no surprise there, but I was worried something else had gone wrong. She'd been fine when I'd talked to her earlier. I nudged her with my toe. Did everything go okay today? I made the question general, on purpose. Rose didn't need to know what she was going through unless Ray wanted to tell her herself. She pulled her thousand-yard stare away from the pool and looked at me, blinking. Yeah, sure, she said, studying the wine in her glass. Better than okay, actually. What she said, and the way she said it, were in complete opposition. Going by her tone, she'd said something more along the lines of, My dog died, my house burned down, and I found out I have the clap, crabs, and I'm pregnant. I raised a brow at her, but figured I'd leave it alone. She'd either work it out on her own or get around to telling me in her own time. Again, mixed company. Except, she said, picking at a string on her shirt, Dave wants to take it to the next level. Dave was a doctor she'd met when Shelby had fallen off a ladder. He was a great guy, good-looking, had a decent job, and, most importantly to me, had no desire to jump out of airplanes and hadn't expressed the desire to do anything else crazy, such as kill us, like her last serious boyfriend had. Saying her luck with men was bad was like calling the Nile a creek. Gabby studied her for a minute. And that's a bad thing? I held up a hand. First, what does he mean by taking it to the next level? He wants to go exclusive and meet Mama. So, Gabby said, perplexed. It's not like you've been seeing anybody else anyway, and your mom's awesome. What's the problem? Rayanne heaved a dramatic sigh and took a swig of wine. The problem is, he thinks I'm normal. Hunter laughed. No way he thinks that, I promise you. She scowled and threw a wine cork at him. 
You know what I mean. Oh, he said, a look of dawning crossing his face. That kind of normal. Yeah, she said, a hangdog look on her face. And I like him. I don't want to curse it by pushing things. Pardon the pun. You are not exactly pushing things, I said. You've been dating him for several months. She was moving slow, and I was glad, but I could also understand why he was ready to step things up a notch. I get it about the magic, though. I'm glad it happened the way it did with Hunter, because I'm not sure how I would have told him otherwise. It was during the whole incident when Shelby fell off the ladder that Hunter had found out I was a witch. We'd barely met and were even arguing at the time. She'd sent me a telepathic 911 while I was riding in his truck, so I'd had no choice other than admit, then prove, I was a witch in order to get him to put the hammer down on the gas and get me to the farm ASAP. Rose whistled low. For the first time... I don't envy your gifts, much anyway. Speaking from experience, Hunter said, serious this time. I liked Noel and had enough of a clue that I knew something weird was going on in this town, and I'd only been here for a few months. Dave's been here for most of his life, and you don't necessarily have to tell him just yet if you don't want. I mean, it's not like he's on the verge of proposing. He's not, right? I asked cutting her a sideways glance. No, thank God, she said. I'll think about it. I don't feel right not telling him, but the thought of coming out of the broom closet scares the daylights out of me. Speaking of telling people things, Rose said, eyeballing me and looking pointedly at Hunter. We should probably tell him about the letters. What letters? He asked, pulling his gaze away from Ray. After I explained, he was quiet for a minute before he turned to Rose. How much was your mom's last one, and was there any way she told your dad about the offers? She scrunched her forehead, thinking. Good question. It was over a half mil, so it was possible, especially if Mama thought Millie was going to have a shot at living there if she died first. I'd bet my bottom dollar she'd have rather sold it now than risk that woman beating her just by outliving her. She paused, pursing her lips together. Though, on second thought, she probably wouldn't have wanted Daddy to have that kind of cash to spend on another woman either. Six of one, half a dozen of another. So, it's hard to tell. Hunter looked at her like she'd sprouted a second head. That's one of the most convoluted thought processes I've ever tried to follow. He took off his ball cap, ran his hand through his hair, then put the hat back on. One corner of Rose's mouth tipped up and she reached for a cracker. That was Mama. My guess? It all boils down to whether the letters came before or after she found out about Millie. If she knew about her, then no, she wouldn't have said anything. If she didn't know, though, it's possible. The place was getting to be a bit much for her, I think. So what you're saying, he said, running a piece of celery through the ranch dressing, is it's possible your dad and or his lovely gal pal had half a million reasons to want her dead and not a single one to want her alive. Yep, she said, nodding as she popped the cracker into her mouth. I reckon that pretty much sums it up, as bad as I hate to say it. I reached for the wine bottle, but she beat me to it. Allow me, she said, holding the bottle over my glass. My mama was just murdered, and it looks like my daddy or his lovely bride are at the top of the suspect list. I think if ever there was a time for more wine, this is it. Since, sadly, she wasn't wrong, I let her fill my glass, then toasted to a quick resolution. Chapter 18 It was my turn to feed the horses and clean the stalls the next morning, but as soon as I opened my eyes to the blinding sun shining through my window, I knew they were going to have to wait. 
My stomach turned, and I barely made it to the porcelain throne in time to worship. I hadn't felt this horrid in... ever, I didn't think. I brushed my teeth, then stumbled downstairs to the kitchen and fumbled in the cabinet for the family hangover cure. I had no idea what was in it, but whatever it was, Rayanne had fiddled with the original recipe. It had been great before, but she'd made it near perfect to cure what ailed you. I found the tin and shook it, realizing it was almost empty. Pulling off the lid with shaking fingers and squinting into it, I realized we either needed to slow down on the wine or Ray needed to make bigger batches. I made a note on a post-it and stuck it on the fridge, reminding her we needed a double batch ASAP. There was plenty for all of us to have some that morning, which was a good thing because I'm not sure if the selflessness that usually lived in my heart would have overcome the nausea and the pounding currently threatening to make my head explode. I'd only had three glasses over the whole evening because I didn't like to drink too much, especially when Justin was there. But for some reason, it felt more like three bottles. I steeped the cure, stirred in some sugar and an ice cube so it wouldn't peel the hide off my tongue, then pinched my nose and slammed it. I said it worked. I didn't say it tasted good. Gagging, I reached for the coffee I'd made while the tea was steeping and chased the taste away, shuddering. Gleeful cackling sounded behind me, nearly cleaving my pounding head in two. I turned to find Addie hovering above the table, snickering at me. Light weight, she said, just a little louder than necessary, smirking. I stabbed her with a look that might have killed her if she hadn't already been dead, then put my hand to my forehead. Why is it, lately, when I want to talk to you, I have to holler for you, but when I'm just trying to peacefully exist, not bothering anybody, you show up to torture me? You're evil. You know that, right? She crossed her arms and grinned. Of course I know that. I've enjoyed torturing you for almost 30 years. It's one of my favorite things to do, and it looks like I have an eternity to do it. Her face turned serious. But I do know I haven't been around as much. Things have been weird in this post-living community lately, and I've been doing my best to keep things on an even keel. Even through the haze, I couldn't miss the wisp of worry that flitted across her face. What's been weird? I asked, curious. She lifted a translucent shoulder. I can't really put my finger on it. Just a vague feeling, sort of the way you can feel a storm in the air. Rose shuffled bleary-eyed into the kitchen before Addie could say any more. Her nose wrinkled and her hair smashed flat to one side of her head and sticking straight up on the other. What's that horrible smell? She said, barely hiding her gag reflex as she leaned against the counter to steady herself. Thank God I took the room next to the bathroom. I was sick half the night. I'm not used to drinking like that, and I still have the spins. When she reached for a coffee cup, her hands were shaking so much, I worried she was going to drop it. She wobbled a little as she pushed the cabinet shut, and I felt a combination of bad for her and glad I wasn't the only one who felt like somebody had set a bomb off in my head. Unlike me, she'd had much more than three glasses. As she'd pointed out, having your mom killed and your dad suspected of doing it was enough to drive a saint to drink. That horrible smell is our secret family hangover cure, I said. And if you feel as rough as I think you do, you're going to be glad for it. I made you a cup. It's on the counter. But chase it with something. Trust me, if you think it smells bad, there's nothing compared to the taste. But it works. Thanks to the magical boost Rayanne gave it when she made it, I was already beginning to feel human again though it wasn't working as fast as it normally did. Still, I slipped my shoes on to go feed. I'll be back in an hour or so. It's my morning to take care of the horses. 
Shelby came clomping down the stairs, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, then sniffed the air and grimaced. Morning, ladies. She took one look at Rose, who was standing by the Keurig, waiting for her cup to brew, holding her head and squinting. Oh, sweetie, she said, grimacing. Drink the remedy. It'll taste like it's killing you, but trust me, you'll feel better. I raised a brow at her. And how exactly would you know that? She smiled and ignored the question. But I let it pass, mostly because she was almost 18 and I couldn't judge. It hadn't been that long since I'd been a teenager. I have to go help Will and Cody, she said. There's a mare having twins over at Sandpiper Farm, and she's having trouble. Go then, I said, shooing her toward the door. Twins for a horse were tough enough. If the mare was having problems, it was likely a life-or-death situation for either her or the foals, or both. I'll go with, Addie said, floating after her. Looks like nobody around here is going to be up for polite conversation any time soon, and I've dealt with twins a time or two, so uh, maybe I can help. Gabby and Hunter were both already gone, but I heard Rayanne thumping around in her room. It was her one day off, and I was willing to bet she was glad for it. I made myself another cup of coffee and headed toward the door, feeling more hospitable knowing I wasn't leaving Rose alone. Ray is on her way down, I said, then pointed toward the remedy. Seriously, drink that. No matter how bad it tastes, you won't regret it. Take it out to the back deck. It's relaxing looking out over the pasture while you wake up and recover. She gave a little nod, then winced at the pain the movement caused, and waved me toward the door. Even though it was only 7.30, it was already getting steamy. Matt came down right as I finished turning the horses out and helped me clean out the stalls, so I was done in half the time. So you and Anime went to the movies, right? How was it? I asked as we strolled toward the house. Crowded spaces were still a problem for him. He was slowly trying to overcome some of his combat-induced PTSD and was doing great, but he still had a ways to go. You know, he said, shaking his head in wonder. It wasn't bad. As a matter of fact, it was great, except for a couple of instances when I started to feel claustrophobic. When we were picking our seats, Anime suggested we sit up top where I had the wall to my back so it felt more open. It was fun. I grinned and gave him a hip bump as we stepped onto the porch. That's awesome. I knew you could do it. His face colored a little. He was more at home with high fives than he was compliments. It's a lot to do with Anna Mae, he said. She gets me. And for him, those were big words, indeed. He made himself a cup of coffee, then took it out back to where Ray and Rose were sitting having theirs. I had to pull Justin out of bed by the ankles, and you'd have thought I was wrestling a bear rather than a ten-year-old. The kid would sleep till ten if you didn't wake him up. Not that I could blame him. When I was working the dinner shift at Bobby Sue's, I didn't usually get home until midnight. Back then, sleeping until ten was average for me, too. The night before, he'd asked me to get him up when I started baking because he wanted to learn how to make apple fritters. I swear the kid was destined to be a great chef someday. If it was food-related, he was interested. Don't get me wrong, he liked dirt and four-wheelers and all the normal stuff kids his age did, but cooking was a big deal for him, too. If you want to learn how to make fritters, you better get up, I said, tugging at the covers he'd pulled over his face. After a couple more minutes of struggling, I gave up. Fine, sleep, and I'll do it myself. I went back downstairs and started pulling out the sugar, flour, and other ingredients, and smiled to myself when he came padding down the steps. Fine, he grumbled. I'm up. There better be more to this than just magicking them out of thin air. I glared at him. Yeah, because that's how it works. I just sit on my butt eating bear claws that I summon up by twitching my nose. 
Keep it up, and I'll turn you into a little girl with pigtails. Ew, he said, scrunching his face. I'd rather be a frog. Good to know. Little girl, it'll be then. Now, let's get to work before the temptation overwhelms me and I can't resist. For the next three hours, we made several different pastries, including danishes, fritters, and his favorite, cinnamon rolls. Since baking was usually a solitary activity for me, I was always a little surprised by how much fun I had teaching him. He asked good questions and was getting a decent handle on many of the processes. Ray and Rose must have felt human again because they came inside when they smelled the goodies baking and talked to us while we finished up. Now, I said, as we drizzled the icing over the last batch of cinnamon rolls, let's clean up and get these to brew. You're going to do the cleanup here, right? He asked, cringing as his gaze wandered over the flour-crusted bowls, utensils, and counter. I started to say no, just to give him a hard time, but then took pity on him. I never did clean up manually, so I wasn't going to this time either. I pointed at the dishes and motioned toward the sink, then said a few words to call out the dish rags, broom, and mop. Within just a minute, the dishes were washing, the rags were wiping, and the broom was sweeping. He grinned and reached out to fist bump me. Now that's how you clean a kitchen. Cleaning the kitchen was one of the few times I consistently used magic. Two others were dusting and washing my truck. I did the bike by hand and made myself and Shelby do laundry the hard way, too. Addie always said that just because we could use magic to do something didn't always mean we should. She made sure we were always self-sufficient and knew how to do everything by hand. Okay, brat. I told him, giving him a little shove as I popped a piece of cinnamon roll in my mouth. Go change your clothes and meet me down here in ten minutes. Ray and Rose stood from the table. I'm going to run Mom's clothes down to the funeral home, she said, giving me a brief hug. Thanks for everything. Your help, the picnic, the nice evening, even the hangover cure. I felt like hammered shit this morning, and I never have a hangover. That concoction's the bomb. Thanks, Ray said, smiling. I do try. Speaking of, I said to her, we used the last of the cure this morning. I'll do up another batch today. I'm making coffee blends anyway. They left, and I turned to Justin. Let's get a move on, big guy. He raced up the stairs, and I followed behind at a less enthusiastic pace. Fifteen minutes later, we had the last of the goodies boxed and loaded up and were pulling out of the driveway. Halfway there, my phone rang with Gabby's ringtone, and I handed it to Justin to answer. It was unusual for her to call, rather than text. He slid to answer, then put it on speaker. Don't freak out, she said when we both said hello, which of course made me freak out. I got in a fender bender on my way home from work. A guy rear-ended me. I'm okay. There's not much damage to my truck, but the guy's Mustang is another matter. J.C., one of Hunter's deputies, is on the way to do the report, so I wanted to call you before Hunter did to let you know I'm fine. My thoughts flickered automatically to axe murderers that ran women off the road to kill them because, obviously, that was the most likely scenario. Where are you? I asked, ready to point the truck in that direction. If she was somewhere rural, I was going to go wait with them. She laughed. At the intersection of Main Street and Plunkett, Mom, I'm sure it won't be long, but I didn't want you to worry. Okay, then. She was a big girl. If she said she was good, then she was. Plus, it was Main Street in broad daylight. I'll be at either brew or reimagined, so stop in and give me the story. All right, bye. She hung up, but I was pretty sure I heard a giggle before she did. Justin wrinkled his nose at the phone. She's such a weirdo. I sighed. Yeah, kiddo, she is, but we love her anyway. 
and I had to wonder just how tall, fair, and handsome the guy in the Mustang was to make her giggle, even with her precious truck dinged up. Chapter 19 Justin and I dropped the pastries off at Brew, then I took him to Bobby Sue's. She was taking the day off to go to the lake and invited me, but I had to pass because I needed to get some work done. Justin, on the other hand, was over the moon at the idea of spending two days in a row there. I grabbed a couple brisket sandwiches while I was at the restaurant and decided to take Hunter some lunch before I went to the shop. The weather was beautiful. The temperature had dropped overnight, and it was one of those perfect fall days. I just parked in my regular spot behind Reimagined and walked to the courthouse. On the way, Angus and Trouble popped in. Hey, you two, I said. As nice as it is today, I figured for sure you'd be at the lake. Trouble pulled a face. Too many tourists, she said. I can't wait for school to start up so us locals can take it back. I couldn't disagree. I loved the lake, but didn't care for it so much this time of year. Tourists kept the town afloat, but they sure did have a way of sucking the fun out of things like going out to eat and spending a day at the beach. That was another great thing about the cabin Hunter and Matt refurbished. We could go to our little slice of beach anytime we wanted without worrying about anybody being there. You know, I said, realizing I hadn't told them about it yet. Hunter and Matt remodeled the cabin on the lake side of my property. Angus nodded. The old fishing cabin. Matt told me they was going to surprise you, but I didn't know they'd done it already. Yeah, y'all are welcome to go there and hang out. It's private, and they did a great job. Even cleared a nice-sized beach area. Trouble's face lit up. Thanks, Noel. We'll do that. There's something else we wanted to talk to you about, too. About the murder, she said, then paused as if she was struggling to find the right words. Angus and I were thinking, has it occurred to you that Miriam Wallace died sort of the same way Ida did? I slowed for a minute. Who's Miriam Wallace? The name's familiar, but I can't place her. She's a lady who always did the frozen sangria stand at the fairs, Angus said, blushing a little. She used to slip an extra blurp or two of wine in mine because I helped her set up and tear down the booth. Okay, yeah, now I remember, I said. I didn't know she died. That's a shame. She was a nice woman, and her daughter is too. They used to come to the Halloween parties at the farm. Yeah, that's her. Angus said. Anyway, they say she had a stroke, but I'm wondering now if maybe she wasn't poisoned too. Wouldn't they have tested her for that? I asked as I reached the statue of Major Thaddeus Washburn, our town founder. The statue had stood in front of the courthouse for nearly 200 years, standing witness to the comings and goings of the town, good and bad alike. Probably not he said, rubbing the silvery whiskers on his jaw. She was up there in years. Not old exactly, but late 60s, early 70s. I reckon they just figured she died of natural causes. From the way she worked that garden and kept up with all the youngins at the youth center where she volunteered, you'd have never guessed it, though. Still ran her farm mostly by herself since her husband died five years ago or so, but she sold off most of the critters. Oh, what makes you think they're connected? I asked. Just strikes us as odd. Two healthy women dying unexpectedly so close together is all, Trouble said. I worried my lip, thinking about what that would mean. I'll mention it to Hunter. We'd reached the top of the courthouse steps, and I pulled one of the double doors open, my mind mulling over the implications. One murder was bad. But two? Peggy Sue was gone to lunch, so I skirted her desk and made my way down the hall to Hunter's office. He was leaned back in his chair with his feet propped up on the desk, flipping through a sheaf of papers. Hey, you, 
I said, pecking on the doorframe and holding up the bag of food I'd snagged at Bobby Sue's. What are the odds a brisket sandwich would be welcome right now? Better than the odds I'll find anything new in these, he said, pulling his feet from his desk and tossing the papers onto it. He rolled his head on his neck and stretched. I've been sitting here rehashing what I've learned for half an hour. I've called the pawn shop where Millie worked in Atlanta, and all the manager had to say was she was lazy and acted dumber than a box of rocks. Emphasis on acted, and they were glad to see her go. I plopped down in the chair on the other side of his desk. That's not surprising from what I've heard. Let's hear it, he said, taking his sandwich out of the bag and handing me mine. It's not like it can make my day any worse. Actually, it may give you a little more to go on, but we'll double the paperwork, I said. Then relayed what I'd been told as I unwrapped my lunch, explaining who Miriam was in case he hadn't heard of her death. Angus and Trouble think it's odd they died of similar symptoms so close together, and I can't say I disagree. I wonder if the women were connected in any way. He was quiet for a few minutes, chewing and thinking. He shook his head. No idea, because Miriam's death was ruled natural causes, so I didn't investigate it. I can talk to Jim, though. He's the one who covered both cases. Might not hurt. I said, because if they died from the same thing, there's a much bigger problem than somebody knocking off one crotchety old bat for her house or whatever. Great, he said, scrubbing a hand over his face as he wadded up the paper wrapper that had held his sandwich. Just what we need, a bigger problem. As much as I didn't want to think so, I had a horrible feeling in my gut we were on the right track. Chapter 20 Hunter called Jim. As luck would have it, he kept a blood sample of everybody who died. He agreed to check Miriam's sample out that evening. I'm going to do some digging and see what I can come up with, Hunter told me. Maybe they intersected somewhere, ate lunch at the same place or something. It's not like I'm making any progress here. I shrugged. Worth a shot, I guess. Then, you're one step ahead if it turns out she was poisoned. I'm going over to the shop for a while. I want to finish those lamps. Want to meet at your house tonight? We'll finish painting the kitchen. Sounds good. He stood and gave me a kiss. I'll be here tracking down any information I can on Miriam. Hunter had bought a house not long after moving to Keyhole and was in the process of remodeling it. We spent most of our time together at the farm, just because I had the horses and Shelby to look after. But I was getting more comfortable being away, now that Shell had gone from a rebelling hellion to a mostly responsible young adult, and Matt and Gabby were there to help out with the animals. The afternoon sun blasted me in my face when I stepped outside, and I pulled my shades down from the top of my head. Surprisingly, Errol was gone when I got to Reimagined, and I was glad to see it. The other ghosts had been making an effort to draw him out a little, and he was finally figuring out that heat, sunburns, and sweating, three of his main complaints about doing outdoorsy things, were no longer concerns. I finished up the lamps and plugged them in, happy with my handiwork. After shooting some pictures of them for my website, I decided to play around with some of the random odds and ends I had laying around. A while back, I'd made some clocks out of old Coke signs, mainly because I'd had an entire box of them that I'd had no idea what to do with. Much to my surprise, they'd caught on like wildfire, and I'd moved on to other small projects. My most recent kick was making candle holders and other rustic accent pieces out of old bed springs. I had a good time thinking of different pieces to make, and it was a great way to keep them out of the dump. The pieces were almost pure profit, too, seeing as how most people just threw old mattresses and box springs away, or worse yet, heaved them over a hill or into a lake. Yes, that's a thing. Ignorant as it may seem, though it's slowed down quite a bit over the last couple of decades. 
Right as I was closing up, Anna Mae stopped in. I just put the finishing touches on one of my bed spring projects, a kitchen utensil holder. I'd soldered the spring to a metal base, opened it up so it was bigger at the top than the bottom, and spray-painted it red. That's adorable, she exclaimed. Thanks, I said, puckering my lips and pushing them to the side as I examined it from all sides. I'm wondering if I should close up the bottom half with a Coke can or something so the handles don't slip through. I need to find a couple auctions, though. I'm running out of supplies. She shrugged, examining the piece as if imagining my vision. You could do that. Either way, it's cute. Speaking of auctions, I found a couple great ones for tomorrow. Want to go? Anna May's antique shop. Things Remembered carried unusual items or accent pieces, such as old washboards that were currently in fashion, yet hard for the average person to find. She had a special love for period clothing, jewelry, and utilitarian pieces. Absolutely, I said, relieved. I can't wait. With everything going on, I haven't even looked for any sales this weekend, so you're saving my bacon. I thought of Rose. Oh, wait, though. Uh, what about Ida's funeral? I don't want to make Rose go through that by herself. Anna Mae shook her head. The viewing's tomorrow night, and the funeral Sunday morning. Preacher's doing a graveside service. Okay, then. As long as we're back in time for that, I'm good to go. The thought of digging through old stuff and hearing the whispers of history in them excited me. Sometimes a piece was so full of history... I could feel the past. Other times, I'd imagine where it may have been and what it may have witnessed. Silly, I know, but it was something that drew me in. I feel bad for Rose, Anna Mae said, having to go through that all alone. I know, I replied, setting the utensil holder on a shelf, being careful not to smudge the paint. But we've tried to keep her occupied, and Coralie and Elise are doing her hair and nails tomorrow. Okay, then, she said, running her fingers across one of the lampshades. You did a fabulous job on these, by the way. I'll pick you up in the morning, but for now, want to go grab a beer at the cat? I glanced at my watch. It was almost time for Hunter to get off work, but I still had an hour or so. It'll have to be quick. I'm going out to Hunter's and helping him finish paint his kitchen. He got all the tile work done in there last week, and that's all that's left. We should do a proper girls' night tomorrow, after the viewing, though. She smiled, showing off the dimples on either side of her pearly whites. I'm in. We haven't had one of those in a long time, and I miss them. She stopped on her way past a particular set of matching coffee table and end tables that I'd had for a while. I'd found the set right here in Keyhole at a yard sale, put a frame around the tops and filled them with seashells, then poured epoxy over them. They were one of the few projects I'd had a hard time getting rid of, even though I got a ton of compliments on them. The only flaw was a place on the underneath where some kid had drawn a stick horse and a flower with a red magic marker, but since it wasn't visible, I'd left it there. I figured it was part of the history of the piece and didn't have it in my heart to sand it out. I can't believe these haven't sold, she said running her fingers over the smooth, clear top of one of the end tables. Yeah, I said, frowning. Me either. I figured for sure they'd be a hit. During the fishing tournament several weeks back, I'd had a psychic tell me they were meant for somebody else, so I guess that somebody just hadn't shown up yet. Either that, or it had been her way of saying nicely that she didn't want to buy them. They were outside of the norm from what I usually made. I tended to go for more of a country vibe, but for some reason, seashells had seemed like a good idea. Live and learn. Seashell furniture wasn't as easy to sell as I'd thought. Errol popped in before we could leave, just in time to ask me to put the TV on Lifetime because there was a movie he wanted to watch later. I tossed Norman and Sammy some crackers and made sure their food bowl and water bottles were full, then shut off the lights and locked up behind me. Chapter 21
The Cheshire Cat was a Keyhole Lake institution. It served up some of the finest craft beers the world had to offer, which was a surprisingly popular feature. We may not all know the difference between a salad fork and a dinner fork, but we do love good beer. There was also a huge brick oven that they used to make pizzas and all of their sandwich buns. The smell of baking bread and frying meat was just as welcome as the rush of cold air that hit my face as I pulled the door open, Anna Mae right on my heels. I squinted when I stepped into the darker interior, but didn't stop walking. I knew every inch of the place and made it to my favorite stool, just as my eyes adjusted. Monty, the owner and bartender, glanced at us, then at the clock. Beer or tea? Beer, please, I said, and Anna nodded and held up two fingers. We didn't have to say more than that. After owning the place for longer than I'd been alive, he pretty much knew what everybody drank. And ate, too, for that matter. At least for those of us who were consistent. He could even guess what a stranger was going to order nine times out of ten. It was a game we played when he was slow and I had nothing better to do. That was his superpower. He poured our beers while we got settled. How you girls doing? He asked as he slid them in front of us. You hungry? Nah, I'm not eating, I said, and Anna Mae shook her head too. And I've been okay, I continued. How about you? Not bad. Same old, same old. You know how it is, he said, smiling, then shook his head. I hear your sheriff's been keeping busy, though. Yeah, I said, after I took a drink of my icy cold big wave. And there's not much to go on, either. Nope, he said. I don't reckon there is. He paused. I heard Jim was taking a second look at Miriam Wallace's death, too. I don't know why I was surprised he knew that. As far as gossip went, he was almost as in the loop as Cora Lee was. The one advantage he had over Rayanne in the coffee shop, as far as information went, was that everybody chats up the bartender, and the more they drink, the more they talk. There wasn't much he didn't know about. Still, I had to ask, how do you know about that already? That just became a thing earlier today. He winked at me, his eyes sparkling. A respectable bartender never reveals his sources. I rolled my eyes. Yeah, okay. Let me guess, a little bird? Two, as a matter of fact, he replied. Angus in trouble. I should have known. As the former town drunk, Angus had a 40-year relationship with Monty. Maybe, and maybe, somebody else said they overheard Hunter ask Peggy Sue what she knew about Miriam. I happen to know that Jim keeps blood samples of everybody who dies around here, so it only makes sense that if you told Hunter what Angus told you and he was asking Peggy about Miriam, then he'd have Jim checking the samples. I narrowed my eyes at him. You duped me into confirming what you only suspected. Anna Mae laughed. To be fair, sweetie, he had all the pieces. I even heard Martha Jean Stewart telling Stephanie Phillips that at the shop this afternoon. Sighing, I marveled again at how much Keyhole had grown, but how small it still was at its core. Them two was about as different as night and day. Monty said, moving on. Miriam was plucky but kind, and Ida could scare the stink out of a skunk with just a look. She could be pleasant when she wanted, but that wasn't often. That's the truth, Anna Mae said, taking a drink of her beer. Still, I feel bad she died that way. Nobody deserves that. Monty tossed his bar towel over his shoulder. No, they don't, he said. And for the millionth time, I'm glad I'm a bartender. I wouldn't trade places with your sheriff for love nor money. I know. I took a big draw off my beer. The poor guy thought he was leaving big city crime behind, 
only to move here and find himself in one backwoods mess after another. It's a wonder he hasn't already made a mad dash back north without so much as looking back. Anna Mae scoffed. Shoot, girl, don't matter how many little old ladies or crooked sheriffs bite the bullet. Long as you're here, so is he. That should have made me feel better, but somehow it made me feel even worse for him. Poor guy. Chapter 22 We chatted with Monty about the comings and goings of Keyhole and other non-murderous subjects for the next 20 minutes, and it was nice hanging out with them. I hadn't made it to the cat in a couple weeks, so I was due. Once we finished our beers, it was time for Hunter to get off work, so Anna Mae and I left, making plans to meet up at my place the next morning. Hunter and I managed to finish painting the kitchen and had everything cleaned up way sooner than we thought, so we went into town and grabbed a red box and a pizza from Duck's. So, what do you think about Millie and Felix? I asked. I just can't seem to make any sense of that relationship. I think the more I learn about that woman, the less I understand what Felix sees in her. He seems like a nice guy other than being a bit of a doormat, and from everything I've seen, she's awful. Yeah, I said, enjoying the view of the lake as we drove alongside it. But do you think she could have killed Ida? He was quiet for a minute, focusing on driving. I don't know. I mean, if I've learned one thing since I've moved here, it's that I can't overlook anybody. He was right. We had several folks who were just as likely to have done it as the others, and nobody was standing out. Sighing, he turned to me. I haven't wanted to mention this, but you do realize Rose just came into half a million big ones and then some, right? Yeah, so? I asked, then realized what he was implying. I shook my head. Nope, no way. She wouldn't have done it. Cross her off the list. He shifted his weight. You know she has no alibi, right? I don't care. She didn't do it. As far as I was concerned, that was the end of it. He let it go though he was a good enough cop that I knew he wasn't able to give her the same benefit of the doubt I was. Addie popped in right between us, pretty as you please, and I about jumped out of my skin. No matter how many times she did it, there's just no way to dampen the startle reflex. Jeez Louise, Hunter snapped. Would you please stop doing that? Doing what? she asked, all sweetness and sunshine. He scowled at her. You know what. She waved him off, her translucent hand shimmering just a little in the dark. I figured you'd want to know what I just heard. When she didn't speak for a few seconds, Hunter rolled his fingers. You almost killed me to tell me, so let's hear it. She whacked him in the back of the head, except her hand went right through his melon. Then don't sass me, she said. Belle just told me that Harriet Blount was in to get her hair done today. Again, a pause. Okay, I said, drawing in a breath and grabbing hold of my patience with both hands. She'd become a bit of a drama queen since she died. I wrote it off to her closer relationship with Belle. I'll bite. What did Harriet Blunt have to share? Scowling, she said, You'd watch your tongue too, missy, or it'll be your head next. She heaved a put-upon sigh. Harriet said I'd have been talking to Felix about getting back together. She overheard her on the phone during an auxiliary meeting a month or so ago. Wait, Hunter said, holding up his hand. Did she hear those exact words? Addie waggled her hand. She may not have overheard the whole conversation, but she heard I'd ask Felix if he wanted to move back in. I mulled it over, 
trying to make sense of it. If they were trying to work things out, then what was up with Millie? I'll ask Rose if she knows anything about it, I said, though it seemed like something she would have mentioned if she had. You do that, Hunter said, and I think it's time I had a private talk with Felix, sends his translator. Addie nodded as she faded out. You're welcome, she called, her words trailing off as if somebody was turning her volume down. If only. We talked about it for the next few minutes until we pulled into ducks, then let it go. Without more information, all we were doing was talking in circles. When we got back to his house, he popped the DVD in and we settled in with the pizza and a couple beers. It was nice spending time at his house with just the two of us. I couldn't imagine ever living anywhere but the farm, but it was a good escape and a chance for us to get some one-on-one time. Halfway through the movie, his phone dinged with an incoming text. He did his best to ignore it, but we both knew that wouldn't last more than a couple minutes. I reached toward the coffee table and scooped it up, plopping it into his hand. He sighed when he saw who it was. What? I asked, when I felt him tense. It's Jim, he said, pushing out a big breath. Miriam was poisoned. Same way? I pushed to an upright position on the couch. Yep, he said, hitting the remote to stop the movie. So now what? Now I have to solve two murders rather than one. Yeah, that goes without saying, I said, nudging him with my elbow. But what's the next step? Did you learn anything this afternoon about where they may have intersected? He shook his head. They were pretty much opposite in every way. Miriam was into her farm and loved gardening. She volunteered at the local youth center for story time and with the ladies' auxiliary. As you know, Ida did some work with the auxiliary, but they didn't work on the same projects together. Ida tended to be more on the fundraising side of things, and Miriam enjoyed doing things like planting the flowers in the town square and working on the floats. I shrugged. It's a commonality, though. A place to start. You should talk to Roberta. She knows everything that goes on with that group. Shoot, she basically runs it single-handedly. Yeah, he said, settling back into the couch and restarting the movie. But it's too late to do anything tonight. So we curled up and watched an action movie and tried to pretend there wasn't a murderer on the loose. Chapter 23 Hunter decided he wanted to go see Miriam's house the next day, so we got up early. Miriam's daughter had built a house on the back of the property so she could stay close to her mom. Since it was the weekend, Peggy Sue was off, and we had no way to get a number for her, so we just popped out there, hoping it was early enough to catch her before she left so we could see her mom's house. You know, it's been a while. She's probably already gone through the house. She may even have rented it out, I said, when we were within a mile or so of her farm. Yeah, maybe, he said, keeping an eye out for the turn. But I want to talk to her about the days leading up to her mom's death anyway. Plus, she needs to know her mom didn't die of natural causes. That made sense. Their driveway was a lot like ours, long and curving, and the house at the end was similar, too. Another big two-story Victorian with a gorgeous porch. Whereas the front yard at the farm had some dirt spots where we parked, Miriam's didn't. Her yard was pretty as a picture. Green grass, flowers overflowing the beds, and pots hanging on the porch, and a concrete pad that had a carport over it. A smaller dirt road cut off from the driveway and ran up the far side of the yard. Unless I missed my guess, that one led to her daughter's house. We'd pulled in behind a classic yellow vet in the carport, so we backed up and pulled onto the dirt road. 
Sure enough, it led to a smaller ranch-style house, a quarter mile or so from the main house. It looked fairly new, and Miriam's daughter Kenzie, a woman about Anime's age, was washing a Ford pickup in the driveway. She looked up as we approached and turned off the hose. Drying her hands on the back pockets of her jean shorts, she smiled and headed toward us. Hunter pulled the truck up behind hers, but stayed far enough back that he didn't drive into the water standing in the twin ruts of the driveway. We climbed out, and I smiled at her. Hey, Noel, she said when she recognized me. What are you doing all the way out here? Hey, Kenzie. First, I'm sorry about your mama. I didn't hear she'd passed until yesterday. Thanks, she said a shadow crossing her face. It's been rough, mostly because it was such a shock. The woman was healthy as a horse. Shoot, I think her blood pressure was better than mine. She was hardly sick a day in her life, till a few weeks before she died. I blew out a breath. That's sort of what we're here to talk to you about. I looked from her to Hunter. Kenzie, this is Hunter Woods, the new sheriff of Keyhole. Hunter, meet Kenzie Wallace, Miriam's daughter. Kenzie's eyes were a little guarded now, as if she was expecting bad news, which, to be fair, was accurate. What's wrong? Did something come up in probate? Uh, Let me guess. I owe more taxes, she said bitterly. I held my hands out and shook my head. No, no, it's nothing like that. Those days are over. Hunter runs a clean ship. She glanced back and forth between us, relaxing, at least a little. He stepped forward. It's nice to meet you, and I wish it were under better circumstances. I'm sure you've heard about Ida Crenshaw's murder. Yeah, she said, drawing the word out. What does that have to do with me? Hunter shifted his weight. There's no delicate way to put this. Turns out, your mother didn't die of natural causes. We realized the deaths were similar, and it seemed suspicious. Two healthy women dying so close together. So we had Jim take another look at your mom's blood sample, and it had traces of poison in it. She sagged against her truck, soaking the shoulder of her t-shirt. So you're saying somebody killed her? Why would they do that? Everybody loved her. Her chin quivered, and in that instant, my heart bled for the woman who had likely just began to heal from her mother's natural death. I know, I said, dropping her tailgate so she could sit down. But somebody did. That's why we're here. Is there anything you can think of that was odd about the days leading up to her death? Did she mention anything out of the ordinary? Get in an argument with anybody? Maybe? No. She shook her head, dazed and staring at the ground, though she wasn't really seeing it. Nothing. She's been complaining a little of a headache and had a couple dizzy spells where she'd get sick to her stomach. At first, we thought it was a bug because I was sick to my stomach and under the weather for a couple days too. But hers kept up and then she got worse. We took her to the doc, but he said it was probably just because she'd been in the heat too much. On the way over, I googled the symptoms of arsenic poisoning and those were three of the big ones. I said as much. When did she start having those? Hunter asked. I don't know, Kenzie said. Maybe two or three weeks before she died? That's why I didn't question it much when they said she'd had a stroke. I kicked myself after for not insisting on more testing because it just didn't set right with me. I laid my hand on her arm. More testing wouldn't have likely turned anything up unless they were specifically looking for arsenic in her blood. I didn't know if that was true or not, but I felt the need to say it just to take that burden off her shoulders. Have you done much with the house? Hunter asked. 
No, she said. As a matter of fact, aside from doing the last of the dishes and laundry and keeping up the yard, I haven't done anything to it at all. You're welcome to take a look around. Let me turn the hose off and I'll go with you. Thanks, Hunter said. She turned off the hose and climbed in the truck with us. So what happens now? Kinsey asked. I mean, we don't have to exhume her or anything, do we? No, Hunter replied as he dodged a pothole. I can't imagine that'll be necessary. Now we treat it like a murder investigation. I'll need to talk to people. Do you know what she did during the last couple days she was alive? Sure. I was with her most of the time. She was like clockwork for the most part. I'll show you her weekly calendar when we get up to the house. It only took a couple minutes, and we were standing on the front porch. She dug a fake rock out of the dirt to the right of the porch steps and twisted open the bottom to get the key, smiling a little as she did. Mama hardly ever locked her door. She said she hadn't needed to in all the years she'd been on this earth and wasn't planning to start now. She looked a little sad. Now I wish I'd have insisted a little harder. My heart went out to her. You don't know for a fact somebody got into her house. It could have been anywhere. Was there any particular place she went to eat or drink on a regular basis? Not really, she replied as she slid the key under the lock and pushed the door open. She'd go to brew for you a couple times a week, and she liked to have lunch at the diner after she went to the youth center. She and another woman, Jaina Smith, volunteered together, then went and ate. She had a group of ladies she went to dinner with once a week, but they mixed it up. She smiled. Mama said they liked to support all the local restaurants, not just one. We stepped into the house, automatically towing our shoes off when we did. The place was immaculate, but comfortable. You could have eaten off the floors, but you could have also plopped down on the couch and pulled your feet up under you to chat or watch TV. It was definitely a home and not just a house. I guess the best place to start would be the kitchen, Hunter said, since she was poisoned. I don't know much about it, Kenzie said, but since she was sick for a while, could it be that she was eating or drinking it regularly? That's a good point, I said. Yeah, Hunter replied. That seems logical. I talked to a couple of the women I'd have volunteered with at the auxiliary, and they said she'd been under the weather, too. Kinsey shuddered. Not to speak ill of the dead, but that woman was horrible. She and Mama had it out a few times over the years. Mom was a don't-start-none-won't-be-none type, but that woman was enough to drive a St. Peter to swear. I can't imagine Mama spent any time with her, so if you think they're connected, it wasn't anything they did together. Addie randomly popped in while she was speaking and waited for her to finish. Hunter glanced from her to Kinsey, who seemed not to have noticed. Don't sweat it, she said, waving her hand. I'm in invisible mode. She can't see me. I just popped over to let you know Gabby needs a ride to work. Her truck won't start and nobody's there. She's going to be late. Our post-living community was thriving, but they didn't let just anybody in on their existence. It had to be a consensus before anybody living was clued in about the entire group. As a single person, you could show yourself to your loved ones, but you couldn't out anybody else. There were two primary reasons for that. First, nobody wanted a bunch of reality TV ghost hunters showing up and taking over the town. Second, the same general rules of courtesy applied when you were dead as when you were living. Your business was your business. I have to say, the dead were better at following that rule, at least when it came to that, than the living were. A uh, Kenzie... I said, holding up a finger. If you'll excuse me, I left my phone in the truck, and I'm expecting an important call. Okay, sure, she said with a hint of a smile. Do what you gotta do. 
I went out and acted like I was digging in the truck, hoping she hadn't noticed my phone was in my back pocket. Addie floated through the door of the truck. How did you know where I was at? I asked as I reached for my purse so it looked like I was doing something. She lifted a shoulder. I don't know. I just always do. Always? That weirded me out a little when I thought of some of the places Hunter and I had been. She rolled her eyes. Oh, come on. What do I care what you two were doing at the lake at midnight? You're a grown woman. Now forget about that. What about Gabby? I thought for a minute. I'm going with anime to some auctions this morning. I was going to drive, but if you would, pop over and ask her to bring her truck instead of her car. Then just tell Gabby to take my truck to work. She gave a brisk nod. Will do. I was hoping it would end up working out that way. You know how that old bat she works for is when she's even a second late. Bye. With that, she popped out before I could say bye back, and my ears popped right along with her. I shook my head. It was odd having a communication system like ours, though I had to admit, it sure did come in handy sometimes. Sometimes more handy than others. Because when I walked back inside, my eyes caught something I'd missed the first time I walked in. The probable murder weapon. Chapter 24 Angus's words drifted back to me. Miriam had run the frozen sangria booth at the fair. There were probably eight or ten bottles of wine hanging in a wine rack in a dark cubby. Kenzie, your mom ran the sangria slushy cart, right? I asked. She lifted one corner of her mouth up in a small, sad smile. She did. She loved wine and started it because everybody loved her sangria slushies when she'd make them here for garden parties. We were low on cash one summer for school clothes, so she came up with the idea for the cart. Dad built it out of materials we had around here, so it didn't cost hardly anything. She bought a few gallons of cheap Cabernet and the fixins, then went to town for the fair. Back then, they didn't care much about liquor licenses or anything like that. Anyway, she sold out halfway through the first day. Daddy bought her more supplies, and she made enough to buy our school clothes and make a car payment. Her eyes shone as she looked into the past at a vision nobody but she could see. Mama was so proud when she marched me into the shoe store and bought me the sneaker she knew I'd been pining for instead of the cheap ones I was ready to settle for. Then she bought me a nice pair of sandals, too. She pulled her attention back to us. But what does that have to do with anything? I pointed to the Wembley's Wine of the Month Club box. Did your mama make a habit of having a glass of wine or two a day? Well, she wasn't a drunk or anything, but sure, she enjoyed a glass or two of wine in the evenings once she was home and relaxing. Oftentimes, I'd come up and have one with her, and we'd share our days. Let me guess, you didn't have time to do that much in the week or so before she died, I said remembering that she'd said she'd been sick for a few days, too. She furrowed her brow. No, actually, I still came up and sat with her, but I ran a nail through my foot, and the doc had me on antibiotics, so I couldn't drink. But that was after you were feeling sick, right? Hunter asked, catching on. Yeah, it was, but... A look of dawning crossed her features. Are you saying I didn't have the flu, but rather was being poisoned, too? I pulled in a deep breath and leaned against the kitchen counter. That's exactly what I'm saying. That nail probably saved your life. Several emotions crossed her face. Confusion, devastation, anger, then sheer, all-out, baby bear rage. Her eyes glittered. You think that wine she got from that wine club was tainted? It wasn't a question, but I treated it as one. 
I think it's possible. It's the only thing so far that she and Ida had in common. They were both members. I'm going to have to take those bottles of wine if you don't mind. The revulsion on her face made it clear she didn't mind one bit. As a matter of fact, I don't know if I'll ever drink wine again. I patted her on the back as she grabbed the box and started putting the wines in it. Now don't go getting carried away. That reminded me of our most recent drinking adventure and how horrible I'd felt after just two glasses. My blood ran cold when I remembered part of it was the wine that we brought from Ida's. Hunter, I said, feeling a little sick just thinking about it. We need to stop and get the wine from the farm, too. Why? he asked, confused. You don't have a wine membership. No, I don't. But that wine we drank the other night that gave us all such horrible hangovers? What about it? Part of that was wine we brought from Ida's house. His face paled as realization set in. Did you already pitch those bottles, and did you drink it all? I thought for a minute. Trash runs today, any time between now and eleven or so. The bottles are in there, and I'm sure we didn't drink all of them. There were like a dozen bottles. What's going on? Kenzie asked. We drank some of the wine Rose brought from Ida's, and we were wicked sick the next morning. I only had three glasses and felt like I'd had two bottles. Hunter grabbed the box of wine from the counter. Kenzie, I'm sorry, but we've got to go. I've got to get those bottles before the trash man comes. Okay, she said, shooing us toward the door. Go, I can walk back to the house. We'll keep you posted, Hunter called over his shoulder. He was already halfway back to the door, and I hustled to keep up. He had the truck running before I even pulled the door shut. Chapter 25 The recycled trash truck was just pulling up when we got there, and Hunter laid on the horn as he locked up the brakes. He almost put the truck in the ditch in his haste. Arnie, the poor trash guy, held his hands up when he recognized him. I swear, man, uh, it's medicinal. I rolled my eyes. For God's sake, Arnie, put your hands down. We just need to go through the trash before you take it. Okay, man, he said, his eyes red and glazed. Now that we had the trash safe and sound, Hunter examined him a little closer and narrowed his eyes. Are you driving county property? Stoned? Larry Stackpole got out of the truck. No, he ain't had a license in five years because he kept running his truck into his wife's flower bed. He snickered and gave Arnie a shove on the shoulder. She took it from him and won't let him have it back. Says he ain't got no business being on the road till he can learn to function without waking and baking. Hunter turned to me. Please tell me they don't have kids. Hey, Arnie said, drawing his brows down. What'd be wrong with me having kids? I'll make a damn good daddy someday. His wife won't let him have none of them either, Larry guffawed. Says uh, he's all the kids she can keep up with. Arnie watched as we went through the recycling can. What you need the trash for, Sheriff? Your little woman go and throw away your good whiskey or your bathroom literature? What? No, Hunter said, blushing when he realized what Larry was referring to. I didn't know whether to laugh or sock Larry in the nose for calling me the little woman. I settled on a glower. I could laugh at Hunter later, and I figured if I went and punched somebody right in front of him, he'd have no choice but to arrest me, especially after Larry had just implied I had his manly bits wrapped up tightly in my pocketbook. Just go, Hunter said, pinching the bridge of his nose after we had the can with the bottles in them. He shook his head and jabbed a finger at Arnie. 
and quit smoking weed on the county's dime. After giving him the two-fingered I'm-watching-you sign, he grabbed the trash can and tossed it in the back of his truck, then climbed in and slammed the door behind him. I'd already beat him inside because I didn't trust myself not to poke Larry a good one in the eye anyway. Once he pulled the truck in park, Hunter sighed. Yet another phrase I didn't think I'd ever utter. Just when I think I'm getting used to this place, something like that happens. I smiled and patted him on the leg. Look at it this way, honey. You're never going to get bored. Cutting a sideways glance at me, he said, You say that like it's a good thing. We have stoner garbage men, bossy ghosts, a gossip circle that knows things before I do. He stopped dead and motioned to my purse. Pull up Coralie's number. See if she has any more dirt on either of the two women, or knows anything else about the conversation Harriet overheard. Roberta's probably there anyway, right? I couldn't help it. I laughed. Are you serious? Hey, he said, she refers to the salon as the local information dissemination center, so let her disseminate some information in my direction for once. It's not like he was wrong. Okay, I said. It would probably be better for you to just go down there and talk to them in person. If you call them on the phone, they'll all be on speaker talking at once. They'll talk all over each other. A few expressions flitted across his face, and he settled on neutral. That's fine with me. At least I'll have you to act as a buffer. The thought of walking into that place, frankly, terrifies me. I chuckled. As well it should, big guy. It's not for the faint of heart. But I hate to tell you. I pointed toward Anime's truck as we rounded the bend in the driveway. My auction chariot awaits, so you're on your own. Thankfully, he didn't whine, but I could tell he kind of wanted to. And I couldn't blame him. I could laugh at him, though. Anna Mae was sitting on the porch with Matt when we pulled up. The sight of the two of them together still made me smile, even though they'd been together for a few months now. They both deserved happiness, and I was glad they'd found it in each other. Hunter pulled the trash can out of the back of the truck, and I grabbed an empty can we kept on the porch. Anna Mae and Matt looked at us like we lost our minds when we started pulling empty pizza boxes, milk jugs, and cereal boxes out of one and putting them in the other. We explained what we were doing as we pilfered through it all, and Matt went inside to get a clean garbage bag for the bottles. Since they were heavy, we had to dig almost to the bottom. Matt held the bag open while we put all eight bottles in there. Don't get all judgy. It was a week's worth, and when you have three or four people drinking a glass or two a day, it adds up quick. Not all of those bottles came from Ida's, I said. I pointed out the ones that had, and Hunter paused, then waved toward the bag. Put them all in there anyway. We'll sort them out later. There may be drips on the outside of one that came from another or something. After putting the bottles in the floorboard of his truck, he turned to Matt. I have to go down to the clip and curl and talk to Coralie and Roberta. Do you want to go? Matt drew his brows together and looked at him like he'd lost his mind. N not just no, but hell no. I'm your bro, but I'm not stepping foot into a beauty parlor, especially that one. Hunter snorted. Some bro you are, then. Leave a man to fend for himself in such heinous circumstances. Hey, he said, holding up a hand and backing away. If you're going somewhere and somebody's going to be shooting at you, I've got your six. Those women are way more dangerous than any 50 cal I've ever seen, and I'm not doing it. Good luck. I'll have a cold beer waiting for you when you get back. I gave Hunter a quick kiss before he thought to wrangle me into the truck and kidnap me, then hustled to Anna May's truck. We had some picking to do. 
Chapter 26 Anna Mae had really done her homework on the sales. We both picked up some great pieces for practically nothing at the first two, which were estate sales. The third was a little pricier but had nicer stuff. Since Things Remembered had a certain clientele that collected antique jewelry and furniture, almost as is, Anna could spend a little more than I could, since she didn't have to invest much into them before she sold them. She found several nice rings, a necklace, and a set of Amish end tables. One of the last items we looked at before the auction started was a jewelry box, and for some reason, it called to me. I first noticed it when we walked past the jewelry case, then again when the auctioneer's assistant set it down right in front of me when we were looking through a box of old clothes that were near his table. Since it had a tag with a three on it, I assumed it was going to be one of the first ones to go. He was organizing the items to get ready to start. The light glinted off it, and I couldn't help but think of Ray. It had a unicorn made of some type of deep pink crystal shot through with black standing on the lid, and it was obviously a quality piece. It didn't look tacky, just the opposite. The unicorn had such detailed features that you could almost feel the animal's innate pride in the curve of his neck, the swish of his tail, which the artist had detailed perfectly, and the glitter of his onyx eyes. I reached over and opened the lid. The black velvet inside was in perfect condition, and there were a couple rows of rolled padding in the corner to hold rings. Ray's birthday was coming up, and for once, I was sure I'd managed to find the perfect gift. Unfortunately, I wasn't the only one who fell in love with it. As I set the lid carefully back in place, a chubby, whiny girl of about ten nudged the well-dressed woman she was with. I want that, she demanded, jabbing a finger toward the box. I sighed. I could tell from the Prada handbag and the Louis Vuitton shoes that there was no way I was going to be able to outbid that woman. So I did the one thing I could think of and nudged her. That's a gorgeous piece, except the stones are all fake. What? she said, turning to take a closer look at the box. Are you sure? I nodded like a bobblehead doll. Positive. My father's a jeweler. They were probably real once upon a time, but at some point, somebody had them replaced with paste. Hey, at an auction? It's every woman for herself, and I wanted that piece for Ray. From the looks of her, the kid would probably forget about it the minute she was home anyway, or break it before they got there. The woman's nose curled a little at the thought of buying anything fake, and she turned away. Still, if the kid was as spoiled as I thought she was, she'd probably end up with it anyway. If so, I'd tried. The auction started, and sure enough, once the box came up for bid, the woman started flinging her paddle in the air. Once she realized I was serious, she threw out a bid that was a couple hundred higher than I'd bid, and I just couldn't justify it, no matter how much I loved Ray. I glowered at her, dying to give her an enema with that paddle, as she fanned herself and gloated. Don't worry, sugar. Anime said, patting my hand. It just wasn't meant to be. You'll find something that's exactly perfect. Poo on her. The auction continued, and we won most of the other items we were interested in, and for reasonable prices as well. We were standing in line waiting to pay at the end of the auction when I heard the nasally whine of the kid who stole my jewelry box. They were standing right in front of us, and I resisted the juvenile urge to put my gum in her hair. Barely. She went on and on, non-stop for the next ten minutes, and that demanding, high-pitched voice was like fingernails on a chalkboard. I know I shouldn't have, but I uttered a few words under my breath and took the kid's voice. It would wear off in the next twenty minutes or so, but until then... 
anything above a whisper would elude her. Oh, thank the stars, Anime said with relief. If you admit to doing that, I'll buy dinner. It's cheaper than my bail would have been because I was about to choke her. I gave her a wink and a cluck. The woman didn't seem to notice that the kid was tugging on her sleeve and holding her throat. She did hear the whisper, though, and said without taking her gaze off the head of the guy in front of her, Good job using your inside voice, Charisse. Good lord. No wonder the kid was a mess. That wasn't an excuse, but it was a reason. Kids needed raisin. Finally, the woman stepped up to the window and gave the man her number, sighing and shifting her weight from one $300 shoe to the other while he flipped through the sheets to find all the items with her number beside them. Don't you just have everything on a computer? She snapped, drumming her fingers on the counter. My husband owns the biggest antique store in the state. Surely you have a list for people like us. He looked up at her from under his dealer's hat and made a point of licking his finger and flipping through more pages, then rattled the pages at her. Yeah, lady, I have all you special people in this computer right here, along with everybody else. Then I'm going to use that computer, he pointed toward the adding machine to his right, to figure out how much you owe me. Oh, and see that sign? He tapped his finger on a piece of paper that read, A 10% surcharge will be added if you're cranky, miserable, or downright mean, taped on the glass between them. That ain't no joke, and it looks like that'd be a hefty amount based on what you bought. While he tallied, she stood there tapping her toe, but didn't say another word. The kid, on the other hand, had given up on trying to get her attention and fallen silent. I felt kind of bad, but not bad enough to undo the curse. That'll be 11403 Will that be cash or credit card? Credit card, she said, unzipping her purse and digging for her wallet, because, you know, she'd only had 15 minutes to get her card out while he was counting. She dug through her purse, then opened it wider and went through it again. Her face flushed with embarrassment. I seem to have forgotten my wallet, she said. I do have my checkbook, though. Will that do? He pointed to another sign that said, In God we trust. All others pay cash. We're already making an exception taking credit cards, he grunted in his gravelly voice. Now, if you don't have one of those two, please step to the side so I can help the next in line. My wife's waiting at home, and she made meatloaf, so I'd like to get out of here sometime today. The woman drew herself up to her full Louis Vuitton escalated height. Do you know who I am? He referred her to the sign again. Unless you're God Almighty himself, it don't matter who you are he said, looking around her at me. Next. I stepped around her to stand in front of the window and gave him my number. She stood there for a minute, obviously not used to being dismissed, then huffed off. The kid's face was red as a beet, and I was so glad I'd left the spell in place. As soon as they were almost to the door, I released it, and cringed when I heard her piercing squeal of protest. The door swung closed behind them, and it occurred to me that the jewelry box may still be up for grabs. Uh, excuse me, but that woman won a unicorn jewelry box. It was number three in the auction. Can you tell me, is it available for sale again? I bid on it, but she'd outbid me. She didn't pay for it. So according to the rules, it sure is. He looked it up and told me I could have it for my final bid, and I grinned. Deal, I said, and paid for it, along with the rest of my stuff. After Anna Mae paid her tab, we collected our fines and headed out the back door. The woman was sitting in the traffic waiting to exit the auction lot, and when we pulled up beside her to turn the other direction, I held up the box, grinned, and gave her a thumbs up. 
That is not the digit she gave me back, but I let it go. I'd won. Chapter 27 After we made it out of the traffic tangle in the parking lot and were back on the highway, I checked my phone. We have plenty of time to stop for something to eat real quick, I said. I'm starving. We'd had a pretzel before the auction, but that's the only thing that had looked trustworthy enough to eat. I'd drunk arsenic-laden wine a few nights before and lived through it, so I figured it was stupid to push my luck twice in the same week by eating mystery meat of questionable age and proper holding temperature. Me too, she said, then giggled. I love to see karma in action, and I just did. Uh, my God, that woman and the kid. I'm not sure which was worse. I shrugged and held up my hands in the weighing gesture. Apple? Tree. That one didn't fall far from it. I'm glad I got the box, though. Ray's gonna love it. We grabbed about a little bit of everything on the way home after running through an Arby's. Those curly fries got me every time, and this was the only one in a 20-mile radius. There was no way I was passing it up, and it still left us plenty of time to get home and get dressed for the viewing. When we pulled into my place, Hunter came to help us unload the big stuff. Then I dug through the rest of what we bought to find the jewelry box and the couple other items I'd found over the course of the day. Once we had them separated, I gave Anna Mae a quick hug and told her I'd see her in a bit. Shelby's car was there, and so was Cody's bike. I didn't imagine they were going to the funeral home, so I wasn't surprised to hear voices coming from the pool. I dropped the box inside and went out the back door. Cody, Shelby, and Emma, Camille's daughter, were in the pool. Becky, the fourth member of their core group, was out fetching the escaped beach ball. Hey, guys, I called, and they looked up. Hey, I got in return. Camille had to go out of town on an emergency, Shelby said, swimming in my direction until she reached the edge closest to me. Is it okay if Emma stays here while she's gone? She asked, shading her eyes with her hand as she squinted up at me. Of course, I said, then noticed how pink her shoulders were. You may want to put some sunscreen on. Your shoulders are already burned. She heaved a sigh and looked at her shoulder, pushing into her flesh with her finger. Sure enough, it left behind a big white dot in the middle of red skin. We're mostly Irish and Cherokee, she whined. Why couldn't we have been blessed with the nice skin that tans rather than fries? That question's above my pay grade. I told her, but I'm right there with you. I headed back inside to get dressed and was surprised to see the jewelry box sitting on the coffee table. Hunter must have taken it out to look at it. I took it up to my room and tucked it in my closet so Ray wouldn't see it before her birthday, then got ready to go. Fifteen minutes later, we were on our way. I hate viewings, Hunter muttered. They give me the creeps. Screwing up my face, I said, You were a homicide detective in Indianapolis, and as bad as I hate to say it, you've seen a few dead bodies here, too. Are you seriously telling me they give you the heebie-jeebies? No, he said, appalled. I'm fine with dead bodies. It's the living ones that creep me out. Everybody stands around with their hands in their pockets, either trying to look sad or trying not to look sad. A third of them are there for the free food. Another big percentage are there because they're wondering what they're going to get from the dead person. And then you have the perverse ones, who just like to see the drama. Oh, and the little old ladies who check all the flower cards, just so they can tut over who didn't send any or who sent the smallest or gaudiest displays. I laughed. I never put that much thought into it, but you're right. Addie popped in right then. Stop talking ill of the dead, she snapped. 
We're not talking ill of the dead, I said, scowling. We're talking ill of the living. Oh, she said. Then in that case, you're probably right. Funerals are strange. I always hated going to one. She was dressed all snappy. I assume you're attending? I asked. I am, she said. Belle's not taking this well, and I want to be there for her. She seems to have some notion that this woman could have been different or better than she was. Yeah, I replied. I talked to her a couple days ago. She was all out of sorts about it. I can understand her being sad about a life wasted, Addie mused, looking out the window. Especially since she cared about this woman when she was little. It's got to be tough seeing them turn out so bitter and miserable when you knew them to be different. That was a little different way to look at it, I supposed, but she was right. Hunter turned on his signal to turn into the funeral home side of the lot. It was full, so we had to park way down on the other end. Two brothers owned the building and had the funeral home on one end and a shop that sold monuments, headstones, and marble countertops on the other. They had it covered from all directions. Rose's car was, of course, already there. I wondered how her daddy and his wife were dealing with the situation. If he had a lick of sense, he'd left her at home so he could be there for Rose, regardless of how he felt about his ex. Now wasn't the time for drama and theatrics. Oh, who was I kidding? The only other time most people figured was better for either of those behaviors was a wedding. Chapter 28 Once inside, I was a little irritated at Hunter for voicing his observations about viewings because all I could concentrate on was putting each person in one of his categories. Danged if he wasn't right. Daddy Dearest had made yet another bad life decision and brought Millie with him. Those two were obviously in the what's-in-it-for-me category, though if the way Millie was sucking down cheese crackers and cocktail olives was any indication, she also fell into the the there-for-the-food category. Or would that technically be a subcategory. Anyway, several of the ladies from the auxiliary were doing their best to look sad, and as he predicted, a couple of the ladies were also checking out the flower cards, flicking knowing, judgmental glances at one another. Felix and Rose were the only people in the receiving line, and Felix at least had the decency to be standing with Rose sans Millie. That would have been more than awkward. It would have been downright tacky, especially considering Millie was wearing one of the most garish ensembles I'd ever seen in my life. Seriously, a blind person could have reached into a strange circus clown's closet and done better. The neon green lycra pants had yellow polka dots, and the buttercup yellow peasant shirt was just, well, I don't know what it was, but it wasn't good. We waited patiently while a couple folks Rose and I had gone to high school with expressed their condolences, then stepped forward. I gave Rose a big hug and asked how she was doing while I was close enough to her ear to whisper in it. Okay, I suppose, she whispered back, given the fact nobody here is really grieving besides me. Oh, and that my dad's bimbo is standing over there like the refreshment table is an all-you-can-eat buffet, blinding anybody who looks that direction. What on earth is she wearing? I covered a laugh with a cough as I pulled away. I have no idea, but I'm pretty sure the colorblind clowns are going to be calling, wanting their clothes back, I muttered, giving her hand a squeeze. Hunter gave her a hug. Then Rose introduced us to her father, who actually seemed like the decent guy I remembered. After meeting him again, I had no idea what he was doing with Millie, unless she was much different on the inside than she was on the outside. So far, I wasn't seeing any evidence of that. 
Finally, it was time for the most awkward part of the occasion, as far as I was concerned, viewing the body. Hunter and I went up together. Old Ms. Marple from the church auxiliary toddled up to us, her wispy hair still a little blue from her weekly rinse, and touched Ida's hand, tilting her head like a bird while gazing at the body. Doesn't she look just lovely? Coralie did such a good job with her. Hunter had his list of things that he found weird, but that was mine. No, she did not look lovely. She looked... I gasped and almost stumbled back when my ears popped and an irritated Ida popped in, right over her casket. No, I don't. I look like shit. First off, I look dead. Nobody looks good dead. Second of all, Coralie's a pain in the ass. For years, she's been trying to convince me that purple lipstick would look good on me, and I keep telling her I don't like it. She waited till I was dead and smeared it on me anyway. Makes me look washed out. Given the way Hunter sucked in a breath and stepped on my toe when she started, I assumed he'd seen her. I glanced at Ms. Marple, but she was still stroking Ida's hand. The corporeal one, that is. She had no clue Ida wasn't quite as departed as she thought. Tell her to quit doing that, Ida snapped. It's weird. I couldn't disagree. It was pretty weird, but I couldn't hardly tell the little old lady that. It wouldn't be seemly or rational. Ida was glaring at me and tapping her foot midair. Keeping my eyes on her, I said to Hunter, Why don't we go outside for a breath of fresh air, honey? What? Oh, he stuttered, struggling to take his eyes off Ida's shimmering form. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I raised my brows at Ida. She rolled her eyes. All right already. I'm dead, not dense. I'm right behind you, or above you, or whatever. Belle had gotten there before we did and was eavesdropping on what Millie was saying. Thankfully, they were gathered right next to the hall that led to the back door. I looked around, but didn't see hide nor hair of Addie. Hey, Ida exclaimed, is that Belle Dickerson? Why, she's been dead twenty years or more. And I would have swore I saw your Aunt Adelaide over in the other viewing room. I, of course, couldn't answer until we were out of earshot of others, so I just moved faster, at least as much as I could, without drawing attention to myself. Belle glanced up and saw us. Then, her translucent, semi-shimmery brows shot into her beehive. I didn't have to say a word to get her to follow. Once outside, we all turned to Ida. How long have you been back? Belle asked. I could ask you the same thing, Ida replied, looking down her nose at her. I never left, Belle said, narrowing her eyes at her. And now's not the time to get all huffy. I've known you since you were knee high to a grasshopper, so I know where you come from. Don't get high and mighty with me. Ida considered her for a few minutes then lifted a shoulder that was nearly transparent. A dead giveaway, she was a new ghost. Pardon the pun. We could barely see her in the sunlight. I don't know for sure how long I've been back, she said. Time is weird. I remember being hauled out of the Piggly Wiggly, but I think I was still alive then. You were, I confirmed. Next thing I knew, I was in the hospital above my bed, looking down at myself. Rose was there, crying. Sorrow crossed her face. We weren't speaking, you know. I died without telling her I really was a mean old bat, like she said. I was too hard on that girl. Belle humphed and crossed her arms. You sure were. You weren't raised that away, so I don't know what got into you. You were poor, and your mama was a horrible housekeeper. 
but she treated you like the sun rose and set on your backside. Ida waved her off. Hardly the point right now. I had a few times since the hospital when I can remember flashes, but they're just that. Then I was here, wide awake with old lady Marple rubbing my hand like, I don't know, but it was creepy. She scowled, and I got a bone to pick with Coralie. The back door swung open, and it looked like Ida was going to get her chance. Addie floated through it, and when Coralie poked her head out and saw us, she pushed it open and strode toward us. She didn't have magic, per se, but had always been able to see ghosts, whether they were trying to hide or not. I attributed it to the fact that there wasn't a discriminatory bone in her body. She accepted everybody. White, black, pink, purple, old, young, dead, or alive. Therefore, she was more receptive. She slammed her hands on her hips. Was that you making all that noise? While I was trying to do your makeup last night, you hateful old hag, you like to gave me a heart attack. Ida looked at her like she'd lost her mind, then glowered at her. You! Twenty years you've been telling me to wear plum lipstick. Twenty years I've been telling you I didn't like it. Then I die, and you up and slather it on me anyway. Coralie narrowed her eyes at her. Well, I surely wasn't using that god-awful orange you insisted on wearing when you were living. It made your teeth look yellow and your skin sallow. She drew herself up to her full height, not that that was saying much, and fluffed her aqua-netted helmet of hair. My reputation was at stake, and damned if I wasn't doing my best to make you look your best, and I don't care how little fashion sense you had when you were still kicking. Ladies, Hunter said, I think we're all missing the point here. The point is that Ida's back, and maybe she can help us solve her murder. Murder? Ida barked. What the hell do you mean, murder? Her form became more visible, and sparks flickered behind her eyes. The wind picked up, and her form started to flicker and pixelate like it was going to fly apart. Oh, boy. A poltergeist was the last thing we needed, especially given Ida's natural personality. As my hair whipped around my head, I closed my eyes and hoped with all my heart this wasn't going to be one of those evenings. Chapter 29 Belle and Addie swooped over to Ida and tried to bring her back to her senses. It was touch and go for several long moments, but finally, the wind died back down and her form stabilized. It was the mention of Rose that did it. They said she had a chance to make things right, but, not wanting to add fuel to the fire, we decided it was best we leave before she realized who the bimbo and the polka dots was. I ran back inside to tell Rose goodbye and to ask her to come by the farm as soon as they wrapped things up. Did you see something odd over near Mama a little bit ago? She asked. Odd? What do you mean, odd? I was so not going into that right now. Nothing, she said, but she looked troubled. I wanted to tell her right then, but her father was right beside her and she had to stay there for another hour to keep up appearances. No way was I going to be the one to up-dump her apple cart when she was already pushing a full load. I was a little surprised Rose hadn't seen her. She hadn't had any trouble seeing Addie or the other ghosts, but her mind was preoccupied, and Ida was still new. Those two elements must have been enough for them to miss each other. Plus, the non-magical human brain tends to process only what it wants to. Maybe, since she'd already accepted that her mom was gone, that had been a factor, too. At any rate, I said my goodbyes after Rose promised to meet me at the farm, then went back out to meet the crew. 
Coralie and the three ghosts had left, but Hunter was still there. It was probably a good thing Sherry Lynn was off globe-trotting with Rupert, because Ida was the type of judgmental person who would have been mean to her, and then I would have been mean back. Poltergeist be damned. I asked them to ride with us so I could ask some questions on the way, Hunter said. We climbed in the truck and fastened our seatbelts before Hunter fired it up and pulled out of the lot. I rolled the window down a little to make it feel less claustrophobic. You'd be surprised how cramped a full-sized dual-cab vehicle could feel when you had two solid bodies and three incorporeal but significant figures stuffed in it. Having an elbow accidentally go through your throat is not a pleasant sensation. So, Ida, Hunter began, do you... I cleared my throat. I didn't think asking questions about her murder right then was such a hot idea. He glared at me and continued, do you have any idea why you stayed behind? I've always been curious about that. Why do some people stay and... Some don't. I've never really asked. Well, didn't I feel silly? She appeared thoughtful. I don't know. I don't remember seeing any light or anything. I just woke up dead. She turned to Addie and Belle. Was it that way for you two? Addie shook her head. I was given a choice. It was just a feeling. I saw a light and knew I had the choice to stay or go. It was just something I knew, if that makes any sense. Truth be told, at first I thought I was choosing between living and dying, but I knew somehow that wasn't right. She smiled toward me. I chose to stay because the girls needed me. So you're stuck here forever? Addie shook her head. It doesn't feel that way. It feels like uh, whenever I change my mind, the option's still there. Ida turned to Belle. And you? My situation was different. It was like yours. I just woke up dead in the back room at the salon, looking down at... Irma Thay Peterson slapping me in the face. I'd fell over dead from a heart attack. I think I stayed because I didn't want to leave the salon, she said. I'd willed it to Cora Lee, but I wasn't quite ready to give it up yet. Addie huffed. Still ain't. Belle elbowed her, which was an odd thing to watch. I am, too. I was given the same option you were. It just took a few years. Now I stay because I want to, not because I'm stuck. Don't ever tell her I said so, but Coralie's good at what she does. My salon's in good hands. Hmm. <laughs> Ida snorted through her nose. If she were any good at what she does, I wouldn't be wearing this horrid lipstick. Belle raised a brow at her. The fact you're wearing it, even though you had to die for her to get the right color on you, is testament to the fact she's good at what she does. The ghosts faded out before we made it to the farm, promising they'd be back in a couple hours. That would be right about the time Rose would be getting there. Shelby was there when I got home, and Cody and Emma had just finished helping her bring the horses in and feed them. She was sitting in the porch swing looking whipped, and I could hear the other two in the house. How's it going with the mare and twins? I asked. They'd managed to get both foals on the ground alive, and both were suckling, but that didn't mean they were out of the woods. She'd gone back out with Will and Cody that morning for a follow-up. She gave an exhausted smile. Better than we expected. They're both still nursing, and the smaller one seems to be doing fine. I think they'll make it. That's awesome, I said, happy for some good news. On the flip side, I said, guess who showed up at Ida's funeral? Shelby had had a couple run-ins with Ida at Bobby Sue's, where she waitressed part-time. 
to say she wasn't a fan was an understatement. Don't tell me, she said, leaning forward and resting her elbows on her knees. The floozy wife. Well, yeah, I replied, but aside from the numerous felonies against fashion and etiquette she committed, she didn't cause a fuss, at least before we left. Then who? she asked, rolling her finger to get me to hurry up. Ida showed up. She sighed. Of course she did, because evil doesn't die. Chapter 30 Cody and Emma pushed through the door, carrying glasses of tea for all of us. Hey, Cody said, handing Hunter a glass. We saw you guys pull up. Emma handed me mine. How was the viewing? That's another strange question people ask, Hunter said to me, and I explained the list we'd made earlier to everybody. Shelby laughed. Asking how one went isn't weird, though. Around here, awake or viewing can get ugly, or at least exciting, especially if you've got no dog in the fight. It's a valid question. Yeah, Emma added. Remember back when Mr. Zelensky's mama died and both her ex-husbands showed up wanting her to be buried with their pictures? They got in a wrestling match over whose was going to go in her hand into the hereafter and knocked the casket over. That didn't really happen, Hunter said in disbelief. Oh, it happened, I said, and the funeral home went out of business shortly after. Not only did she roll out, but the mortician's assistant had apparently had a date the night before. Rather than be late, she skipped dressing Mrs. Zelensky from the waist down, figuring she was going to be covered up anyway. Nuh-uh. Cody said. So you're saying the dead lady rolled out of the casket and mooned everybody there? Shelby nodded. Yep, it was ugly. And she had a Tasmanian devil tattoo on her right butt cheek. Poor Mr. Z still can't talk about it. Can't talk about it? Hunter said, his voice a couple octaves higher than normal. The poor man's probably going to need therapy for the rest of his life and forget watching cartoons. Addie chose that moment to pop in and waved him off. Therapy? Schmerapy. It could have been worse. And how exactly do you figure that? Hunter asked. Addie shrugged. It could have said this side up. Hunter choked on his tea. I did, too, but only because of his reaction. The Mrs. Z story had so many running jokes I'd lost track. Since Mr. Z was such a good guy, though, everybody made it a point to look around to make sure he wasn't in hearing distance before they told one. As a matter of fact, everybody just avoided mentioning the entire incident around him. So, did you pop in just to throw that zinger, or did you have a particular reason? I asked. She crossed her arms. I feel so loved. I smiled. You know what I meant. Last time we saw you, you were escorting Ms. Personality somewhere. Did you learn anything relevant? I did, actually, she said. The next wine of the month delivery is due tomorrow. That's weird, I said. Rose seemed to think she'd just gotten one. I don't know anything about that, Addie said, but I can tell you she said it was due tomorrow. So what can we do with that information? I asked, scooching Shelby over and sitting down beside her in the swing. I assume it's FedEx right to her door, right? You'd think so, but no, Addie said, shaking her head. It's shipped U.S.P.S. Hunter furrowed his brow and thought. So, you think it was poisoned along the route here somewhere, rather than from the company? I tossed it around in my gourd for a moment. 
I think that makes more sense than somebody randomly poisoning it before it was shipped. Besides, if that were the case, don't you think we would have heard about that on the news by now? There are probably thousands of members. Surely, somebody would have made the connection by now. Well, Addie declared, I'm gonna ride along with him tomorrow from the post office to the final delivery. I'll have Belle go with me. Do you really think it could be Knuckles, though? I asked. Knuckles Elmore, so named because he'd broken his fingers in a ringer washer when he was a kid, was a good old country boy who'd lived in Keyhole all his life. He'd actually taken to putting my mail in a big baggie right after Addie died because my mailbox had leaked and I couldn't afford a new one. Heaven forbid if a letter from one of the collection agencies got wet. He shrugged. You never know. I've seen stranger things. Maybe Ida was a jerk to him once too often, and he got her shipment mixed up with Miriam's once. They do live close to each other. Addie rubbed her chin, thinking, You know, Knuckles had it bad for both those girls in high school. Ida shot him down right in the middle of the cafeteria when he asked her to prom, then was so mean to him over the years, complaining about her mail all the time, that I'm sure he gave up on her. She got him in trouble more than once for no good reason. Miriam, on the other hand, went out with him a couple times after her husband died, but she only meant to be friends. He wanted more. That's even better motive than what I just said, Hunter replied, pulling up a rocking chair. Yeah, I said doubtfully, but is that really a reason to kill somebody? And why now? She lifted a shoulder. Hell if I know. Why does anybody kill anyone? They're obviously off in the head, so it ain't like you can slip them into a neat little box. My tea glass was empty, so I went back inside to refill it and stopped dead in my tracks when the jewelry box glinted at me from the table. I stopped and stared at it, then called for Shelby to come inside. She shuffled in, kicking off her boots, with everybody else trailing along behind her. What? I pointed toward the box. Did you get that out of my closet? No, she said, looking at me like I was a nutcase. First, I wouldn't invade your privacy that way. I looked pointedly at my t-shirt she was wearing, and she rolled her eyes. You know what I mean, I wouldn't mess with personal stuff like that. Stealing clothes is different, she said, motioning to my, er, her jeans I was wearing. Point taken. I took a deep breath and studied the box, trying to figure out what was going on. It's gorgeous, though, she said, picking it up and looking at it. Whoever made it knew what they were doing. Emma ran her finger over the arch and the horse's neck. I've been studying crystals and stones, she said, absently, examining the box closer. But I've never seen that particular one. The pink and black, I mean. I do know onyx has something to do with absorbing negative energy, uh, but that's all I can remember off the top of my head. I'd love to take it to my mentor at the council and find out what it is. Why? I asked. Do you feel anything from it? She shook her head. Nope, just curious. She wrapped her hands around the box and closed her eyes, opening them after a few seconds. Still nothing. I don't feel anything either, Shelby added. Well, that's good anyway, I said, taking the box from her. The last thing we need is some sort of demon box floating around. Still, I had no idea how it kept ending up in different places. I put a couple wards on it, just in case, and put it in my closet again until I could have Camille take a look at it. With all the problems Ray was already having, it would suck if I cursed her with her birthday present. I don't know if it's good or not, 
Emma said, crinkling her forehead as they trailed behind me. Most stones hold at least some energy, so there should be a low-level hum at the very least. The fact that we feel nothing at all is odd. Ray's ringtone sounded from my phone, and I scooped it up as the girls continued to check out the box. Hey, she said when I answered. Are we still doing girls' night tonight? That's sort of up in the air right now, I said, then explained the situation to her. I need to be here when Ida reveals herself. Wow, she said. Even for us, this has been a weird week. It sure has, I said. As you probably know by now, that was saying something. Chapter 31 So, Emma said an hour later over pizza Ray had brought with her, we need to put ourselves outside the box. She waved her slice in the air. That's what Mom always says. The worst rut we can get stuck in is looking at the picture from inside it. If the reason isn't obvious, we need to figure out who would want to kill these women without thinking of them as individuals. Think of them as assets or as liabilities. Emma wanted to follow in her mother's footsteps and work for the council, and it sounded like she was off to a great start. She's right, Hunter said, surprising me. We've been looking at this all wrong. We have to examine the most likely reasons they were killed, then find common ground. What about Knuckles? Ray asked. You all mentioned something about him, right? I don't think it's him, I said, shaking my head. I think we should shelve him and keep looking. Besides, Ida and Belle are following him tomorrow. Okay. Shelby said, pouring us all another round of tea. Let's start with the top three. Love, money, revenge. Sherry Lynn popped in, looking all tan and chic as usual. I'm almost afraid to ask why we're talking about the three main reasons for often somebody, she said, her almond-shaped eyes narrowing. Well, hello there, stranger, I said, grinning at her. Have you already seen everything out in the big wide world there is to see? She flapped a hand. I can only look at pyramids and ancient ruins for so long, and even the beach is losing its appeal. I raised my brows at her. You didn't like the pyramids and ruins? That surprised me. I'd love to see those things, and figured I could spend hours exploring them, especially the Mayan ruins, though... I admit, openly, I'm not a fan of wild monkeys. They're like drunk rednecks in a bar. They may be harmless wild animals one minute, but the wrong move could send them off the deep end. No thanks. Well, she said, a little put out, if you must know, the ghosts there are rude, and some of them are downright scary. I ran into a couple of those pharaohs who were seriously pissed because they'd been labeled unidentified when they said their names were carved right into the walls. I tried to explain how it was an easy mistake to make because it was all chicken scratchy and looked more like shapes little kids draw, but that just seemed to make them matter. She frowned and tapped the little cleft in her chin with her finger, her gaze, a thousand miles away. More, technically. Also, they got all snippy when I asked for makeup tips. Those cat eye wings they make with eyeliner are great. She shuddered. Still, I'm glad we don't have any of them over here. I got homesick, so here I am. Well, we're glad to have you back, too, I said, and meant it. Sherry Lynn added a certain flair to our group, and when she was gone, everything seemed a little flatter. So, she said, looking around the table, back to why we're talking about the three motives for murder. We took turns bringing her up to speed. She shook her head. 
I doubt it was Knuckles. He's a sweetheart, and I can't imagine him hurting a fly. That's what I said, too. I just wasn't buying it. Well, then that takes us back to square one, Hunter said. But we're still checking him out. We tossed around a couple other ideas, but none of them really flew. Just as we were finishing our pizza, Rose pulled into the driveway. As she made her way from her car to the porch, it was obvious she was drained. Her shoulders slumped, and her hair had come part of the way out of the sleek updo Coralie had given her. She pecked on the door and called Yoo-Hoo through the screen, then came on in when we answered. I tilted my chair back on two legs and pulled a beer out of the fridge for her. I would have poured you a glass of wine, I said, but given the circumstances, I'm avoiding it for the time being. Beer's fine, she said, twisting off the top and taking a healthy swig. After the day I just had, I'd drink mouthwash. Rayanne glanced at her, curious. Noelle said it went as well as could be expected. Did something happen after she left? Lordy, she said glancing at me. If you'd stayed just a few minutes longer, you'd have gotten your money's worth. She turned to Hunter. Speaking of money's worth, I'm probably going to end up owing you a hundred bucks. Me, he asked, taken aback. Why? Well, not you personally, but the county, she clarified. All the girls caught on, but Sherry Lynn was the first. Who'd you slug? The punishment for simple battery in Keyhole County was a flat $100 fine. It had been that way for as long as I could remember, except the fine had gone up incrementally over the years. It was a running joke that if you were going to hit somebody, make sure you got your money's worth. Rose's mouth tipped up in a tired smile. Nobody yet, but I can almost promise you that before it's all said and done, I'm going to lay Millie out. I was intrigued because I'd never known Rose to have a violent bone in her body. What on earth did she do? Rose sighed and took another swig from her beer, then pulled the pins from her hair. Shaking her head and rubbing her scalp to bring the circulation back, she scowled. We had about 20 minutes left of the viewing, and the place had pretty much cleared out, she said. The food table was empty, and Miss Clown Suit came over, all pouty, wanting to know when they could leave. Daddy told her it was almost time, and the crazy bitch had the nerve to ask me for the keys to Mama's house so they could start moving in. Holy cow, Sherry Lynn said, her expression awestruck. The fact you didn't knock her out then and there shows you got the patient of a saint and class in spades. I couldn't have done it. Well, Rose said, to be fair, Daddy dragged her outside right then and there, and I mean that literally. He took her by the arm and pulled her out the back door. They must have left because that's the last I saw of either of them. Daddy didn't even come back in to tell me goodbye. Her face fell, causing me to want to punch them both out. I'm sorry, Rose, Hunter said. That was really crappy of him. He was one of the few people I knew who was blessed with two good parents, who were still married, and he had a hard time understanding why all parents weren't that way. She gave a nod of thanks. Anyway, I spent a couple minutes talking to Mama, even though I know that was just an empty shell. I apologized for fighting with her, told her I loved her, and I'd miss her. She sniffed and smiled a sad smile. It's true, too. I loved the old bird. Ruffled feathers, sharp beak and all. I love you too, baby, Ida's voice filtered in before her form missed it into view, Belle and Addie on either side of her. And I'm sorry for trying to boss you and for being so hard on you all the time. Rosa's gaze shot up in the direction of the voice, and she dropped her beer. Mama? 
Ida gave Rose a tentative smile and floated toward her. It's me. I guess heaven ain't ready for me, and hell's afraid I'll take over, because I'm still here. I laughed, remembering the harsh way I'd seen her behave toward Rose and anybody else she'd deemed beneath her station on so many occasions I couldn't even count. That's as good an explanation as any. I said, and everybody at the table who knew her gave up a series of amens and hear hears. For her part, Ida just pressed her lips together and took it. That alone was an improvement, and it gave me hope. Chapter 32 as soon as we finished up the pizza, Rose and her mom took their leave to spend some time mending fences. What did you tell her to get her all marshmallowy like that? I asked Addie and Belle once they were gone. Belle picked at a piece of imaginary lint. I tried to tell her she was probably going to hell if she didn't change her ways, but Addie took a different tack, which probably worked better. I just appealed to the good mother I knew was buried deep inside her and told her maybe she deserved to be filled with regret into eternity for being such a hateful cow. But her daughter didn't. Belle nodded. It was one of her wiser moments, and as bad as I hate to admit it, that's saying something. The kids had settled in the living room to play video games after feeding the horses. Ray and I had just finished cleaning up dinner and were having a cup of coffee before getting dressed. Hunter had gone back out to mess with the bikes with Matt, and Sherry Lynn was making her rounds to see who was interested in a girl's night. I was sitting in the only chair that faced the driveway in such a way that I could see clear to the bend and was shocked when my truck came barreling around it. Gabby was driving hell-bent for leather, almost running off the road as she took the curve. We rushed outside to greet her, and when she lurched to a stop in front of the porch, she leaned her head against the steering wheel. Since it was almost dark, I could barely see her through the tent on the driver's side door, so I cupped my hands against it to peer in. Her back was heaving as she strove to suck in deep breaths, like she'd just run a marathon. When I tried to open the door, I was surprised to find it locked, so I tapped on the glass, and she about jumped out of her skin. She took one final breath and blew it out, her mouth shaped in a big O as she opened it. What's a wrong? I asked, scanning her for signs of injury. Still breathing hard, Gabby said, Somebody's just tried to run me off the road. I, I passed him at the intersection when I turned off onto 91, the road that ran in front of the farm. Then a, a minute later, I saw them plowing toward me in the rear view, doing at least 70. I'm sorry about the truck. She was talking so fast, nothing she said really made sense. Oh, what do you mean you're sorry about the truck? It was then that I glanced back and saw a huge dent in the rear quarter panel. What the hell happened? Hunter asked, going back to inspect it, then walking around to the other side and whistling. He trotted back around to the driver's side. Are you sure you're okay? She nodded, but her hands were shaking. Yeah, I just need to sit for a minute. While she did... I strode around to the other side of the truck. The entire side of it was scraped and covered in mud. Both had dents, like she'd sideswiped a mountain and slung up the sides from the wheels. She'd obviously been in a ditch somewhere. After a few moments, she calmed down enough to turn sideways in the driver's seat and give us the full story. She ran shaking hands through her hair. Like I said, I saw the truck. It was either dark blue or black. I couldn't really tell since it was getting dark, barreling toward me. They rear-ended me, then came around the side and bumped me. 
I hit the ditch, but had enough wits about me to hit the ESOF so I didn't get stuck. ESOF, or electronic shift on the fly, meant she could just turn a knob and shift into four-wheel drive. I thought it was one of the cooler features of the truck when I'd bought it, and was glad now she'd been driving my new truck, rather than old Bessie, my 1984 beater truck that had been my only means of transportation until I'd been able to upgrade when I came into some money. Thank you, Ford. Anyway, she said, running into the ditch still slowed me down. Another car was coming, so whoever it was gave up pulled around me, and hightailed it out of there. I was wrestling with the truck, so I didn't think to get their plate number. I hauled ass back here because I didn't want to wait around for seconds, so I haven't even seen how bad it is. She stepped out on wobbly legs and leaned against the side of the truck, but I was happy to see her breathing returning to normal. The poor thing walked around to the passenger side and cringed. When she glanced up at me, her eyes were filled with regret. I'm really sorry I messed your truck up. I'll see if my insurance will cover it. I waved her off. Don't even worry about that. Mine will. The important thing is that you're okay. Normally, I would have tried to magic the damage away since it was just cosmetic, but... That could present a problem. Hunter might need it as evidence at some point, which meant he'd at least need the repair's paper trail. As Gabby calmed down, I heated up. Hot rage washed through me when I realized they could have killed her. Plenty of spots through there dropped straight over the side of the hill at almost 90 degrees in some places. Hunter examined the bed of the truck and took a few strides over to his. I crinkled my forehead, wondering what he was doing when he pulled his crime scene kit from the back. Pulling out an evidence bag, he scraped some of the paint from the other vehicle off different spots of my truck into the baggie, then took pictures of the damage. Somebody had run her off the road and probably thought she'd been me. It was an understandable mistake, given it was my truck, and the windows were so tinted. My temper bubbled over, and I wanted to blast something. They better hope there wasn't a next time, because they'd tried to hurt one of mine. If I found out who they were, there wouldn't be a hole deep enough for them to hide in where I couldn't find them. I set my jaw and turned to Gabby. Don't you worry about my truck and let me worry about who did it. I promise you, I'll find them. And when I did, there was gonna be hell to pay. Chapter 33 Hunter took a couple more pictures of the damage and put the paint samples in his truck in case he needed them for comparison. I called Skeet and told him what had happened. He said he'd get my truck right in and would let Hunter know if any dark-colored trucks came in with damage. Meanwhile, Gabby decided a beer or three were in her future and that she'd rather go to girls' night than stay home and think about how close she'd come to meeting her maker, ad nauseum. When we pulled into the parking lot of Fancy's, our dive bar of choice, I was glad to see there weren't many cars. I didn't feel like fighting for pool tables or dealing with a bunch of yahoos with a buzz and loose lips or roaming hands. Actually, that was kind of the opposite of true. I did feel like fighting, so it was a good thing there wouldn't be temptation. Coralie and Sherry Lynn were already there and I was surprised to see Bobby Sue had brought her twin sister along. They were dressed similarly, in jeans and t-shirts. I tilted my head and looked at them as I approached. If she and Sandra were to dress the same and do their hair and makeup in tandem, would I be able to tell them apart? Absolutely. I'd known Bobby Sue my whole life. It didn't matter how many clones she had. I'd always be able to pick her out of any lineup, any time. 
Sandra had a softer look about her. She'd been raised in foster care, too, but had been semi-fortunate enough to be taken in by folks with money and privilege. That's not to say she'd had it easy or that they'd been the kindest people, but she'd been brought up in a different socioeconomic environment. They already had a bucket of Bud Light sitting between them, and when Mary Beth, the owner and head bartender, saw us, she sent a girl who looked like a younger version of herself over with another one. Hey, Lacey, I said to her when she set the bucket down in the middle of the table and cleared off the empties. Your mama working you hard? She smiled. Sort of. She's training me up because she's talking about expanding. Says it's never good to have all your eggs in one basket. Lacey had been a part of Fancy's since the day she'd been born. She was a couple years older than Shelby and had turned into a fine young woman. Still, I was surprised to hear Mary Beth was thinking of opening another bar. I made a mental note to ask her about it when I got a chance. So, where's everybody else? Bobby Sue asked after all the greetings were over and Lacey had left. Camille's out of town on a case, and Anna Mae is out to dinner with Matt, I said. Elise is spending time with her mama, Coralie added. Speaking of, Rayanne asked Coralie, How come her mama never joins us? I know you two play dirty bingo together. She's more than welcome. I thought about it, Coralie replied, but she's a lot to take in. I already see her a couple days a week, and though I love her to death, that's enough. And Louise, another friend of ours, is dealing with a teething baby. She took pity on her hubby and decided to stay home, Sherry Lynn finished. That's everybody accounted for. Everybody except one. I said, as Kenzie popped in the door and looked around. I waved to her, and she grinned and headed in our direction. I'd felt sorry for her, being stuck out there by herself, trying to adjust to the news that her mama had been murdered. So I'd called and asked her to come with us. That was before I knew Sherry Lynn would be back in town, and now we were going to have to do our best to include her without talking directly to her. I sighed. Sometimes having to keep secrets sucked. After I made the introductions, I motioned toward the bucket. Have one. Have two or three. The only rules are that we split the check evenly at the end of the night, and anybody who the group deems impaired has to sacrifice their keys. Sounds good to me, Kenzie said, pulling a beer out of the ice. So... I said, frowning. Gabby had some unwanted excitement in her life this evening. Do tell. Coralie leaned closer as she sniffed a good story in the making. Gabby took a swig of her beer, then went through the story. When she was finished, I mentioned the letters both Ida and I had gotten. Sherry Lynn furrowed her brow. I didn't know somebody was trying to buy you out again. I just got the letter a few days ago. Well, the second letter. I got one from him a while back, I think, but I ignored it. Some company called Georgia Investment Corps. Kenzie frowned. I saw a few letters from them in Mama's mail over the last couple months. Then one came for me after she died. We share a box, but I assumed it was junk mail. I got a ton of it right after she passed. It sounds like a company trying to get seniors to invest their money. That's what I thought, too. Or a bill collector. I chewed on that, because now Ida and Miriam had something else in common, and my name and Kenzie's were in the mix, too. Oh, Rayanne said, making the connection at the same time I did. That is so not good. I can tell you right now, Mama would have never sold. Kenzie shook her head, taking a pull off her beer, 
and hooking the heels of her boots on the rung of her stool. Not for love, nor money, in a million years. Same here, I said. But it doesn't make any sense. I can see the connection with Ida and me. We're close together and lakeside. But you're several miles from us and landlocked. She shrugged. I don't know either. Bobby Sue huffed and pulled a cocktail napkin toward her. I can tell you the connection right now. She pulled a pen out of her pocketbook and drew a big rectangle, then sectioned it off into segments. Mine and Ida's properties were lakeside, with only a single large piece of property between us. That much I already knew. What I hadn't realized was that Merriam's was on the other half and backed up to a long, narrow strip of land behind Ida's. Our properties were all situated in close proximity to each other, on one big plot of land, and I hadn't even realized it. As a matter of fact, it had probably been one farm at some point. Now that Coralie had drawn it out, it made more sense. I just hadn't caught on to the fact that Miriam was so close, because her land mirrored ours. The front of it was cleared and the rear was wooded, so the driveway was way on the other side. Considering there was almost a thousand acres involved and there was that large strip between us, it would be virtually impossible to tell whether it was in connection to me without seeing it on paper. It still seemed weird, somehow, that I hadn't ever realized it. I squinted at the paper. Are you sure that's right? I asked. I thought nothing ran behind us but a right-of-way for the power company and some old strip mines. I'm positive, she said. I helped Addie hash out the property lines when Calvin died because the coal company had left one stupid rusting backhoe on a piece of property and claimed it was still operational to avoid having to restore the land. They lease the piece of land that backs up to the farm from the folks who own that middle strip. Turns out they'd encroached by more than a hundred yards all the way down that property line onto your farm. They had to pay her rent and damages. Peeling the label off my beer, I asked, Why didn't I ever hear of that? She lifted a shoulder. I have no idea. Coralie piped up. I do. It was because you were still fairly young, and she didn't want you to know she was tight on money. It was right before you and Shelby were due to go to 4-H horse camp, and she was determined you were going to make it. That coal money is what sent you. I can remember. She was so relieved she cried because she was just about to tell you she couldn't afford for you to go. Well, that just made me love my aunt all the more. Aww, Sherry Lynn said. As gruff as she likes to play it, she's a softy. Much to everybody's surprise, Kenzie, who wasn't supposed to know Sherry Lynn was even there, looked up at her. That's how my mom was, too. I think it was a mark of their generation. I glanced back and forth between the two of them, not sure what to say. Kenzie grinned. I'm surprised your aunt didn't tell you. We aren't magic the way you all are, but we do see spirits. As a matter of fact, my mom went to your aunt when they were just kids. She was so freaked out when she saw her first ones, and she'd heard the rumors about your family. I think she just wanted to make sure she wasn't crazy. Addie must have forgotten about that, or not realized Kenzie got the gift from her mom, because she'd been in stealth mode when she came to tell me Gabby needed a ride. Whatever, though. I breathed a sigh of relief, because we could all talk directly to Sherry Lynn again. I hated leaving her hung out to dry. Sherry Lynn, meet Kenzie. Kenzie, Sherry Lynn. Nice to meet you, Sherry Lynn, Kenzie said, dipping her head in my ghostly friend's direction. Likewise, 
Sherry said, smiling. I was glad for her, because most women hadn't been that accepting of her when she'd been alive. Mostly because she'd been an exotic dancer at Keyhole's One Gentleman's Club, but also because she'd had attitude. Come to find out, that had been a defense mechanism. Sandra, who'd been quiet until then, examined the napkin closer, her brow furrowed. So, who owns the property in between Kinsey and Ida, and Ida and Noel? We need to see if they've gotten letters, too. For as long as I could remember, the plots beside us and behind had been empty. I don't know who owns it now, Corley said, but it used to be the Adcock family owned them both. The parents died back in the late 70s or early 80s, and the kids had already scattered. No idea if they kept it or sold it off. Thankfully, I had the might of Peggy Sue behind me. I'd lay dollars to donuts. She'd know the answer off the top of her head. Even if she didn't, she'd be able to find it in two minutes flat. The only problem was, it was the weekend, and she was out of town for her first real vacation in years. I'd just have to wait and hope whoever wanted a chunk of my hide wasn't in too big a hurry. Chapter 34 we spent the rest of the night goofing off and pretending somebody wasn't trying to kill us. I was glad, and a little bit sad, that Olivia Anderson, my arch-nemesis and a bimbo of the lowest order, hadn't shown up. She was always good for some stress relief, but I had a good time and didn't need the hassle anyway. Everybody kept it between the lines and didn't drink too much, so we each went our separate ways at the end of the evening. Gabby was in much better spirits, but when I drove by one of the storefronts and saw my truck in the mirrored reflection, I got mad all over again. Even in the dark, with only the street lights to go by, the passenger side was a mess. I'd called my insurance company before we'd left the house, and they'd said to drop it off at Skeeter's the next morning. Thankfully, I'd kept Bessie licensed, because it was hard to tell how long my new baby would be in the shop. Gabby had ridden with me and must have seen the look on my face. I know it isn't my fault, but still, I'm sorry. <sighs> I'm sorry some jerkwad mistook you for me and tried to kill you. She grinned. Never a dull moment, I guess. My crazy people tried to kill you when they dumped my ex's body in your barn. I figure we're even now. That was a true story that happened when Gabby and her horse, Mayhem, first showed up on my doorstep. Yeah, well, they better hope I don't find them first. I love this truck. I slid her a sideways glance and a smile. And you're okay, too, I suppose. Hunter was waiting when we got back. He had discouraging news. Georgia Investments was a shell corporation, ran through about a dozen other shell corps. One of his buddies in Indianapolis specialized in such things, so he agreed to follow the money and find out where it led, if he could. I explained the property lines to him so he'd understand why Miriam's name was in the mix, drawing them out the same for him as Coralie had for me. That's all well and good, he said, but what's the deal? I mean, the properties are valuable, but why does somebody want all of them? And why now? Your guess is as good as mine, I said, frustrated. But we need to figure out who owns the other properties. If nothing else, we need to make sure they're okay if they live locally. Oh, that's all a matter of public record, he said. And in my move toward transparency, Peggy Sue's been transferring all the property tax stuff, including ownership, to the county site. J.C.'s a great deputy, but a better site developer, believe it or not. We've been contracting him to set everything up, and he's been helping get everything entered, too. J.C. was a young guy, and like I said before, jobs in a small town aren't always easy to come by, and Keyhole Lake's no different. 
He'd always been a techie, but it wasn't like we had an Apple store or Best Buy in Keyhole. Even if we had, he probably still would have made less money than he did being a deputy with a few years on the force. That's awesome, I said. I know he'd rather make money doing that than issuing speeding tickets. Hunter snorted. He was willing to do it when he was on the clock just for his deputy's pay, but that wouldn't have been right. I looked into what a job like that would normally cost, and that's what we're paying him. Heck, with the way Hank was running the place... I can afford to get the county into this century and still not come close to charging the taxes he was. Yet another reason I loved the man. Most people would have let the kid do it for nothing, but not Hunter. I stood up on my tiptoes and gave him a kiss before I reached for my laptop. Then let's give this new system a whirl. J.C. had big props coming the next time I saw him. It took me all of five minutes to find out the property was owned jointly by a Catherine Mirabel Adcock and Francis Macon Adcock. Judging from the names, I assumed they were older, though I may have been off base on that. There was no alternate address listed, so even though we knew who owned it, we had no idea how to get a hold of them. I wondered what Peggy Sue did on such occasions, but it looked like I'd have to wait till she got back the following morning. We considered our work done for the day and pulled up a movie on Netflix. Chapter 35 Sunday's weather was just as gloomy and nasty as Saturday's, so I opted to go to the funeral in jeans, at least until Ida and Belle popped in. You can't wear jeans to a funeral, Belle barked wearing her fiercest expression when I tried to dig my heels in. It's unseemly. After all, if the family can dress up in their hour of mourning, surely you can take the time to doll up a little too. It's a funeral, not a picnic. I agree, Ida said, her voice all high and mighty. I only get one funeral, and as the deceased, I insist you wear a dress. Only in Keyhole would I even be having this conversation. I turned to them, my eyes narrowed. Keep it up and I'll go naked. The only shoes I have that go with a dress are heels. I'll sink in the muck. They just about nagged me into the one multi-purpose black dress I owned when Rose showed up dressed in slate slacks, a black silk blouse, and dressy ankle boots similar to the ones I'd planned on wearing with my jeans. I turned to the two ghosts, crossed my arms, and gave them my, now, what do you have to say, look. Rose looked back and forth between us, confused by the obvious standoff. She looked classy, and most importantly, event appropriate. What's going on? she asked. Oh, I was just being lectured because I wasn't planning on wearing a dress to the funeral. Rose rolled her eyes and looked at the two women. Be reasonable, Mama. It's wet out, and the ground is soggy. Besides, there's a cold front pushing through, and it's a little chilly. That was standard Georgia weather for this time of year. Baking hot one day and, well, not freezing the next, but close enough when you were used to sweating. For her part, Ida was doing her best to get along with Rose, so in the name of peace... She left it. Fine, but no denim. One simply does not wear dungarees to a funeral. Dungarees? Really, Mama? Rose motioned to me. Pay her no mind. This is an argument we've had since I can remember. Be comfortable. I stuffed my jeans back in the dryer and marched to my room, emerging a few minutes later in an outfit similar to Rose's. Ida paused looking a little unsure as we gathered our bags and headed toward the door. It was a look I didn't think I'd ever seen on her, and it threw me off kilter. Uh, what's the matter, Mama? Rose asked. Ida looked down and wrung her hands a little. Uh, what if nobody shows up? I'd never seen Ida anything less than confident, so I wasn't quite sure how to handle it, especially given her newfound amiability. 
I was surprised to find myself feeling bad for her, especially considering her fears weren't unfounded. She hadn't been the most popular of people, but she'd had a few people she got along with. Surely they'd show. Belle humphed. Are you kidding me? Everybody in town's gonna show up if for no other reason than to make fun of Felix's new wife and hope for some drama. Ida's form started to vibrate, and I glowered at Belle. Not helping. At all. Belle realized what she'd done and ushered to Ida's side to fix her faux pas. There, there, dear, she said. They'll make fun of her because she's tacky, and Felix obviously traded down. Even folks who didn't care for you will take your side on that point. Ida's form stabilized a little as she sniffed. Do you really think he'll be tactless enough to bring her? I didn't see her at the viewing. The only person I saw with him was Rose. I glanced at Rose, unsure how to handle the situation. She knew her mom better than anybody. She took a deep breath and let it slowly out. No, Mama, she was there, she said. We all waited, hoping for the best, but fearing the worst. And by fearing, I mean, we were actually afraid she'd flip out and do some serious damage. Ida looked puzzled. I don't remember seeing anybody there I didn't know, except for a homeless woman dressed in some hideous polka dot ensemble who was probably just there for the free food, poor soul. I hid my laugh behind a cough. Um, <clears throat> that would have been Millie. You could have heard a pin drop as I watched several expressions flit across Ida's face. I held my breath hoping she settled on some emotion that wouldn't cause her to blow up my house. She did the one thing none of us expected. She burst into gales of laughter. It was a good thing she didn't need to breathe anymore, because she'd have suffocated. Once I accepted that house and hearth were safe, I started to see the humor in it myself and joined her, followed by Belle. Rose didn't quite get there, though. Go ahead, all of you, laugh, she said, skewering us with a glare. I'm the one who has to deal with her. Mama, she wanted me to give her the keys to the house last night so she could start moving in. Again, Ida surprised me. Oh, baby, she said, wiping silver tears of mirth from her eyes. Don't you worry your pretty little head about that. That woman'll never sleep under my roof. Trust me. Well, that reminded me that one of the women had heard Ida asking Felix to move back in, and I asked about it. She drew her brows together and thought, The only conversation I've had with Felix in years was a few weeks ago, when I told him I thought we should consider taking the offer on the house. She rubbed her chin, then grinned. I know exactly what the old bat heard. Felix isn't exactly the grand success he thought he'd be, and he mentioned rent was eating him alive. I said, what would you like to move back in with me then? Is that what you want? It was sarcasm and an attempt to make him see the logic in selling the house, not a plea to get that bald polyester-wearing fool back in my life. Mama, Rose said, He's still my father, so please, can you dial back the disdain just a little? Ida about chewed her lip bloody. Had such a thing been possible, but she didn't say another word about him all the way to the cemetery. I hoped for Rosa's sake, Millie decided to show up in something a little more fashion-forward and conduct herself like she had some sense, but I wasn't holding my breath. Chapter 36 We went to the cemetery a little early so Rose could make sure everything was just so, though while the details mattered so much now that she knew Ida was still around eluded me a little. I said as much and she shrugged. I don't know, she said, as we picked our way across the soggy property toward Ida's plot. It just seems like the thing to do. After all, 
Most people think she's gone, and I do have to live in this town for the foreseeable future. Can you just imagine the tongue wagon that would go on if I canceled it? Or worse yet, if I showed up late? She had a point, and I wondered how I would have handled things had Addie shown up before her funeral rather than after. Just her casket had cost a fortune, and I'd gone as cheap as I was comfortable doing. After all, I didn't want to see the woman who'd raised me take to her eternal resting place in a cardboard box, but I couldn't afford to go gold leaf either. One night, after she'd been back a while, she'd asked how much I'd spent on her funeral, knowing I'd struggled to figure out how to make $2,000 stretch to four. If she'd been corporeal, she'd have skinned me alive when I answered. This situation was a whole other kettle of fish, though. Money wasn't an object, so Rose had gone all out on the casket and flowers. Ida floated around the whole gig, examining it from every angle. Was this as weird for you two as it is for me? She asked Addie and Belle as she hovered inside the tent that was covering the coffin and seating area. I don't know, Addie said. I missed mine. Belle nodded. Me too, but I imagine it would have been. Ida continued to float above her casket, bobbing a little as she pondered it. It's almost like I'm mourning too, she said, a tear slipping down her cheek. It just sank in on me. I'm dead. Belle and Addie shared a knowing look. You are, sugar, Belle said, but it happens to us all. Don't think of it that way, though. Think of it as you just don't ever have to fold another pair of bloomers, change clothes, do your hair, or wash dishes ever again. Yeah, I said, casting a glance at Addie. Now you get to boss around other people and make them do it. Great, I heard Rose mutter. So much for leaving a dish in the sink overnight. Darn tootin', young lady, Ida said. Addie heard her and pinned me with a glare. She floated toward Ida, and I was a little surprised when she said, Your tendency is gonna be to hover, but you can't do that now, just like you couldn't or shouldn't have, at least when you were alive. You still got to give Rose her space. She's a grown adult. Her gaze swiveled back to me, and her eyes narrowed. You likely still want to throttle her sometimes, but you gotta let her live her life. Ida examined Rose, who was shifting foot to foot, no doubt wondering if it was too late to call shenanigans on the whole deal. I suppose you're right. She is a grown woman, and she's done me proud so far. That was about the last thing I expected her to say, and I hoped she continued to make such a colossal effort to get along. Otherwise, her afterlife was going to drive Rose to day drink. And look at it this way, Addie said. Hopefully, the worst part's over. The coffin's closed so you don't have to worry about the weirdos touching you. True, Ida said. Or look at that horrible lipstick Coralie put on me. I'm sure she didn't go back and change it like I told her to. I smiled, and so did everybody else. Ida, ghost Ida, was still wearing the lipstick, and Coralie and Belle were right. Even though she was translucent, the color did wonders for her complexion, especially compared to her signature pumpkin orange. We were saved from having to explain why we were smiling when Sherry Lynn popped in. I held my breath as I introduced her to Ida. The woman shocked me again when she smiled, a mother hen look on her face. Addie and Belle have told me all about you, honey. I'm sorry about what happened to you, but I'm glad you have found happiness on this side. Sherry beamed. She was always a little nervous about meeting new people, be they living impaired or not, because of her reputation and profession when she'd been alive. For my part, I was grateful the two elder ghosts had smoothed her path. It's a pleasure to meet you, ma'am, Sherry said, bobbing her head respectfully, and the older woman gave her an approving smile. 
Ida approved of the flowers and declared Rose picked a beautiful coffin, even if it didn't seem as important a detail since she was floating proof that it really was just an empty shell in there. Now, if just the rest of the funeral went as well. Chapter 37 People began showing up in small clusters, and Rose greeted them as they did. Felix and Millie were among the last to arrive, and I shook my head in disbelief when I saw what Millie had chosen to wear. She had made some attempt at funeral apparel, but missed by a mile, and landed somewhere between Crazy Bag Lady and Dominatrix. Suffice it to say, a black leather miniskirt does not go with a silk hat and veil. I cast a glance at Addie and muttered under my breath. Belle and Ida gave me the dickens for considering jeans. Wearing fishnet stockings never even crossed my mind. Addie was still taking it all in, her expression a mix of disbelief and horrified fascination. That's because I raised you better, she said, without taking her eyes off the fashion disaster. But you, at least, could have pulled them off. Once you reach a certain age, weight and cellulite percentage, there are some things you just don't wear, ever. I chanced a glance at Ida to see how she was handling it. I couldn't tell if she was appalled or shocked into silence until her face lit up and she said, Hey, y'all, watch this. I closed my eyes, afraid of what was coming, because in all my years, I'd never seen anything good follow those words. At least, I didn't have to worry about her accidentally killing herself, but then it occurred to me she probably wasn't the one I should be worried about. She did a loop-de-loop, -loop, then got right up in Millie's face, her expression that of a 15-year-old about to steal her parents' car. I pulled in a breath and looked to Addie and Belle, who both shrugged. Ida ran an experimental finger up Millie's arm and was delighted when the woman rubbed the spot and gave a little shiver. Can I touch her if I concentrate hard enough? Ida asked. Unfortunately, no, Belle answered. Or fortunately, Rose muttered to me. I had to disagree. If physical contact other than just the cold chills was possible, we'd likely see the zipper on red, the bustier giveaway, or something equally heinous, and nobody wanted to see that. Ida messed with her throughout the short service, which made it hard for Rose to appear appropriately sad, because it got to be downright funny. Ida would poke her up and down an arm, then on the cheek, which I figured probably felt like bugs were landing on her, since she didn't know any better. Ida even passed her hand clear through her a couple times. I knew for a fact that felt like somebody passed an ice cube through you, since Addie delighted in whacking us on the back of the head, which of course resulted in her hand going all the way through. It felt sort of like a mini brain freeze. Millie became increasingly freaked out, slapping at the spots where Ida poked her and rubbing where her post-living predecessor passed clear through her. By the end of the short service, she looked like she was being swarmed by mosquitoes and everybody was staring at her and whispering behind gloved hands. Not that they hadn't been before because of the get-up, but now they weren't bothering to hide it. A few in attendance who knew about our ghost population had figured out what was going on and were clearing their throats and trying not to laugh. Ida may not have been well-loved, but she did have a few friends, and even those who only showed up to support Rose were still down for a good prank. As a grand finale, when Millie and Felix were leaving, Ida got right up next to Millie's ear and said, don't even think about moving into my house, and your saggy old ass looks like a mile wide in that skirt. I almost choked hearing the prim and proper Ida say such a thing and wondered for a second what had brought about the about face. Maybe dying helped her put things in perspective. Whatever it was, I wasn't complaining. All things considered, the service could have gone much worse for everybody except Millie of course. 
She squealed and jumped in the car, slamming the door behind her and putting her arms over her face. Drive, she barked at Felix as soon as he was in. Felix looked completely lost, but did as he was told and high tailed it out of there. Ida made a show of grinning and brushing off her hands. There, she said, that was the best funeral I've been to in a long time. Ever, maybe, even if it was my own. Mama, you're awful, Rose said, but the sparkle in her eyes took the bite out of it. Ida raised a brow. That old cow hasn't seen awful if she still tries to move into my house. From the look on her face, I had no doubt she meant every word of it. Ida Crenshaw was the type of woman who wouldn't let a little thing like being dead stop her from getting her way. Chapter 38 Hunter had hit a dead end on the murders, and the rain had given way to sunshine, so rather than sit around the house the rest of the day, we went for a ride on the bikes and grabbed some lunch. When we got home, he split off to hang out in the garage with Matt and work on a bike they'd bought as a fixer-upper. Since the temperatures had jumped back into the 80s, Ray, Gabby, Sherry Lynn, and I spent the afternoon lounging around the pool. That is, if you want to call making wild speculations about who tried to kill me after they'd already killed two other people, lounging. So, I said to Gabby, while we were sunbathing on floaty chairs in the pool, I didn't push you much last night because of the mess you went through nearly dying in my place and all, but tell us about Mustang guy who rear-ended you. Ray picked her head up and lifted her sunglasses. You were in two wrecks in two days? Why am I just now hearing about this? It was no big deal, Gabby replied. But I could tell just from the tone of her voice that if I rolled my head over in the chair and looked at her, her cheeks would be pink. Liar, Ray said, calling her out. You can't fool me. I can read you like a book, and right now... It's a steamy romance. What's his name? And what does he look like? Gabby heaved a put-upon sigh. Fine. His name is Michael, and he's about six feet, blonde, and has brown eyes. Yep. I called that the minute she hung up after the wreck. And, I probed, is he from around here? Are you seeing him again? Jeez, y'all are so nosy she said, irritated. No, he's not from around here. Well, not from Keyhole Lake. He lives in Eagle Gap, and we're going for coffee tomorrow on my day off. He's come to sign some papers for his car. Since Skeet was the one who towed it, he just had him do the estimates. Yeah, Sherry Lynn said, snickering. And it sounds like the car isn't the only thing getting its chassis checked. Knock it off, Gabby told her a scowl in her voice. It's just coffee. Yeah, I said. First it's coffee, then a romantic dinner date. Then, next thing you know, you're barefoot and pregnant with your third baby, living in a mansion in the lap of luxury, eating turkey bacon and vegan cheese. She dropped her leg off the edge of her floaty and splashed me. Shut up! It's coffee, not an interview for The Bachelor, and bacon is made from a pig. Anybody that says any different is just wrong. What about you? I asked Ray, turning the tables on her. What did you and the handsome doc work out? No, Ray mumbled, refusing to look at us. There's nothing up with Dave and me. Ha! I barked. Now you're the liar. I turned to Gabby and Sherry Lynn. He wants to take things to the next level. That's awesome news! Sherry Lynn bobbed up and down and clapped her hands, practically squealing. It is, Gabby said, settling back in the pool chair. And it's not like you're really doing anything other than making it official anyway. You haven't been out with anybody else in months. Why are you making such a big deal about it? Ray sighed. It's just, he doesn't know I'm a witch, 
or about ghosts, or about any of it. And I feel like if we're going to take it to the next step, I should tell him. Are you kidding? Sherry Lynn said, amazed. You haven't told him you're a witch yet? Yeah, Ray snarked, because that's something that just comes up in conversation. Hey, this steak is fabulous, and by the way, I'm a witch. Will you pass the salt, please? Perfectly rational conversation to have with a man of science. Sherry held her hands up and wrinkled her nose. Don't get all witchy. I was just asking. I guess it was easy for me and Rupert because we were both already dead when we met. Of course, it took me a while to work up the nerve to tell him what I did for a living before I died. So... I guess I can sort of understand. Ray pulled in a deep breath and let it out again. I just wish I could figure out a way to tell him. I've started to a hundred times because I really like him, but I always chicken out. Have faith, I said. It's part of who you are, but just a part. He already likes all the other parts, so I think it'll be fine. And if it's not... He's not the one for you anyway. Even though she agreed out loud with me, I knew she liked him enough that she didn't want to risk losing him. Still, it was a conversation she'd have to have, eventually. He'd be fine with it, and if he wasn't, I'd kick his butt for breaking her heart. Chapter 39 The next morning, I decided to stop into the clip and curl. I'd chipped a nail and needed it fixed, plus I wanted to find out what they knew about Dave and how likely they thought he'd be to accept the news. When I got there, I was pleasantly surprised to see Bobby Sue and Sandra in there doing a sister's day. Sandra was leaned back in the chair getting her hair washed and Bobby was getting a pedicure. Man, she told Elise, who was massaging her feet. I don't know why I don't do this more often. You have magic fingers. Elise just smiled. That's what I'm told. I don't know why you don't come in here more often either. I could really help with the plantar fasciitis. She rolled Bobby's toes back into a stretch, then dug her thumbs into the arch of her foot, and Bobby groaned. She's right, Bobby, Sandra said as Coralie hung up the hose and reached for the shampoo. You need to treat yourself more often. You work like a dog running the restaurant, raising Justin, and keeping that house of yours immaculate. You deserve some pampering. Bobby Sue beamed when her sister called her house immaculate, and I mouthed, I told you so. She crinkled her nose at me, but didn't stop grinning. Land's sakes... Sandra said when Coralie started massaging the shampoo into her hair. I could do this all day. Coralie burst out laughing. I do do it all day. Speaking of, where do you go to get your hair cut? I'd wondered a few times but never asked. Well, now I have a lease do it, she said as she rinsed Sandra's hair. She's been to school for it and she's learned a ton just watching me. Belle humped. You mean listening to me. Coralie lifted a shoulder. Bo, she's learning how to be bossy and cantankerous from you, so she'll be in shape when she gets old. And she's learned how to cut hair and do the books from me, so she'll have the skills if she ever takes this place over. Well, that caught my attention. I couldn't imagine the clip and curl without Coralie, but when I thought about it, she was in her fifties and counting. With Elise in her early 20s, that left the door wide open for Coralie to hand the reins over if she ever decided to. Personally, I figured she'd die with scissors in her hand, but you never know. Since I didn't feel comfortable questioning them about Ray's problem with coming out of the closet to Dave with Sandra in the room, I figured I might as well book myself in for when Elise was done with Sandra, then head over to the shop to get some work done. Errol was in high spirits when I walked through the door, and I wondered what had him so chipper. Don't get me wrong, I was glad, but curious. 
I had the best time out with the ghost auxiliary last night, he exclaimed, floating along beside me as I headed toward the counter to stash my purse. We went to the theater last evening for classics night and watched Gone with the Wind. They just don't make them like that anymore. They did not, for which I was eternally grateful. But since I was one of the very few Southerners, or Northerners, for that matter, who didn't like the movie, I didn't relate to him how happy that made me. Instead, I grinned. I'm glad you got out, and ecstatic you had fun. I wish you'd do it more often. He smiled. You know, I think I'm going to. There are some real nice folks in that group, and they're helpful when I get a little down. Don't get me wrong, you're a peach, but they know what I'm going through. That makes sense, I said, not taking it personally. You need to be out with like-minded people who are in the same boat you are. We all do. He followed me into the workshop. So, what's on your agenda for the day? I glanced at my watch and was surprised to see it was only a quarter to nine. I'd gotten up early to bring more pastries to brew, so I'd sat and had a cup of coffee with Ray and Angel, then pitched in and helped with the early rush. I was dying to hear who owned the land between Ida and me, but Peggy Sue wouldn't be in until nine to look it up. It looks like I'm going to be making some grocery list blackboards, I said. I picked up a whole box of old washboards at an auction this weekend and still have plenty chalkboard paint from the last ones I made. That's good, he said. They sell well. He floated back and forth like he was waiting for me to say something, but I had no clue what it was. Is there something on your mind? I finally asked. Well, duh, he said, but he sounded a little hurt. I'm waiting to hear all about Gabby's wrecks and all the excitement from the weekend. I figured you'd have already spilled the beans, but it seems I'm going to have to drag it out of you. He crossed his arms and frowned at me. I'm sorry, I said. My mind's all cluttered, and I figured you'd heard it all from Addie and Belle anyway. Well, I did, he admitted, but I want to hear your version of events. Uh, Maybe they left something out. I huffed a breath out my nose. The last thing I would ever accuse either one of those ladies of is leaving a single nuance out of a story. Okay, then, he said. I'll be more blunt. I'd like to hear the unvarnished facts without all the embellishments. That made more sense. Oh, well, in that case, buckle up. I gave him the 411 on the entire weekend, including Ray's reticence to talk to Dave. He was a heck of a problem solver when it came to romance, and he loved to do it. He practically cackled with glee when I told him about Gabby's literal run-in with the hot guy. It's about time that girl found her a man, he said. I've been worried sick about her. She never dates, and all she does is work. Well, I said, To be fair, her mama wasn't exactly somebody she'd want to bring a guy home to, and she had a boyfriend when she worked at the ranch. He snorted. Yeah, one that ended up dead in your barn. I have yet to meet a man, living or dead, worth going to prison for, even if it was because I killed him. That wasn't funny because the whole situation had been a nightmare, but it was. Seriously, he continued, Our girl needs a man in her life. You have Hunter, Ran has Dave, Anna may have Matt. Shoot, even Shelby has Cody. The poor thing's got to feel like the third wheel most of the time. When he put it like that, I felt a little guilty. Yeah, I guess you're right. She does deserve somebody. Hunter's ringtone sang from my back pocket, and I pulled out my phone. Hey, sweetie. I said when I answered. Hey yourself, he replied. Peggy Sue just came in and, as usual, had the info I needed without even looking it up. The Adcocks are husband and wife. Unfortunately, she doesn't have an address for either of them. Hmm, I said, thinking. I've been thinking about it since we looked it up, and I don't think I've ever heard the name until now. That doesn't surprise me, he said. 
Peggy Sue doesn't even know who they are. I have her trying to track down a current address now. That shouldn't be too hard. The tax bill has to be sent somewhere. Well, he drew the word out. It comes straight out of a trust every year that was set up by the parents specifically for that. Great. Just what we needed. Another dead end. I'd had about all the dead anythings I could handle for the year and was starting to wonder if it was a sign. Chapter 40 I just put the finishing touches on the lamps when Ray called. I pulled my gloves off and dropped my paintbrush into a cup of water. Hey, I said, holding the foam between my ear and shoulder as I washed white paint off my fingertips. What's up? You gotta get down here, she said, her words slurring together in panic. I screwed up and have no idea how to fix it. I furrowed my brow and dried my hands, already on my way toward the door. Well, what happened? I thought you were skipping magic at work for the time being. I am, she said. I haven't so much as picked up a rag with magic, but I made some fresh batches of coffee and tea infusions, and I shouldn't have, apparently. Well, what do you mean you shouldn't have? I asked, trying to figure out how coffee or tea blends could have gone wrong. Ray was an earth witch and had a knack for all things herbal. It's what made her drinks so popular. When people said they were magical, most of them had no idea how accurate they were. She had a dozen blends for everything from energy to vitality and mood. Just get here, she said, as a crash sounded in the background. I almost ran the two blocks to brew for you from my place and stopped to catch my breath outside the front door before I went in to face the man-eating vines, deadly daisies, or whatever magic-gone-wild havoc awaited me inside. Movement in the front window caught my eye and I did a double-take. Roy, an arthritic old-timer who came to brew most mornings to play chess with his buddy Jimmy, was doing jumping jacks and boosting his cane over his head like a weight bar. Oh, boy. I called to Addie because unless I missed my guess, I was going to need all the help I could get. She popped in, and all I did was point at the window. She took one look and pulled in a deep breath. Lordy! What's that poor girl gone and done now? She shook her head and motioned toward the entrance. Come on, let's go see if I need to get Beth or if I can talk you through it. I cringed in anticipation of whatever hot mess I was walking into as I pushed the door open. Rayanne was standing behind the counter, looking about five seconds away from bursting into tears. Roy was grinning to beat the band and did a backflip down the aisle. Miss Simpson, one of our favorite little old ladies, tossed her walker aside and joined him in an odd version of some oldies dance to the canned country music song filtering through the speakers in the corners. Jimmy, who'd been complaining he wasn't as sharp as he'd once been, was tearing through his Sudoku book faster than a rocket scientist. It only took me a few seconds to put two and two together. Rayanne had made a fresh batch of coffee and tea blends the night before. Roy always got jaw vitality, which, if memory served, is what Ms. Simpson drank too. Ray had made a special blend for Jimmy that she called Keen Koopa. From the looks of things, it was working too well. She superpowered her blends, I whispered to Addie, who nodded assessing the situation. I think I can handle it, though. I wouldn't have been too worried because, aside from the strange behavior, nothing horrible was going on. However, Olivia Anderson and her posse of trolls were standing in line waiting for coffee. On second thought, even that was probably okay. They were so self-absorbed, they never noticed Jimmy, and I could probably get Roy and Miss Simpson to sit down. It wasn't so bad. And of course, just as the thought flitted through my mind, the place went to hell in a handbasket. 
Roy and Miss Simpson started singing along off-tune to the sexy duet now playing on the radio, yelling for her to turn it up. Ray gave his geriatric dance partner's backside a swat, and I knew it was time to get to work. I used sign language, a skill we'd picked up in college, to tell Ray to deal with Olivia and the Boobsy twins. When she jerked her head in a quick nod, I headed toward the centenarian singers. I got them settled and brushed off my hands. Mischief managed, to put it in the words of the greatest wizarding writer ever, Again, I got ahead of myself. A couple of yuppie types who came in every morning for locomochas, my personal favorite energy blend, were literally vibrating in the booth they were sitting in. Since having somebody spontaneously combust in the shop would make an awful mess that I was not cleaning up, that one couldn't wait. I did the only thing I could think of. I muttered a quick sleep spell and stepped forward fast enough to catch them before their foreheads plunked onto the wooden tabletop. Megan Porter, a timid girl who didn't have a mean bone in her body, was drinking her daily cup of bold gold, one of Ray's most popular teas. She infused it with just a touch of confidence, and I enjoyed it on days I was feeling overwhelmed and needed an outside dose of I can do this. Megan stepped forward and poked Olivia on the shoulder. Olivia turned to her, and when she realized who it was, her typical mean girl expression slipped into place. She curled her nose as her gaze slid over Megan's too large sweater, faded jeans, and utilitarian shoes. Well, look who it is, Megan the Mouse. The other two women, Angelica Cotton and Bunny Scott, a.k.a. Rotten Cotton and Big Boobs Bunny, snickered behind her. Bunny sneered. God, Megan, the homeless shelter called and wants their sweater and shoes back. I pierced her with a glare and took a step toward them. She was the only one of the three slutateers I hadn't punched in the mouth, but I didn't have any qualms about doing it. It was just that she'd always had a half ounce more sense than the rest of them when I was around and knew better than to run her mouth. Too bad for her. She hadn't seen me yet. You could have knocked me over with a feather when, instead of looking down at her shoes and muttering like she usually did, Megan narrowed her eyes, strode toward Bunny, and belted her a good one right in the kisser. I didn't know who looked more shocked. Megan? or everybody else in the shop who knew her. I, for one, was proud of her, and apparently she wasn't done yet. After a stunned moment, she turned toward Olivia and stuck her finger in her face. And you, you mouthy, entitled bitch, I've had it up to here with how you treat people. You're rotten to the bone and always have been, and you stuff your bra, or at least you did in high school, with full-on tube socks. No less, because all you had were fried eggs on your chest. Then you have the nerve to make fun of the rest of us. Megan gasped and slapped her hand over her mouth, her eyes wide. The abject horror written on her face about broke my hold on my delight. I'd recovered from my shock once I realized it was the tea talking and was doing my best to keep from busting a gut, laughing as Megan gave the mean girls what they had coming. I bit down on my knuckle, reminding myself this was a serious situation that I needed to fix, but I was willing to give it a minute to see if Megan was done. She deserved this moment for years, and there was no way I was going to take it from her. Angelica took a step forward, her brow drawn down and murder on her face. Again, I stepped toward them because it looked like things were about to get real. Turns out, She didn't need me after all. Megan reached out and grabbed Angelica's hair, yanking out a handful of extensions. And you, Miss High and Mighty, she said, a disgusted curl to her lip as she held up the extensions. You've been going bald since high school. I'm friends with Knuckles, and he says it's so bad you get a shipment of that spray-on hair every few weeks. 
All three of the trampy trio were caught flat-footed. Just the looks on their faces were worth whatever the charge of admission would have been. Olivia was slack-jawed, Bunny was holding her nose as blood streamed down her face, and Angelica was howling, holding her head where a big bald spot had appeared when Megan yanked her extensions out. Uh, When I looked closer, I could see that her scalp really did have some sort of chalky substance that matched the color of her hair on it. Not that I had anything against that for any other not-mean woman who needed it, but it was nice to see Angelica get back a minuscule portion of what she'd given over the years. Olivia had recovered, squared her shoulders, and charged straight at Megan. By this time, the few other patrons in the shop were staring with rapt attention at the scene. One woman was tapping away on her cell phone, and the girl with her was filming the whole thing. This would be the news of the week. For her part, Megan's expression had gone from shocked and embarrassed to wondrous. She looked five years younger once she drew herself out of her perpetual slouch, and the wide smile on her face revealed a beauty I'd never noticed before. She snapped her left arm up just in time for Olivia to plow face first right into her fist. The beastly woman bounced back from the unexpected quick stop and landed square on her fat ass, her expression dazed. Megan regarded the havoc she'd wreaked with the glee of a kid at Christmas. It wasn't until Rayanne's mortified face caught my eye that I remembered the importance of what was going on. I looked around. Roy had settled back down into his chair, leaning on his cane and holding his back. I hopped forward and snatched his coffee from his hand before he could take another sip and did the same to Jimmy, who was flipping through a few pages of completed Sudoku puzzles, bum-fuzzled. Addie floated over to me. You should probably do that for everybody. She had a point, but I didn't want to start any rumors about the quality of Ray's coffee or do any social damage to the shop. Lord knew that could turn vicious lickety-split if I said there was something wrong with the drinks, plus everybody was likely drinking something different. At least there were only six or seven people in there. Thinking quickly, I closed my eyes and muttered a few words, drying up every cup in the place. One woman was mid-sip, but considering she was blowing on the top and barely tipped the cup, I hoped she hadn't had enough to do any damage. She stared at her cup when she realized it was empty, then looked at the bottom for holes. I swooped in and grabbed her cup. Free refills today. What were you having? Whatever it was, I was going to have to witch the flavor into it. If she had a special shot of energy, focus, or anything else, she was going to have to do without. That was Ray's gig, not mine. Just a regular coffee, please, she said scratching her head and glancing at the floor to see where her coffee had gone. Back in a jiff, I said. Just the fact that I used the word jiff was a good indication of how off-kilter I was at that moment. You're doing a fine job, sweetie, Addie said, before swooping over to see what Ray was doing. I cruised around the end of the counter to refill the coffee cup and Ray grabbed my sleeve. Olivia wants the raspberry romp and won't take anything else. It's one of the tea blends I made last night. She motioned to the store and sighed. And you can see how that turned out. And Olivia would be beside herself with joy to go forth and talk smack about Brew to anybody who would listen. There weren't many who would, but still, I didn't want to give her the pleasure. It's a green tea, right? I asked. It was a new blend she'd added in the last few weeks, so I wasn't sure about it. Yeah, she replied, but like I said, I don't have any plain raspberry tea. What's she doing here anyway? I hissed. They don't usually crawl out of their holes to come in when either of us are here. I made a standard green tea while I was talking, then said a few words over it to add a hint of raspberry flavor. Ray lifted a shoulder. Because beasts like them can sense weakness and misfortune and swoop in to feed off it? That was as good an explanation as any, 
I plucked the lid out of the holder and was about to pop it onto the cup when Olivia snapped her fingers. I cast her the stink eye and was pleased to see her skin was already starting to bruise where Megan had hit her. Or she had hit Megan's fist, whichever. It was going to be a humdinger of a shiner. I could tell from her snobby expression she was about to say something sarcastic about me, Ray, or the tea, or all three, but she snapped her mouth shut when Megan cleared her throat and raised a brow at her from her spot by the pastry case a few feet away. Gone was the wallflower who jumped at her own shadow. Megan stood tall, confidence oozing from her. I hoped it wasn't just the afterburn of standing up to the bullies because she was a great person and deserved to feel good about herself. I handed the plain coffee back to the still-confused woman, then took care of Olivia and Tarts. By the time they left, Roy and Jimmy were the only people still in the shop besides us. They were back to playing chess like nothing had happened, and his dance partner shuffled out the door, a glint still in her eye. I don't know what just happened, Megan said. I don't know what came over me. She paused and her face took on a rosy hue. But I'm glad it did. That felt amazing. She did a little pirouette and practically floated out the door. I smiled as it closed behind her and nudged Ray with my elbow. See, that wasn't so bad. She heaved a sigh, tossed her bar towel into the sanitizer bucket, and bent down to start pulling out bags of the teas and blends she'd made the night before. Tears of frustration welled in her eyes. Only because I got lucky and only a few people got a dose of the batch I made last night. I couldn't say I knew how she felt because even though I was getting new magic, it was manageable. If my baking magic went screwy, I don't know what I would have done. It's such a huge part of who I am, I'd lose my mind if I couldn't use it. I pulled her into a hug. We'll figure this out, I said. Addie floated up behind us, sympathy etched on her face. She's all right, sweet pea. We'll get you sorted out and you'll be as good as new. I wish I felt as confident as we tried to sound. I had a feeling that this, like everything else that had been going on, wasn't anything with an easy fix. Chapter 41 I helped Ray pull all the new blends, then popped back over to Coralie's to have my nail fixed. Roberta was there for her weekly style, which is what she called her gossip pit stop. She also had a mani-pedi day, so she didn't have to go a whole week without checking in for new fodder. Noel, I'm so glad you're here, she said, wringing her hands. I just heard Wembley's Wine Club is poisoning people. Is it true? I have a membership. What was I supposed to say to that? If I said yes, she'd go running off like Chicken Little, screaming that the wine was deadly and potentially ruin an innocent business. If I said no, and she died because she drank a poisoned bottle, I'd feel terrible. I chose my words carefully. Ida Crenshaw and Miriam Wallace were both poisoned by wine that came from that particular company, I said. But we're not sure at what point the bottles were tampered with. Right now, we believe it was probably a local job targeting specific people. There's a good chance it was tampered with after it left Wembley's. There's no reason to believe that it happened where it was packed, or else there would surely be other reports from around the country. She looked confused. Why would there be complaints from around the country? Because if the wine was tainted at the facility, what are the odds that two women in the same county were the only ones affected? Pretty darned good, I'd say, she said, looking at me like I was a dunce. Now I was the one confused. Why? Because the Wembley's Wine of the Month Club is local, she said. 
Mabel Wembley started the business a couple years ago to help bring in some extra money when her husband died. She has a better price and better selection than any of the larger clubs. Plus, we like to keep the money at home. Wow, of all the stupid assumptions to make. We hadn't even thought to check where the wine club was based because we'd assumed it didn't matter. Belle nodded. She's a good egg, though she's a little gruff sometimes. It's not been easy for her getting by on her own. Roberta sniffed and put her nose up a little. I'm a little miffed at her right now. I didn't get my shipment Saturday like I was supposed to. Coralie scowled at her. Mabel's 80 years old. She's got arthritis and it's getting worse. Sometimes it's all she can do to get out of bed. It's why she hired on that boy, but he's not reliable. If you didn't get your shipment, don't blame Mabel until you at least call her to see what happened. Belle huffed. I agree. The only thing Mabel can count on is that boy showing up to work south most days. And if he ain't when he gets there, he sure is when he leaves. I don't know why she keeps him on. I don't know either, Coralie said as she swept up some hair from around her barber chair. That's no doubt why you didn't get your delivery, though, Roberta. I'm sure you'll have it by tomorrow. I'm not sure why none of you thought to tell us Wembley's was local, I said, amazed. Belle frowned at me. We just assumed you knew. There's that word, assumed, I said, aggravated because she was right. It should have been one of the first things we checked. I pulled out my phone and texted Hunter. He was not going to be happy we'd missed such a crucial detail when all it would have taken was a call or even the right question. I couldn't believe it had slipped past us. I didn't get an immediate response, so I plopped down into the chair across from Elise. As soon as my nail was fixed, I slipped back over to my shop and called Kenzie. Hey, quick question, I said when she answered. Do you know where Wembley's Wine of the Month Club is out of? I don't, she answered. In the U.S., I think, because Mom wouldn't have sprung for any fancy international wines. It never really came up because Mom was the wine drinker in the family. Except for when I was with her, I usually drink beer. I didn't feel so bad then. Even she didn't know where it came from. Why? she asked. Does it matter? Oh, it definitely matters, I think. It shipped from right here in Keyhole Lake. She was as surprised as I was. I hung up with her and called Rose to ask her the same question. Mom, she called, where did your wine come from? I heard Ida answer back. She knew Mabel Wembley personally and vouched for her. Put the phone on speaker, she said, her voice barely audible. Rose must have because her voice was clear as a bell a second later. Mabel Wembley puts the boxes together, she said. She's got arthritis, something terrible, and I thought buying from her would help her get by. Well, wonders never ceased. Maybe Bill had been right about Ida after all. Hunter finally responded and swung by and picked me up a few minutes later. He had an address for Mrs. Wembley and wanted to speak with her and thought having me there might help. Translation. He'd learned that little old ladies who lived in the woods of southern Georgia were at least as dangerous as the rest of the wildlife. Turns out, she did live in the boondocks, but wasn't the shotgun-wielding type. Rather, she offered us a glass of wine. Since two women had died from her supply, we took a hard pass, but did it gently. When we explained the situation to her, I was afraid she was going to have a stroke or something. She sank onto a faded floral chair, and her hand fluttered to her throat. This is awful, she said, her eyes a little unfocused. 
I knew Ida and Miriam both well. Ida leaned toward Huffy, but she was all bluster. She helped me out a little when my Edward died, sent a girl out to help me clean for a bit and wouldn't take a cent for doing it. I was flabbergasted. The more I heard about Ida, the more I realized she wasn't the old hag I thought she was. I didn't understand why she'd wanted people to think she was. Maybe she really was mean, but decency popped up out of the blue from her sometimes. If I'd learned anything in life, it was that people were rarely all good or all bad. We asked Mabel to give us a tour of her facility, and that dragged her out of her stupor a little. Motioning for us to follow her, she shuffled to the back of her house. I hate to say it with two women dead, she said over her shoulder, but when word gets hot about this, my goose will be cooked. I don't know what I'll do if this place goes under. It's all I can do to make ends meet as it is. My heart went out to her because I was sure she was telling the truth. My bullshit meter was flatlined. There wasn't a hint of deception in either her tone or expression. Whatever was happening, she had nothing to do with it. I started the business shortly after I became a widow. I had a little less than twenty grand left after I paid for the funeral, and wine's always been a passion of mine. She motioned toward the side yard, and her bony chest puffed out with pride. A large, well-tended arbor took up the majority of probably five acres. Those are there, she said, pointing at vines weighted down by thick clumps of grapes. Are my Georgia Merlots. Makes some of the best wine I've ever tasted. Been growing them for five decades, and it's taken me almost that long to perfect my growing and fermenting methods. Do you make white wine, too? I asked. All the grapes looked the same to me from that distance, but I was a wine drinker, not a wine maker. She shook her head. Nope, used to, but I just don't drink enough of it to justify the extra work. Only got so much space here, and the red was far more popular than the white with everybody else, too. So red it is. Mabel stopped in front of a large garage-like structure and rubbed her hip, her gnarled fingers kneading her flesh. She flashed me a pained smile that didn't quite reach her roomy eyes. Getting old's for the birds, but I reckon it beats the alternative. I was surprised to see the door had a rubber seal around it, sort of like the one on a fridge. When she pulled, it opened with a pop, and we stepped back into a temperature-controlled building. Cases of wine were stored along the sides and categorized by type. There was a pallet of her company boxes on a work table, and shipping labels were stacked neatly next to them. Finally, in a box next to that was a small modern tablet that she said she used to keep track of orders. Customers fill out a survey when they sign up, choosing uh, how many bottles they want and what types of wine they prefer. I try to vary my selections, and I don't automatically ship any more. I got tired of getting complaints about the automatic charges. Now, if the month-to-months don't choose, I don't ship them anything that month. I do have quarterly, six-month, and yearly subscription options, though. Ida and Miriam were both annual customers. I was impressed. She may have looked like somebody's great-granny, but she was a survivor. I liked her. Her body was stooped with age, but her dark eyes were sharp and bright with intelligence. She was nobody's fool. So... You've recently hired a young man to help you? I asked. Is he somebody you trust? She shook her head. I hired him because I'm too old to be toting boxes of wine, but all the financials are encrypted. There's no way he can access any of them. 
Hearing an 80-year-old talking about encrypted files took me by surprise for some reason. This woman was full of surprises. What's his name? Hunter asked. And what do you know about him? She pulled in a deep breath and released it, rubbing her knobby knuckles and grimacing a little as she did so. His name's a Macon Dressup, but he don't work for me no more. I fired him when he didn't show up Friday. My orders didn't get out, and if he ain't going to help me make my money, I'm not giving him any of it. The name rang a bell. That was the middle name of the guy who owned the property between Ida and me. Do you have an address on him? I wasn't hopeful. She shook her head. No, I was paying him under the table. Well, do you have any idea where we might find him? Hunter asked. Did he ever mention where he was staying? Mrs. Wembley snorted. Not for sure, but if I was you, I'd start at the nearest bar. And if you catch him, he owes me for three cases of wine he helped himself to last time he left. Yeah, I wasn't holding my breath that she'd ever see that wine again. Chapter 42 we stopped at a couple small bars along the way back to town, but without a picture, we weren't having much luck. Since he wasn't in a cruiser, Hunter didn't have his dash computer and couldn't pull any information up on the guy. Instead, he called Peggy Sue and asked her to see if she could find a driver's license picture or something to send to his phone. As expected, it was there in less than five minutes. Turns out, the kid was from Atlanta. Surprise, surprise. We didn't have any luck at the next few bars, even with the picture. They recognized him, but had no idea where he was staying. We asked them to contact us if he came in, but figured that was a waste of breath. By the time we got back to town, I was starving. Ribs from Bobby Sue's sounded like heaven, so we stopped in. Louise, the manager and a good friend, was working. Sarah, who'd been there for years, just like I had, was there too. We'd shared almost five years' worth of exhausting shifts and sore feet, but we'd had our fair share of good times, too. It was good to see them. I'd been so busy I hadn't been able to stop in for a while, and they'd both missed the last couple girls' nights. We chatted while we ate until an uproar came from the other side of the restaurant. We didn't come here to watch the waitstaff sit with the customers. A woman's high-pitched voice called. My tea's empty, and my pookie needs some more napkins. Sarah rolled her eyes. That woman's one of the biggest pains in my backside I've had in here in a while. I'll be right back. She grabbed a fresh glass of tea and a stack of napkins on her way and returned a minute later, dropping off a glass at the waitress station that was still a quarter full. Some people. I craned my neck to see who it was. Color me shocked when it turned out to be Millie and Felix. The woman was dressed in yet another garish outfit and had her hair styled in some kind of big 50s knockoff hairdo with a neon green scarf. Of course, it was the only green thing she was wearing. She should have had to tip more just because her outfit could potentially cause blindness. My phone dinged a few seconds later with a text. It was Kenzie, wanting to know what we'd learned. She also had a fresh batch of rhubarb from her mom's garden that she wanted to give me and offered to drop it off at Brew. I invited her to stop by Bobby Sue's for dessert instead. While we were finishing up our ribs, Sarah filled us in on her most recent adventures with her six-year-old son, Sean. It amazed me that he was that old already. In just a few minutes, Kenzie popped in, smiling. Hey, I said, when she slid into the booth. I hope you like cheesecake. She snorted. Are you kidding? Bobby Sue has that good cheesecake from Costco. I love that stuff. And the blueberry drizzle she makes? Yeah, I'm in. Sarah brought us our plates right as another round of whining came from Millie's table. Excuse me? Why did they get their desserts first? 
Since we were sitting with our backs to them, Kenzie gave me a what-the-heck look and twisted to see. Who's the wildebeest? she asked. That's Millie, the current thorn in Rose's side, her new step-mommy. The guy is Felix, Rose's dad. Millie, as in Millie Crenshaw? Yeah, I said, thinking about it. According to Belle, she used to be Millie Lance. That's my cousin, she hissed at me. Or at least I think it is. She and Mama fought because Millie thought she should have gotten half the farm, but Grandma and Grandpa left it all to Mama. She went on to explain her family dynamics. As is the case with most of us, her family tree had a couple bad branches, and Millie's mom had been one of them. Miriam had been a midlife surprise to her grandparents. Faye, Miriam's sister, was 20 years her senior and had started life as a wild child. She'd continued to build a life based on bad decisions, one of which was Millie's father. When Millie's grandfather caught Faye and her beau trying to steal tools out of his garage, he'd put his foot down and disowned her. And you haven't heard from Millie? I asked. I've never even met her, Kenzie said. The only reason I recognize her is because she sent a letter to Mom's lawyer a couple weeks ago wanting to dispute the will and claim part of the property, but the wills were ironclad. That farm's mine, free and clear. Are you going to go say... Hello? Sarah asked. Kenzie chewed her lip and cast another glance back toward Millie, who was still fussing about the service to Felix. He was doing his best to placate her, but was failing miserably. Kenzie shook her head. I don't see any good coming of it. She stayed away this long without trying to build a relationship and was nasty about the farm. I'm going to let that particular sleeping dog lie. Louise rolled her eyes as Millie's nasally whine became louder and Felix shushed her. I wish that dog was sleeping. It's hard to imagine she's related to your mom. Oh, wait a minute, I said, my brain churning. She married Rose's dad, which put her in direct line to get the house if Ida died, and she thought she had a claim to your place, or at least part of it. Hunter's brow was furrowed. It seemed he was drawing the same conclusions I was. Why did she challenge the will? Did she have a reason to believe she may get the farm if your mom died? He asked Kenzie. She looked uncomfortable for a minute. Being the sweetheart she was, Mom felt bad when Grammy left her everything. In her original will, Mom left her house and the small plot it's sitting on to Millie, and I got my house and the rest of the property. So what happened? Sarah asked. Why did she change it? Mom wouldn't talk much about it, Kenzie said. But from what little she did say, Millie's bad with money and was more interested in the property because of its cash value, not the fact it's been in the family for four generations, she changed her will a year or so ago, but I don't know if Millie knew that or not. For that matter, I don't know how she would have known about the first one. I turned to Hunter. Are you going to question her again? He shook his head. We don't have anything but speculation right now, and we already know she's not going anywhere. Yeah, Sarah said, her lip curled. She was bragging about moving into her new house today. I scowled but then thought of Ida's words to Rose about that situation. An evil grin crept across my face at the thought of how trying to move into Ida's house was going to go for Millie. Oh, to be a fly on that wall. Hunter had to have caught the look on my face. I know it twists your knickers, but it'll give me time to run a check on her and get my ducks in a row, he said. I don't have enough right now to arrest her. If she was involved in the murders, she knew who ran Gabby off the road. Just thinking about it made me want to choke the truth out of her. Hunter was right, though. We didn't know for sure she was involved, even if I'd have bet my bottom dollar on it. If it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, but her day was coming. 
I could wait. Chapter Forty Three. Peggy Sue dug high and low, but couldn't come up with so much as a whisper of current information on the people who owned the property next to me. She'd broadened her search, but it wasn't like Keyhole Lake had the resources to do national searches. Instead, Hunter called his friend in Indianapolis again and asked for more help. I didn't know who that guy was, but Hunter's favors list was piling up. He was going to have to invite him down for a free vacation, especially when his buddy hit pay dirt with the corporation. But what he found was a head scratcher. Apparently, the owner of Record was one Macon Jessup. This kid had to be related to the folks who owned the property, between the shared name and the corporation. If I had to take a guess, his parents had passed, and the kid had inherited the place. It was the only thing that made sense. Still, it didn't sit right. The idea of a drunk kid masterminding two murders to get his hand on property to develop didn't add up. It wasn't that I didn't think he would have done it. I just didn't think he had the brain power to come up with it on his own. According to his license, he was only 25, and at least on paper, he didn't seem like the sharpest knife in the drawer. With the long list of petty crimes he'd already accumulated, mastermind wasn't the first adjective I'd have used to describe him. Or the tenth. Sherry Lynn popped in the next day when Hunter was getting ready to go troll more bars looking for him. We were beginning to think he'd skipped town. She floated over and looked over his shoulder at the picture. I know him, she exclaimed. He works for Jim, bark backing and doing odd jobs. She shuddered and curled her nose in distaste. Handsy guy. Thinks the girls are just property. Jim, as in Jim Simpson of Tassels? Hunter asked, looking closer at the picture. Jim had been in on a con to get my land when Hank was killed, but I hadn't heard Jack from him since. Sherry looked like she'd smelled something rotten. Saying Jim hadn't been kind to her while she worked there was the understatement of the century. He'd treated her like a dog and had called her a nobody who didn't count or matter. He'd done much, much worse than that, but that's another story altogether. The kid's dumber than a box of rocks, she said. If he can't drink it, eat it, or hump it, he don't even notice it. Hunter was rubbing his chin. That may be so, but he's involved, somehow, he said. At least now we know where to find him, and I even have a reason to arrest him. I grinned. You do, I said, thinking back to our visit with Mrs. Wembley. He's a wine thief, but you don't really think he's the one behind all this, do you? I don't know yet, he said. I'm going to go out on a limb and guess Macon's hold up out at Tassels. I'm heading out there now and just hope he hasn't gotten wind we're looking for him yet. Maybe he'll spill his guts and fill in the blanks. Something here isn't adding up. He dropped me off at my shop so I could get my motorcycle, then called for backup. While I was waiting to hear back from him, I decided to call Ray and have her come to the farm. Since it was so late in the afternoon, she'd have closed up already, and I was worried about her. Sherry Lynn had left, but popped in right as I pulled my phone from my pocket to call Ray. Hey, sugar, she said. I was gonna go hang out with Rupert, but he's busy trying to organize a poker league here in town. I was just about to call Ray, I said, admiring Sherry's sunny yellow peasant shirt. She was one of those lucky women who'd look good in a gunny sack, but always knew just what to wear. I was a little jealous because I wasn't exactly a fashionista. For the most part, anything past jeans and blouses was beyond me, aside from my love of boots. Yeah, she replied, hovering beside me as I turned the key to unlock the shop. I stopped in earlier to check on her. She's pretty upset, bless her little heart. I feel so bad for her. 
Feel bad for whom? Errol asked as we walked through the door. Ray, I said, then relayed the story. He crinkled his brow. I don't know much about this sort of thing, but it seems odd to me that all three of you are in this situation. A witch's powers don't usually change, do they? I shook my head. No, not after a certain age. He wrinkled his brow and pinched his lips together, shoving them off to the side as he hovered beside me. Has it occurred to you that your powers may be responding to something bigger? That gave me pause. Well, what do you mean, bigger? I mean, it would be one thing if just one of you was growing superpowers. It's a whole nother kettle of fish now that it's all three of you. In nature, there's a balance. If a storm's coming, fish get weird. Animals start acting different. That sort of thing, due to instinct. Plus, Newton's law. For every action, there's an equal opposite reaction. Is it possible your magic's responding to something? I hadn't taken the time to step back out of the box and look at the big picture, but what he was saying made sense. Or at least, as much sense as any. There's something going on in the ghost community, too, he continued. I never noticed it till lately when I started going out and about more. But there's a weight in the air, like something's coming. He lifted a silvery shoulder as I reached onto the shelf to get some crackers for Norm and Sammy. Maybe they're not connected, but there sure is something up on both sides of the daisies. As I turned to drop the crackers to the waiting rats, sun glinted off the windshield of a passing vehicle outside. I glanced out the front window, holding my hand up to deflect the glare. That's when I saw the something lying in the outside window sill. I moved closer to get a better look. It was some sort of leather satchel. I went outside and brought it in. Did you see who left this? I asked Daryl. He shook his head. Nope. As a matter of fact, I couldn't even see it till you picked it up. You mean you didn't notice it? I asked, examining it. No, he replied. I mean, I literally couldn't see it until you physically touched it. It looked like you were reaching for thin air until your hand made contact with it. Okay, that was weird. Still, maybe it was a trick of the light, and somebody just set it down while they were window shopping and forgot it. I tried to open it up to see if there was any sort of ID inside. No matter what I tried, the clasp wouldn't give. Frustrated, I used a spell my mom had taught me when I was just a little girl, when I kept accidentally locking the house door behind me. The latch popped right open. Instead of the standard legal pads or business paperwork I was expecting, there were file folders containing what could only be described as dossiers on several different women. Flipping through them, I realized they were all on witches. Noel, Sherry Lynn said, a cautious note in her tone. Yeah? I was distracted, flipping through the folders. All of the women were witches, and none of them were good ones. I think you should call Camille. A why? I asked, slowing down to read the details on some of the files. These women were horrible, and I don't mean in the steal a lipstick from Walmart sort of way. They all had several different crimes of epic proportions against both normal people and magical ones. One of them had even killed an old witch, apparently, to steal her Book of Shadows, a tome filled with spells and potions passed down through the generations. It didn't say why she stole the book, but I assume it wasn't for anything good, if she was willing to kill for it. Because, she said, pointing to one of the folders I'd left open on the counter. This is one of the women who attacked Addie and Beth when you were little. I'd only recently learned that Shelby had lost her powers when Aunt Beth had been attacked while hanging out laundry. Shelby had been playing in the clothes basket, and a spell had rebound on her, or so we thought. 
It was a little fuzzy. All we knew was that she hadn't come into her powers like an average witch did around the age of 11. Instead, it had taken a serious clunk on the noggin for her magic to burst through the block last summer. I turned to the file she was pointing to, and sure enough, under known crimes, that attack was listed. Addie and Beth had said they'd been attacked by a group of witches intent on taking over the council because they didn't think any witch should have to hide. I tried to remember the details of the conversation, or even what they said had happened to the women, but I couldn't. It was time to talk to Addie, and Sherry was right. Camille needed to be brought into it, too. First, though, I called out for my auntie. As always, she popped right in, smiling. What's up, buttercup? She asked. I was just hanging out with Ida, plotting ways to torture Millie. It's better to have a coordinated attack. Nice to know she was spending her off time doing something good. Look what somebody left on the windowsill outside, I said, motioning toward the files and satchel. I had to use an unlock spell to open it. She moved closer, motioning for me to flip through the pages as she read. Her expression turned from light-hearted amusement to concern as she read. These women are dead. Then why did somebody leave their dossiers in a bag on my windowsill? I don't know, she said as she continued to peruse one of the open folders. But call Camille, now. Nah, don't mention this in voicemail if she doesn't pick up. I pulled my phone from my pocket and hit her number, but as anticipated, it went straight to voicemail. I left a message to call me, then texted her for good measure. Well, the only thing to do now is wait, I guess, I said. Call Rayanne and get her to the farm, she said. Shelby, too. They both need to see these, and I need to go talk to somebody. I'll meet you there in 30 minutes, she said as she faded out. I texted Ray and Shelby both, simply saying we needed to have a family powwow in a half hour. Shelby responded immediately that they were both already there. That just left me, then. Okay, guys, I said. I'm going home. Errol, can you keep an eye out when you're here in case our visitor comes back? I sure would like to know what's going on, or at least who left this stuff. He nodded. Sure thing. I wasn't planning on going out tonight anyway. Do you really think they'll be back? I shrugged. I don't know. I think it's weird they just left this on the sill, so I reckon it's not outside the realm of possibility that they'll be back. After setting the TV to the CW, I grabbed my bag, locked the door, and headed to the farm. For the first time ever, the pleasure of riding my bike failed to soothe me. Chapter 44 Sure enough, Shelby and Ray, along with Gabby and Matt, were at the farm when I got there. I'd missed a call from Hunter, but I figured finding pictures of people who tried to annihilate my family and take over the witching world should probably take precedence over everything else. I texted him and told him I would call in a bit. Once inside, I pulled out the folders and spread them onto the table, where Ray and Shelby were already gathered. These were left in a satchel on the windowsill of Reimagined, I said. So? Shelby said as she moved closer to take a look at one. Ray pulled a couple more toward her. I poured myself a glass of tea, then rejoined them, taking a seat at the head of the table. So, they're the women who attacked Addie and our moms, I said. The ones responsible for your wonky powers, Shell. They shot me twin looks that were a cross between disbelief and confusion. And you have no idea who left it? Ray asked. I shook my head. No clue. Errol said he couldn't even see it before I laid hands on it. Have you tried an identity spell? Shelby asked. No, but maybe that's not such a good idea. 
I said. Ray agreed. She's right. There's a chance whoever you're identifying will feel it, and it's probably best not to take that risk just yet. Instead, we flipped through the dossiers, and I noticed more the second time through than I had the first. Even then, it wasn't much. Just personal details. There were 14 folders in all, and the women ranged in age from mid-twenties to one who was over a century old, though she looked more like 50. Witches, with longevity, tended to age slower, for obvious reasons. Addie popped in a few minutes later, and Beth rumbled up the driveway at about the same time. Once we were all convened at the table, Addie spoke. I've gone to the council and spoken with Aurora Dockmore. Aurora was the head of the witches' council, and was a badass in her own right, though she wasn't exactly the type I'd invite to dinner. Ray, Shelby, and I glanced at each other. If Addie had gone to Aurora, this was much bigger than we thought. The two of them weren't exactly cozy. She's in meetings all afternoon and evening that she can't ditch, but she'll be here straight afterwards to pick up those folders and the satchel, Addie said. What about Camille? Shelby asked. Emma popped into the kitchen. What about Mom? she asked. I'd forgotten she was staying with us while Camille was out of town. I wish she were here, I said. It seems we have a problem, and it would be awesome if she made it home today or tomorrow, because we have no idea what we're dealing with. Shelby explained what was going on, and Emma pulled up a chair to check out the dossiers. While the girls looked at the folders, Beth turned to Addie. Why is Aurora so interested? These women are all dead. To me, the question is why somebody left these for Noel to find. Addie shook her head, so wound up she forgot to assume a sitting position like she usually did when we were all gathered. They're not, Beth, at least not all of them, and if whoever left these folders was trying to give us a heads up, then there are some new faces in the crowd, too. According to Aurora, people say that they saw three of the original coven in a cafe in Paris just over a year ago. It's not confirmed, which is why the council's been keeping it hush-hush, but there's a chance we didn't kill them as dead as we thought we did. That caught my attention. They'd never said what they did to the women, but I'd assumed they'd gone to jail. The idea that my aunts found a more permanent solution had never occurred to me. It only took me about two seconds to decide I was okay with it. After all, the women had gone there to kill them. Speaking of the person who left the satchel, Rayanne said, we need to find out who it was. We can't assume they're on our side. That's true, Addie said. As bad as I hate to admit it, Aurora's a whiz at detection spells. If anybody can make that bag reveal its secrets, it'll be her. Beth's face turned white as realization set in. I can't take them on alone, Addie, and the girls aren't ready. We barely managed it with the three of us whole and hearty the last time. Addie nodded. I know, sister, and it kills me that I won't be able to help when it if the time comes. She looked from Shelby, then to Ray, then to me. That is one thing I can do, though. Now that we know who we may be dealing with, it's time to up our game and get your powers under control and up to full charge. I didn't know what that was going to entail, but suddenly the idea of dealing with a regular old garden variety serial killer wasn't so bad after all. Chapter 45 since I couldn't do anything about the satchel and its contents until Aurora showed up, I called Hunter. Any news? I asked when he picked up. 
Yeah, he replied. We got him. He was sitting at the bar, half plastered. Has he said anything yet? The problem when you were dealing with small-time troublemakers was that they tended to take pride in being arrested and in keeping their mouths shut. It was almost like a bragging point for them. Idiots. Hunter snorted. Not a word, other than he admitted to owning the property next to yours, and only then because I tricked him. I told him we already knew. He said somebody offered him a shit ton of money for it, his words, but he wouldn't say who. I dragged in a breath and blew it out through my cheeks as I took a seat on the porch swing. So we know who owns the property now, at least. Yeah, he said, taking a seat beside me. At least. I'm going to let him sweat. We're not formally arresting him, so nobody can bail him out. Give him some time to think about it. He's too drunk to deal with right now anyway. I swung in silence for a couple minutes, the back-and-forth motion soothing me. The only string we really have left to pick is Millie, I said. She's Kenzie's cousin. Not much of a string, though, he replied. Other than just being a despicable person, she hasn't done anything. She's Kenzie's cousin, and it's fishy that she tried to claim her property when Miriam died and now basically owns Ida's house and property. What's her deal? I knew I was grasping at straws, but something about her just didn't sit right with me. Still, I couldn't see her masterminding any kind of big conspiracy any more than I could see the kid doing it. He was quiet for a few seconds. Maybe it's time I go ask. She's about our last chance, because that kid's not talking. At least, not any time soon. It may be best if I go with you, I said. I'm not sure if Ida's gotten to her yet. He sighed. I feel like I should be worried about myself, because I understand exactly what you're talking about, and worse yet, am okay with it. Well... I said, trying to look on the bright side. At least now you know. Look at it this way. If you weren't in the loop and showed up out there once Ida gets in full swing, you'd doubt your own sanity. Now you know it's just a nice older lady defending her house. He huffed. Nice older lady my foot. But you're right. It's better to know about the crazy than to walk into it blind. Hey, I said. I resemble that remark. I could hear the smile in his voice when he said, I know you do, and I wouldn't have it any other way. As a matter of fact, I kind of hope we show up in time to see Ida at work. Even though he couldn't see me, I grinned. My job here is done. I've converted you to the dark side. There's no going back now, sweetheart. He picked me up ten minutes later, and we headed straight to Ida's rather than Felix's apartment, since we figured Millie would either be measuring for drapes or huddling in a corner with wet drawers, depending on whether or not Ida had already gone to work on her. Sure enough, Felix's truck was there when we pulled in. I knocked on the door, and the woman of the hour answered, a puzzled look on her face and a new pack of paint rollers in her hand. We'd stepped around several pieces of tacky floral furniture sitting on the porch on our way to the door, so she wasn't kidding about moving right in. If Felix's daughter sicked you on me, I'm within my rights. He said I could do what I want with the place, and that's all the permission I need now that the hateful old bat he married the first time around kicked the bucket. Hunter ran a hand over his face and stepped forward, choosing to take the high road. I admired his patience and bit my tongue, doing my best to follow suit. We need to ask you a couple of questions, he said. She narrowed her eyes and examined us both for a few seconds before opening the door to us. All right, but you're going to have to make it quick. I'm getting ready to paint. All these neutral colors make me feel like I'm in some sort of mental hospital. You'd know, I muttered. Excuse me, she said, her voice an octave higher than usual. Hunter shot me a death glare. I said uh, you'd know, I rushed to say. About colors, I mean. You seem to have a knack for mixing colors. 
It was the best I could do. Oh, she said, preening like a peacock. I watch those DIY shows all the time. All it needs is some brightening up. This place will look like a million bucks when I'm done with it. How apropos. I stepped inside, paying closer attention to the decor than I had the last time. True, the colors were neutral, but they were shades of gray and sand that complemented the wood floors and rich mahogany tones of Ida's furniture, though I could see how Millie would take offense to anything so tasteful. Just the thought of painting over it with the bright purple on the sample in Millie's hand made me cringe. When Ida popped in behind her, I knew Hunter and I were officially against the clock if we wanted to get any information of value. The haunting was about to begin. Tell me I got here before she so much as opened a can of that in my house, she said, swooping up the stairs, then back down through the ceiling. I nodded. You made it in time. In time for what? Millie asked me, tilting her head, confused. Hunter shot Ida and me a glare as he answered her. We were just hoping you could answer some questions. We picked up a man named Macon Jessup this evening. He paused, and we both studied her face, watching for any sort of reaction. All we got was the standard blank look that seemed to be her resting expression when she wasn't pouting or complaining. And? she asked. What does that have to do with me? Look, I said, sick of dancing around the issue. I don't know why we're beating around the bush here. Two women are dead. One of them was your cousin, and the other was your new husband's ex-wife. You're currently moving into the ex's house, and from what we gather, you thought you were going to inherit your cousin's, or at least part of it. You had a lot to gain if Ida and Miriam died, or at least you thought you did. She narrowed her eyes. I don't know what you're implying, but if you think I had anything to do with the deaths, you're barking up the wrong tree. Damned straight I'll claim what's mine, but I didn't do nothing to hurry the process along. In my mind, she didn't have any claim to any of it. Hunter must have read my mind because he glanced at me out of the corner of his eye and rushed to speak before I could. I decided it might be best if I zipped it and let him do the talking. Why were you in such a hurry to get the keys to this house? He asked. She took a step back and gave us an appraising look. I think I've said all I'm willing to without my lawyer here. Lawyer Schmoyer, Ida barked in her ear. Answer the question. Millie jumped about a foot in the air and whipped her head toward the sound. Who said that? She demanded. I struggled to maintain a bland expression. Said what? Oh, boy. Hunter muttered. I said it, Ida snapped. You know, the hateful old bat Felix married the first time around. How are you doing that? Millie asked me, suspicion bordering on fear written all over her face. Doing what? I asked, smiling sweetly. Millie glowered at me and pointed a finger tipped in a long bedazzled orange nail at me. I've heard the rumors about your freaky family. Stop it right now. She turned to Hunter. Make her stop. Stop what? Hunter asked, and I swear, the man could have won an Academy Award. His expression was puzzled, bordering on concerned. Are you feeling okay? She's feeling better than she's gonna be in a minute if she doesn't answer your question. Ida said, then started moaning. She was gonna have to work on that part because she sounded more like the ghost on the booberry commercial than anything from a horror flick, but it was enough to freak Millie out. Okay, she said, covering her head and looking around, frantically trying to see where the disembodied voice was coming from. I wanted to sell this place and get the hell out of this crap hole for good. I didn't want to live here when I was young, and I sure don't want to live here now. Dan Green approached us as soon as I'd have died with an offer that included a lot of zeros. Dan Green, the slimy real estate broker who lived in Hank's pocket. 
You lied and said you were in Atlanta, I said. But somebody saw you in town the morning Ida was killed. I'd forgotten to tell Hunter that, so two sets of eyes swiveled to me, surprised. Hunter's look turned to annoyance, but Ida wasn't surprised. I could see the wheels turning, though. That's right, Ida said just to us, anger slipping into her voice as her form flickered a little. They came to see me to try to convince me to sell. Once I met her, I decided I wanted to keep the place after all, rather than give her a dime of it. Apparently, she'd cloaked her voice and was just talking to Hunter and me because Millie's expression didn't change. We were out on his boat, Millie lied. We just didn't want anybody to think we had anything to do with it. Ida passed her hand through her head. Millie shuddered. Try again, Ida said, and this time, Millie must have heard her. We, we came to convince Ida to sell the place, she finally admitted. That's better, I said. Now, why would you do a thing like that? Some company contacted Felix with an offer, she said, running her hand up and down her arm and sidestepping as Ida poked her. Felix didn't want to sell, so I would never go for it now that he was remarried, but it was my chance to get out of here, and he does what I say. She crossed her arms, a defiant expression settling on her face as she raised her voice and looked around, addressing Ida. No matter what a dead old hag thinks about it. Unbeknownst to her, Felix had entered the living room from the kitchen and was leaning against the doorway between the two rooms. Lord Almighty, Ida said. I've called Felix just about every name in the book over the last thirty years, but never once did I call him whipped. It was one of his more endearing traits. He'd always stand up to me. She rubbed her chin and stared appraisingly at her ex. I wonder what changed, aside from the fact that he obviously went colorblind. Felix scowled at her. What changed is I got old and don't have two nickels to rub together. You saw to that. She's about the best I can do with what I got. I was surprised when Ida's translucent cheeks turned pink and she turned to him. I was dying to hear what she had to say to that, but Millie interrupted her by wheeling on Felix. I don't know what's going on here for sure, she sneered at him, but if you were just talking about me, you got it all wrong. You are lucky to have me. If it weren't for that fancy boat in this house, I'd have never gave you a second look. Now, go get the rest of the paint out of the truck so as I can turn this dump into something somebody will actually pay to live in. The sooner we're out of this town and the more cash we have in our pockets, the better. Felix took a couple steps toward the door, and Ida watched him, her gaze speculative. I know I was hard on you, she said softly. And you're right, I took you to the cleaners. Pick your ears, because I'm only going to say this once. I was wrong, and I'm sorry. You can do better than this, though. And Rose is gonna need you. You're all she has left. He stopped in his tracks when she spoke, then stood frozen for a couple moments after Ida had said her piece. Millie snapped her fingers. What are you waiting on? An engraved invitation? Move! He turned to her, one brow raised and his spine stiff. This was not the same man I'd seen the half-dozen other times I'd run into him. I think the only thing that's going to be moving here is you. Pack up those god-awful clothes and the 40 pounds of makeup you brought with you and get out. My jaw about hit the floor, but Ida smiled like the cat that ate the cream. That's the man I know and despise, but I'm proud of you. Millie, however, wasn't quite so happy. Go ahead, throw me out. We're married. Half this place is mine and I'll force you to sell. You just got it, so it's a marital property. Felix rolled his eyes and looked at her like she'd lost her mind. God, I hate to say this, but Ida's right. If brains were gunpowder, you wouldn't have enough to blow your nose. Have your lawyer explain it to you. 
She squealed and stomped her feet in frustration, her face burning with rage. I should have convinced Jim to take you out, too. You could have heard a pen drop as every set of eyes, both dead and alive, swiveled to her. She slapped a hand over her mouth, but it was too late. A pig was done out of the poke. I had to hand it to Hunter. He didn't miss a beat. He pulled his cuffs off his belt and stepped forward, starting the whole Miranda spiel as he went. Once she calmed down, it didn't take her long to start backpedaling. The only part was that I had to ride back to town with her cuffed behind us. Can't you put duct tape on her mouth? I said, raising my voice to be heard over her protests. He rolled his eyes. I'm a cop, not a kidnapper. Yeah, and I'm a witch, I muttered, just loud enough for him to hear. I turned in my seat and glared at her. You have a one more chance to shut up on your own. She smirked at me. Or else what? I looked at Hunter, and he lifted his shoulder. You warned her. Grinning, I reached back just to be dramatic and did the little key lock motion over her lips as I took her voice away. Her whining ceased, even though her lips kept moving, her eyes wide with a mixture of fear and rage. Ah, Hunter said, as relieved as I was. Blessed silence. When J.C., Hunter's deputy, led her to a cell, Macon greeted her by name as they passed his. When she realized her goose was cooked, it didn't take her long to spill her guts. We were right about one thing. She was most definitely not the mastermind behind the plan. She gave us enough information to help us piece together who was, though. Jim Simpson and Dan Green were both in serious financial trouble, as Peggy Sue had so gleefully told me. We knew Jim wouldn't likely crack, so we went for the weakest link, Dan Green. Hunter barely had the cuffs on him before he started talking. Jim's house and 60 acres sat caddy corner to the northeast corner of mine, and he'd reached the point where he was going to lose it to taxes. Since he owned several shady businesses in addition to the strip club and was behind on all those taxes too, he decided his best option was to sell his house and property to pay the taxes on his businesses. At least then, he'd still have income. Dan wasn't in much better shape, but did still have some connections in Atlanta left over from the Hank days. When Jim found out Macon owned the strip of property next to me and was willing to part with it, he and Dan Green put their heads together and decided to put the two pieces together and market it to developers. Unfortunately, none of the firms with big bucks were willing to deal with them for anything less than 100 acres, especially considering the view from his property was of the trashier side of Keyhole and the two properties weren't linked well. Rather than be happy with that, surprise, surprise, they got greedy and figured they'd make a bundle if Ida and Miriam would sell to them cheap. They knew they couldn't use their own names, so the Shell Company was born. They knew I wouldn't sell, but Green insisted on sending the letter just in case and to make it look good. Even though Jim was about to lose everything because he'd spent so many years conning the system, he hadn't learned anything from it. Hank had been plenty generous with him, allowing him to keep both the liquor store and tassels open all hours of the night. During that time, Jim had also been shaking down some of the other business owners on the east side for protection, which meant Jim's thugs wouldn't tear up their stores as long as they paid. That all went away when Hank died. Dan cut a deal in exchange for testifying against Jim. He swore he never wanted to hurt anybody and that Jim had taken that part upon himself. And weirdly enough, I believed him. He was a con man, but was too weak to be a murderer. Jim was in custody in less than an hour. Sherry Lynn floated right alongside him, showing herself and alternating between heckling him and cussing him till a fly wouldn't light on him, something she'd been too scared to do when she was alive. 
Then she proceeded to gleefully tell him about all the wonderful things waiting for him in prison and how she hoped he got a giant cellmate with a penchant for violence and an attraction to Weasley men. I was there too, mostly because I still didn't know for sure who'd run Gabby off the road. I goaded him until we were almost to his cell, and he finally turned to me. I was the one driving. I wasn't trying to kill you for your land. That wouldn't have worked. I was trying to kill you just because you're a meddling bitch who's too big for her britches, and it would have made me feel good. I didn't give two squats what he thought of me, but I punched him in the face for trying to hurt Gabby. Then again, for my truck. A nice, solid one-two set. Because he's on the up-and-up, Hunter couldn't give me a pass. He fined me my hundred dollars for battery. I gladly paid it and considered it money well spent. Chapter 46 The day after, everybody gathered at the farm for a cookout. Camille was still out of town, and though I always worried about her, it wasn't unusual for her to be gone for much longer than just a few days. Harry and Stella from down the road had made it, though, and of course, most of the regular crew had, too. Aurora had picked up the satchel the night before, but said that aside from the one sighting, nobody had seen or heard from any of the older witches in the file folders since the evening of their run-in with my mom, Addie, and Beth. The younger ones were unfamiliar to her, though. She was going to put her best people on it, but I got the feeling that there was something she wasn't telling me. So, what are they supposed to do until you figure out what's going on? Beth had asked her. She just shrugged. The only thing they can do is beef up the wards around their houses and businesses. She turned to me, Ray, and Shelby. Don't be alone if you can help it. If you can't be with each other, at least be with other people until we can figure out what's going on. And I'm pulling Camille from field duty as soon as she's done with this assignment, so she can focus on training you all. So, in essence, we didn't learn anything at all, except we were about to lose most of our free time. I figured it beat diet, though. Hunter was flipping burgers while the rest of us, including Max, played in the pool. The donkey had insisted on his own lounging pool, which was his fancy expression for kitty pool, but Matt had humored him and built it with a zero-entry side so he didn't have to navigate steps. Sarah and Louise both showed up with their families, so Max wasn't getting exclusive use of what he considered his private space— but the old softy was loving playing with the kids, even if he wouldn't admit it. Kinsey and Rose were there, and Ida was hanging out with Belle and Addie. Even Felix had shown up. Thankfully, Millie less. Of course, she was locked up on conspiracy charges because her role in the whole mess was still fuzzy, so it's not like he could have brought her if he'd wanted to. As I watched him interact with Rose, and even Ida, I was confident she wouldn't have been with him regardless. I was surprised when Anna May nudged me and pointed to the driveway, where Rayanne and Dave were climbing out of his truck. Do you reckon she's gonna tell him? she asked. That was an excellent question. Rayanne rarely brought him with her to our cookouts, and I think it was because she was scared one of us would accidentally slip and do magic in front of him. To be fair, it was possible. This was our home, and we sometimes did things without thinking. Hunter grinned and held out his hand. Hey, man, good to see you. Welcome. Burgers are on, and there are beers in the cooler over there. Dave grinned back and took his hand. Good to see you, too. Don't mind if I do. Rayanne was glancing at Max, chewing her lip. Max wasn't anywhere near shy, and since he was playing with kids who all knew he could talk, he wasn't exactly on guard. Addie floated by, and Dave heaved a great sigh. Okay, this is it, he said. I can't just keep being rude to people. He turned to Rayanne. Honey, 
don't panic. But you need to know something. It's okay, though. A pained look crossed his face. And please, don't think I'm crazy. But I can't keep this from you anymore if we're going to move forward. She looked about ready to faint. I, on the other hand, was intrigued. What shouldn't we panic about? I asked, because Ray was apparently tongue-tied. He cleared his throat, took a deep breath, then said, Okay, here goes. Please keep an open mind. My mom was sort of what you'd call a seer, which means she could see the future, and she could also see and talk to spirits. As a matter of fact, she's hovering right there beside Hunter with another spirit, and there's one by Rose, too. He looked a little studious for a minute. Now that I think about it, it's odd to have so many in one place. For the space of a heartbeat, silence reigned. Then I about busted a gut, laughing. Hunter followed my lead, and Addie and Anna Mae joined him. Ray, on the other hand, didn't know what to think. What? Dave asked, his forehead wrinkled in bemusement. I could barely stop laughing long enough to pant. We, we know. We didn't say anything because we didn't think you knew. I was bent double again, and even Ray was starting to smile. And that's not all, Anna Mae gasped. Is it, Ray Ann? She nudged her with her elbow. No, Ray said, the smile fleeing her face. She looked like she was going to throw up. It's not. It's not, Dave asked, curious. She shook her head, then snapped her fingers, and a small flame appeared. I'm sort of a witch, she said, and glanced at me, a question in her eyes. I nodded. Actually, several of us here are. He plopped down on the chair that Hunter had shoved behind him when he saw him wobble. The poor guy blinked a couple times, then glanced back at her. What else can you do? She cringed a little, then reached out and barely touched his beer bottle, concentrating until it was almost as big as a wine bottle. I stood ready in case her magic went wonky and we ended up with a budzilla. Hey, Hunter exclaimed, offended. Well, why don't you ever do that for me? Meanwhile, Dave beamed. Honey, if you can grow actual beer... We definitely need to take this relationship to the next level. The happiness on her face made my heart smile. As always, we'd come through adversity, just like we went through the good times, together. And now it looked like we had one more person to open our hearts to. The kids were laughing and playing, the adults were mingling and enjoying the day, and the smell of burgers floated on the air. Family, friends, and good times. Even if trouble was looming on the horizon, all was well right then in that little slice of time. And that was good enough for me. Thank you for listening to Murder of the Month. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I loved writing it. Makeovers and Murder is book eight in the Witches of Keyhole Lake series. I look forward to seeing you. Happy listening, Tegan. This has been Murder of the Month, written by Tegan Marr, narrated by Merritt North. Copyright 2018 by Tegan Marr. Production copyright 2019 by Tegan Marr.